The life of Anakin Skywalker, Darth Vader from Star Wars. Anakin Skywalker was a legendary Force-sensitive human male who was a Jedi Knight of the Galactic Republic and the prophesized Chosen One of the Jedi Order, destined to bring balance to the Force. Also known as Annie during his childhood, Skywalker earned the moniker Hero with No Fear from his accomplishments in the Clone Wars. His alter ego, Darth Vader, the Dark Lord of the Sith, was created when Skywalker turned to the dark side of the Force, pledging his allegiance to the Sith Lord Darth Sidious at the end of the Republic era. Welcome to the Amagi! Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. Also, we just released some brand new merch. If you'd like to show your support for the channel even further while at the same time repping stylish clothing, be sure to check that out as well. The store is linked below. YouTube's been unsubscribing users from channels lately, so if you're a fan of us, please do us a favor and double check to see if you're still subscribed. It only takes a second and it helps us a ton here at Amagi. And with that out of the way, let's get into the video. Early Life Believed to have been conceived by the midi-chlorians, Anakin Skywalker was born to the slave Shmi Skywalker. Although Skywalker was listed as born on the desert planet of Tatooine, a holographic log stated that Shmi and he moved to the planet when Skywalker was a very young age. Regardless, Tatooine was Skywalker's homeworld. Skywalker and his mother were originally owned by Gardella the Hutt, until she lost them to the Tordarian Watto in a pod racing bet when Skywalker was around age 3. Affectionately nicknamed Annie, he worked in his master's shop, located in Mos Espa. Even at a young age, Skywalker exhibited exceptional piloting skills and built the protocol droid C-3PO, specially modified to withstand Tatooine's sand and heat for his mother. Once, while he was working in Watto's scrapyard, he found a broken servo motor, which he thought he could repair and use on the droid that he was building and asked his master for it. With a glance, Watto saw that it was worthless and grunted that he could, but as Skywalker walked away, Watto told him that nothing was free and had him work harder the next day. On one occasion, Skywalker and his mother were lost in a sandstorm, but the boy refused to listen to her when she demanded he return home if he could see it. Unwilling to leave her behind, he trekked through the storm to reach her, promising her that they would be fine and he would not leave her. Skywalker got the photoreceptors for the droid at a market in Mos Espa. Though a Gran wanted them too and chased him through the market, Skywalker escaped by destroying an Ithorian stall and blocking the Gran's pursuit. Before he had even turned nigh, and Skywalker's work had ensured C-3PO was operational. He was close friends with fellow slave Kitster Banai and Wald, as well as the elderly Jira. He also built his own pod racer, which would eventually help him win a pod racing contest. Over the course of his life on Tatooine, Skywalker never saw it rain. At some point, Watto told Anakin to go and throw away some scrap. When looking at it, Anakin found an ultra power cell, just what he needed for his pod. Suddenly, a swoop gang with a Deveronian member attacked the streets and shot the generator for the medical center. When Anakin examined it to see if he could repair the generator, he saw that it needed a power cell. So, he took his power cell and saved the medical center. A week later, Anakin participated in a pod race with Sabalba who made him lose by cheating. Anakin stated that if he would have used the power cell on his own pod, he would have won, but it was more important for the medical center to receive it. Found by the Jedi One day, at the age of 9, Watto shouted for him to come down into the junk shop to find a tall man, a young woman, a Gungan, and an astromech droid conversing with Watto. Skywalker had first seen the young woman, Padme Naberi, when he looked up from his work, mistaking her for an angel, a species he had overturned spacers talk about from the moons of Aiego. Unbeknownst to Skywalker, Naberi was in fact Padme Amidala, monarch of Naboo, who had switched places with one of her royal handmaidens to visit Tatooine. At Watto's instructions, Skywalker manned the shop while Watto took the man, Kaigon Jin, into the junkyard. Skywalker was fascinated by the beauty of Padme, so much that he asked her if she was an angel. Shortly after Watto and Jin returned to the shop, Jin informed his companions that they were leaving. Fortunately for Skywalker, Watto allowed him to leave after he cleaned up the mess that Jar Jar Binks had made. As he headed home, Skywalker came across Binks, who was being attacked by Sebulba after the clumsy Gungan had disrupted the racer's meal. Breaking up the fight, Skywalker greeted Naberi and the rest of her group when they arrived to see what was happening, and he convinced the group to follow him to Jira's fruit stand nearby. As he gave one of the pallies to Jin, the boy was astonished to see a lightsaber on the man's waist when his poncho opened. When Jira warned the group that a sandstorm was coming, Skywalker insisted that the unprepared group come with him to his home. When they reached his house, he introduced the group to his mother and explained 
complained about the sandstorm before pulling Naberi into his room to show her his project. Naberi was genuinely impressed by Skywalker's work on C-3PO, prompting him to turn the droid on, and he also told her about the pod racer he was constructing. The group stayed at the Skywalkers as the sandstorm continued to rage, and during a meal he began to explain life as a slave, though a brief argument between Naberi and Shmi about slavery led Anakin to the subject of pod racing. Mustering his courage, Skywalker asked Jin about his lightsaber, and he refused to believe the Jedi's statement that he was not there to free the slaves. As the conversation turned to the group's damaged Naboo Royal Starship, Skywalker volunteered to race in the Bunta Eve Classic pod race so that Jin could get the prize money. When his mother objected, Anakin reminded Shmi of her belief that people needed to help one another, convincing her to allow Anakin to race for Jin. The next morning, Jin and the others accompanied Skywalker to Watto's shop, and the boy began to tell Watto about Jin's proposal when Naberi stopped Jin outside for a brief conversation. When Watto asked how Jin intended to sponsor the boy, Jin proposed that his ship would cover the entry fee. Watto initially suggested that they split the winnings 50-50, when Jin proposed that Watto front the cash for the entry and keep all the winnings minus the cost of a new hyperdrive. Watto accepted the deal, and Skywalker was dismissed immediately with instructions to check out Jin's pod racer. As Skywalker worked, his friends, Benai and Wald among them, arrived, but Wald and the others were skeptical of Skywalker's chances and left to go play elsewhere except for Benai. Despite Skywalker's warnings, Binks became caught between the pod racer's energy binders, causing his face to go numb. Anakin used a power pack that Jin had lifted from Watto's shop to start the pod racer, and the group was heartened to witness the engines activating and running perfectly. That afternoon, Skywalker sustained a cut on his arm, though he did not notice it until later that night when Jin tended to it and took a sample of his blood. Before Skywalker could get Jin to tell him what he was doing with his blood, his mother called him inside their house for bedtime. He then sent this blood sample to Kenobi, who found that the young boy had even more midichlorians than esteemed Jedi Grandmaster Yoda. Racing to Freedom With two Eapis, Naberi, Banai, Shmi, Anakin, R2-D2, and C-3PO hauled the pod racer to the arena hangars, where Jin had gone to meet with Watto. The Tordarian angrily left the hangar just as they arrived, confusing Skywalker with a comment about Jin and betting, but Banai unintentionally revealed to Naberi and the others that Skywalker had never actually finished a race, causing Naberi to lose hope in the boys' chances. A little while later, the racers and their pods entered the arena and lined up for the race, and Shmi stopped her son to ask him to be safe before he headed out to his racer. Not even Sabulba's threats rattled Skywalker as Jin helped him in the pod racer cockpit. But to Skywalker's dismay, when the starting light turned green, the pod's engine stalled immediately thanks to Sebulba's sabotage, leaving him stuck at the starting line with only Ben Quadaneros and his stalled racer as the rest of the competitors flew off. Realizing that he had left out one step to start the pod, he rapidly flipped switches and adjusted settings to reset the engines and succeeded in starting, flying out of the arena and chasing after the others. He soon caught up to the other racers, passing two before they even noticed him, and he prepared to pass the Troiken Gascano as they approached Arch Canyon. Gascano blocked his first few attempts, but Skywalker overtook him as they dropped over a short mesa and proceeded to slip into Arch Canyon quickly and without any trouble. Team Topakalis tried to push him back into the rock, but Skywalker was able to pass him with a twist. Sebulba tossed a piece of debris behind him and into Mars Guo's left engine intake, clogging the motors inside. The engine intake stopped working before the entire engine combusted. With Guo crashing into the desert sand, Skywalker was free to move ahead, going neck and neck with Sebulba as they passed the grid line into the third lap. Going into the third lap, Sebulba still held the lead, as narrow as it was. With Skywalker close behind, and now out of surprise tricks, Sebulba resorted to sheer brutality in order to either keep Skywalker behind behind him, or to batter the boy enough to destroy his pod. Approaching the Laguna Caves, a part of the course where Tyrell had crashed earlier, Sebulba rammed Skywalker off course, forcing him onto a steep service ramp. Boosting, Skywalker sped up the ramp at an exhilarating speed, propelling himself into the sky. The boy was quick to act, and he adjusted his pod accordingly, leveling his pod racer's nosedive as he headed back for the ground. Not only did he save himself from an explosive wreck, but his jump off the ramp put him directly in front of a surprise Sebulba. Skywalker continued to hold the lead until they ran into a series of archways. Suddenly, Skywalker's left engine bucked and began to give off a stream of dense smoke. Sebulba's earlier sabotage was beginning to take effect as Skywalker pushed his pod to its limit. Skywalker managed to resolve his engine difficulties and quickly regained his ground, passing up several other pod racers before gaining a tail on Gascano. Although Skywalker had issues with passing the Zexto earlier in the race, this time he swerved past Gascano with little effort and eventually flew parallel with Sebulba as they headed for the final stretch of the course. 
As they approached the arena, Sabulba blocked every attempt of Skywalkers to pass, and he finally swerved his larger racer into Skywalkers in anger at the boys' repeated attempts, only for the two racers' steering rods to be caught together. When Skywalker's rod finally snapped completely, his pod racer began to shudder violently, but broke free of Sabulba's racer, the engines of which shot forward and went flying out of control, slamming into rock and sand and exploding. As Sabulba's pod skidded to a halt, Skywalker shot towards the arena and across the finish line, winning the Bunta Eve Classic. As Skywalker came to a halt, the crowd swarmed his racer. Jin hoisted Skywalker onto his shoulders in celebration. In the hangar, Skywalker met up with his family and friends. As Jin approached, Anakin became embarrassed at Naberi and his mother's constant hugs and kisses, but Jin soon departed with Binks and Naberi to take their parts back to the ships. Farewell to home. Returning home with Jin, Skywalker ecstatically showed his mother the credits, and his happiness only increased when Jin told him that he had been freed, and Jin wanted him to become a Jedi. Anakin was so excited that it was several minutes before he realized that Shmi had not been freed as well, and he was dismayed when Shmi insisted that Anakin go with Jin to a better future without her. Packing his stuff, Skywalker bid goodbye to C-3PO, but when it came time to leave, Anakin's resolve broke and he ran back to his mother. He promised that he would return and free her, despite their sorrow at parting, Shmi convinced her son to go with the Jedi. As they raced towards the starship that Naberi and Jin had come to Tatooine on, Skywalker was suddenly ordered to drop to the ground and comply, just as a dark-robed figure, Sith Lord Darth Maul, shot overhead on a speeder. The man leaped at Jin, drawing a red-bladed lightsaber and attacking the Jedi as Jin urged Skywalker to get aboard the ship and to take off. He rushed aboard, and Naberi took him to the cockpit to tell Jin's apprentice Obi-Wan Kenobi what had happened. The pilot, Rick Ali, followed Kenobi's instructions to fly towards the fight, and Skywalker scrambled into a seat as Kenobi raced to the landing ramp and helped Jin escape from the Dark Warrior. Skywalker and Kenobi rushed to help Jin as the ship took off and left Tatooine. When they were convinced that Qui-Gon was fine, the Jedi Master introduced Obi-Wan to Anakin and was happy to meet another Jedi. Before the Jedi Council Later that night, aboard the ship, which Skywalker learned was the personal starship of the Queen of the planet Naboo, Skywalker struggled to fall asleep in the central chamber, as the ship's temperature was radically different to the constant heat of Tatooine that he was used to. As he huddled in silence, Skywalker witnessed Deberry enter the room and watch a recording of a plea for help from the Naboo official Sio Bibble. She then noticed him and gave him her blanket, and the two discussed the Trade Federation's invasion of Naboo and Naberi's hopes that the Republic's Galactic Senate could resolve the crisis. Skywalker gave her a Japur ivory wood pendant that he had carved for her so that she would remember him, and Naberi comforted him as he became sad as he remembered his mother. Amidala accepted Skywalker's gift and came to wear the Japur snippet as a necklace, which she wore for years to come. She came to view it as a way to represent remembrance and luck. When they finally arrived at the Republic capital of Coruscant, Skywalker watched from the cockpit in awe as they approached the city planet, and the ship was greeted when it landed by Supreme Chancellor Finnis Valorum. Senator Palpatine of Naboo, and a contingent of Senate guards. The Queen and her handmaidens, including Naberi, departed with Palpatine, though they brought Skywalker and Binks along with them to Palpatine's office and left them outside while they discussed the situation. Before he went to the Jedi Temple, Skywalker went to the Queen's chambers in search of Naberi, but the Queen promised to pass on his message when the handmaiden was absent. Unbeknownst to Skywalker, however, the Queen was in fact Padme. Kaigon Jin believed Anakin Skywalker to be the chosen one of prophecy, who, it was foretold, would bring balance to the Force. Jin revealed his belief and Anakin's corroborative midi-chlorian test results to members of the Jedi High Council, before bringing the boy before them for their own consideration of the boy's aptitude for life as a Jedi. At the Jedi Temple, Skywalker took a moment to look out across the city and down at his hand before Jin told him it was time to meet the Council. With Skywalker before the 12 Jedi Masters on the Council, Mace Windu tested Skywalker's abilities by asking him to determine what images were appearing on a testing screen that the Jedi was holding that the boy could not see. Skywalker named them all with perfect accuracy. However, when Windu and Master Yoda questioned him about his feelings and his mother, Skywalker asked how that was relevant. Yoda explained that fear was the starting point on the path to the dark side. The ancient Jedi Master said he sensed a lot of fear in Skywalker. As night fell, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Jin were called before the Council. 
The Jedi Masters acknowledged Skywalker's great power but refused to train him on account of his age, causing Jin to declare that he would take the boy on as his own apprentice. The Council would initially refuse this as Jin already had his own apprentice, who was Kenobi, but Jin stated that he believed that Kenobi was ready to become a Jedi Knight. However, Windu declared that the matter would be dealt with later, as the Naboo problem was more pressing. The Council permitted Skywalker to accompany Jin, and the three returned to the Queen's starship, where Skywalker questioned Jin about midi-chlorians. The Queen and her retinue departed not long afterward, leaving Coruscant and heading back to the occupied Naboo, in hopes of freeing the world from the Trade Federation. The First Battle of Naboo as they came out of hyperspace and approached the Naboo system, Skywalker sat in the cockpit with Ali and learned about the ship's controls, while Queen Amidalia held a meeting with the Jedi and her staff and announced her intentions to ally with the Gungans in order to drive the Trade Federation off Naboo. The group landed in the swamps of Naboo and sent Binks to the Gungan capital city of Otogunga. When Binks finally returned, he explained that Otogunga was empty, but he took the group to the Gungan's sacred palace where the Gungans had no doubt fled after the Trade Federation invaded. When the group was brought before Boss Rugor Nas, the leader of the Gungans, Skywalker was astonished to learn that Naberi was, in fact, Padme Amidalia, Queen of Naboo, and that she had been posing as her double's handmaiden as a safety precaution. Skywalker, the Jedi, and Amidalia's handmaidens joined the Queen in dropping to their knees before Boss Nas in a plea for Gungan aid, and Nas agreed to lend his army to the Queen's cause. In the hours that followed the meeting, Amidalia and the Jedi began strategizing with the Gungan generals, leaving Skywalker to wander over to the Gungan sentries who were keeping watch for the returning Captain Panaka. As everyone prepared for the coming battle, Skywalker spotted and approached the handmaiden who had been acting as the Queen. Asking for her name, Skywalker told the girl, Sabe, that he was happy to meet her and thanked her for keeping Naberi safe. He was then called away by Jin, but Sabe was left touched nevertheless. Anakin was a member of the group, which, led by Amidalia, grabbed the chance to recapture the Theed Royal Palace. When the group entered the Theed Hangar Bay, Skywalker heeded Jin's command for him to stay hidden in the cockpit of one of the Hangar's N1 Starfighters. When several Droidicas cornered the Naboo personnel in a firefight, Skywalker attempted to aid them with the N1's blaster cannons, though he accidentally activated the ship to go into space in the process. Skywalker fought in the Battle of Naboo, in a vicious starfighter battle above the planet, coming to realize how much he loved flying over the course of the battle. After accidentally joining the battle in orbit, Skywalker single-handedly destroyed the orbiting droid control ship from within the ship, thus rendering the Trade Federation's ground forces inactive and saving the Gungan Grand Army from destruction. The following celebration, however, was tainted with the death of Jin, slain by Darth Maul. Joining the Jedi Order However, during the Master's funeral, Obi-Wan told him that he would fulfill Qui-Gon's last wish and train him to be a Jedi. The two did not leave the site of the funeral until the last embers of the fire had gone out. The only others to remain as long as them were Amidala and her court. Later, Skywalker and his fellow Jedi attended a parade, held by the Naboo and the Gungans, in Theed, to celebrate their victory and mark their newfound friendship. Afterwards, Skywalker and the other Jedi left Naboo, marking the last time Skywalker would see Amidala for a decade. The Chosen One Trains as he grew, Skywalker's exceptional skills made him cocky, but he nevertheless idolized Kenobi, thinking there was no one better than his master. Having given up his life with his mother and lost Jin, Skywalker clung to his master, not wanting to lose him. Throughout his first years as a Padawan, he had a habit of sleeping on the floor next to Kenobi's bed, wanting to ensure that his mentor would not vanish in the night. Kenobi sometimes awoke at night and saw this. During one of their many adventures, he also rescued Kenobi after he fell into a nest of Gundarks. Shortly after becoming Kenobi's Padawan, a surge in overwhelming emotions shut Skywalker off from the Force entirely. This was able to give Skywalker temporary relief from his worries and fears for a time, but soon he realized that avoiding the Force was not the answer, and he reconnected to it. During his time as Kenobi's apprentice, Skywalker was distrustful of teachers who corrected him, wondering if they were trying to help him or simply put him in his place, knowing that many had not wanted him trained in the first place. Even so, there were many Jedi who had faith in him, seeing his potential. Skywalker and Kenobi were at one point joined by Jedi Master Shock T for a complicated mission to Naran Shiv. In addition to struggling to control his emotions, he found it hard to make friends, as his fellow Padawans were all aware of the rumors of him being the Chosen One. Often lonely, he generally spent his free time in his quarters, tinkering with machinery he had found in trips outside the Jedi Temple. He also harbored a lingering resentment regarding the fate of his mother. Mission to Dalinor Sometime after his enrollment in the Order, Skywalker was meditating with his master while also holding together many pebbles using the Force. 
However, when Master Tosan informed his master that he had a mission from the council, Anakin's concentration broke due to the surprise of him leaving again. The mission was to go to the planet Dalinar so he could collect an ancient Jedi holocron from a dig site. Obi-Wan told Anakin that he'd be back shortly and that he would be training with Yoda in the meantime. Skywalker, displeased, complained that he would have to be in class with little kids and that he was far ahead of them in his training. However, he complied and spent his time with the younglings, although he did not enjoy himself. However, after some encouragement from Yoda, Kenobi he took Skywalker along with him on the mission in a T-6 shuttle. Skywalker was glad that he was finally in space again and asked if he could pilot the shuttle. Kenobi told him that he could when they got closer to Dalinar. Skywalker asked what Obi-Wan's life was like before joining the Jedi Order. Kenobi told him that he did not remember as he was taken in at a very young age. Anakin, sadly, expressed that he was always a Jedi and nothing else. Kenobi tried to reassure him by telling him that he still needed to train and was a Padawan when they both met. However, Skywalker was unconvinced and stated that his life was already set out for him, and that he was not anything else, unlike him, who was a slave. He concluded this was why the Jedi Council said he was too old to be trained. Obi-Wan tried to reassure him again by saying that the Council was not perfect, and that Qui-Gon Jinn chose him just like he chose Kenobi. Skywalker, angered, proclaimed that Kenobi's master was dead, and that now he was stuck with him. Before Kenobi could reassure Anakin, he walked away. Upon arriving on Dalinar, Kenobi and Skywalker encountered a female Togruta archaeologist named Klatrif. She was glad that they arrived so they could take the holocron away due to the fact that it was causing problems. She explained that the local pirates wanted to get it and she had to hire local guards to keep them at bay. Kenobi ordered Skywalker to stay outside to keep watch whilst he and Klatrif went inside the facility to obtain the holocron. After they went inside, Skywalker noticed that the pirates had arrived. Kenobi, Skywalker, and Klatrif went outside to meet them and were introduced to the Cryptor Raiders and their leader, Hudso Shaku, who knew that the holocron was something important due to off-worlders wanting to get it. Kenobi stated that they came in peace, but were willing to defend themselves. He activated his lightsaber, whereupon Shaku ordered his pirates to attack him because he found the laser sword to be more valuable than the things that they dug up. Kenobi quickly disarmed the pirates, but Skywalker froze up due to the suddenness of the attack and Shaku Shaku captured him by placing his sword under his chin. He ordered a trade, the boy for the lightsaber, but was taken down by Skywalker using the force to assault Shaku with small pebbles. With Shaku knocked unconscious and the pirate's weapons destroyed, they surrendered to the Jedi. On the shuttle home, Kenobi praised Skywalker for his great work on his first mission. Skywalker, however, exclaimed that he froze up and was not ready for a mission even though he believed otherwise. Kenobi reassured Skywalker that it was he who was not ready. He asked how he could save his Padawan if he could not save his master from dying. Skywalker, with renewed confidence, stated that they would save each other, and that this is what Qui-Gon would have wanted. Kenobi agreed, and then recalled that Anakin wanted to fly the shuttle. Skywalker, in response, said yes enthusiastically. A Chancellor for a Friend by the time he was 12 and 29 BBY, he had built his first lightsaber. After its construction, Kenobi said to him, Anakin, this weapon is your life. Like he had helped Kenobi before, Jedi Battlemaster Sin Dralig helped Skywalker train in lightsaber combat, with Skywalker learning a great deal from Dralig's unparalleled expertise. When Kenobi was assigned to study a dead star system that orbited a black dwarf, Skywalker decided to join his master without permission, but fell asleep during the journey. Upon being found by Kenobi as he slept, Skywalker's mentor decided to bring him along for the mission, showing him the dead star before them as an example of why the Jedi needed to avoid attachment, because all things, even the brightest of stars, would pass on. That year, at which point three years had passed since the Battle of Naboo, Skywalker sought to impress his peers at the Jedi Temple. During a training session, he defeated a training droid, which he had programmed to mimic the appearance of the Sith of Naboo. All the while, Mace Windu, Kenobi, and Supreme Chancellor Sheev Palpatine watched, the last of whom was impressed. Sometime later, Skywalker struggled to learn the skill of taming creatures, when Kenobi told him that the Chancellor wanted to see him. The two arrived at his office, where Palpatine requested that Skywalker accompany him on an errand, declining Kenobi's Company. Left alone, Skywalker escorted Palpatine to Club Kasakar in level 2685, all the while listening to Palpatine express concern for the situation on the subsurface levels of Coruscant, the inability of the Jedi to respond efficiently, and the corruption that plagued the Senate, such as Calandris. Subtly, and unbeknownst to Skywalker, marking the beginning of his influence over him. At the end of the errand, Palpatine asked if Skywalker was happy as he was. Though Skywalker answered that he was, and that training to become a Jedi was all he ever wanted, it did plant a seed of doubt in his mind. Later, at the Jedi Temple, Skywalker confided in Kenobi that he wished to leave the Order, feeling uncomfortable at the prospect of his entire life being decided when he was only 9 years old, and he surrendered his lightsaber to his master. Though Kenobi took the weapon, he pleaded for Skywalker to reconsider. Mission to Carnelian 4 
Before Skywalker could give his definitive answer, at Yoda's behest, both student and master responded to a mysterious distress signal from the supposedly dead world of Carnelian IV that specifically called for a Jedi intercession. They began their journey to the coordinates, but their shuttle was damaged due to the planet's atmospheric debris field, and the two had to eject from their doomed vessel, landing below the Celadon Sea. Not too long afterward, they came to be aware of life on the planet as a sky battle raged over them, and Kenobi returned his lightsaber to him so that he could defend himself. As one of the combatant airships began to fall, Skywalker and Kenobi saved its two-person crew by delaying the crash. The two survivors, Kolara and Mother Pran, who identified themselves as open, knew nothing about what a Jedi was. They were forced to take cover when a closed airship, which Kenobi fell, Skywalker saved its pilot, Grecker, from falling to his death. But due to the historical feud between their factions, Grecker and Pran tried to murder each other, forcing Skywalker and Kenobi to destroy their weapons and escort them to safety. To facilitate their journey, they used the intact parts of each of the airships to form a new one in order to fly to their destination. During the conversations that ensued, Skywalker mentioned his and Kenobi's purpose on the planet, to find the person who had sent the Jedi distress signal, which alerted Pran and Grecker to the location of the scavenger. During the journey, Kolera told Skywalker about the mysterious kites, before noticing that he was good at fixing things, as he made an adjustment to his lightsaber. Kolera and Pran then had Skywalker repair a bag of droid brains, and seeing his usefulness, threw away his lightsaber and abducted him when a horde of fishers attacked the ship, leaving Kenobi alone with Grecker as the airship crashed below the Celadon Sea. Skywalker was taken to one of the Open's fortresses where he witnessed as Pran used the processors that he'd repaired to activate some battle droids. As they left to wage war on the mysterious scavenger, who reminded both Open and Closed of everything they had lost and how badly they had failed, Skywalker remained with the younger Open, whom he convinced to protect the scavenger and help him get back to Kenobi. Using their help, Skywalker fixed the remaining droids and intervened in the skirmish between the Open and Closed. He saved his master from Mother Pran and met with Kalera and Sarah, but rather than trying to stop the fight, Kenobi had Skywalker repair a communications unit and called the Republic for aid. Soon enough, a task force arrived and forced the natives to cease hostilities. In the aftermath, his master offered Skywalker his lightsaber, asking him if he was still adamant about leaving the Order, but Skywalker decided to remain a member. Inquiring about lightsabers Sometime after he and his master's previous mission, Skywalker and Kenobi were about to spar in the Jedi Temple training grounds when Anakin asked his master why the Jedi used lightsabers as opposed to any other weapon powered by kyber crystals. Upon hearing this question, Kenobi used the Force to take Skywalker's weapon and told him how when he was young, Kenobi had the idea for two short lightsabers to be connected by a chain. Upon revealing this tidbit to his apprentice, Kenobi told him the same thing that Kaigon Jin had told Kenobi, that wielding a lightsaber shows intent, and that the user put thought behind wielding the weapon before drawing it, enforcing the idea that Jedi are protectors as opposed to destroyers. Rescuing Master Yoda at some point after the mission to Carnelian IV, Skywalker was being tested by Kenobi, who was having the Padawan attempt to defend from a group of marksman aged training remotes using a wooden stick rather than his lightsaber, in the presence of Yoda, Windu, and Master Bantirin. When Skywalker used the Force to grab his master's lightsaber, completing the trial using it instead, he and Kenobi began to argue with one another, which made Yoda, Windu, and Irin walk away. As Kenobi left with a team of Jedi Temple guards investigating a disturbance in the Force, he ordered Skywalker to remain there and clean up. Disobeying Kenobi and riding down to the temple storage level by using two training remotes to travel through the temple's vents, Skywalker followed the Force to the training stores, where he was attacked by the cause of the disturbance, a team of battle droids. As the droids and Skywalker fought, the Padawan was forced to use the Force and Electro Blades he found in a nearby box, as Kenobi had taken his lightsaber after his training maneuver. However, Kenobi and the guard team quickly arrived arrived, giving Skywalker back his lightsaber and joining the fight, only for Skywalker to leave upon having a forced vision about the council chambers. Rushing to the council chambers and past a seemingly knocked out guard, Skywalker was held back as a masked enemy disguised as a temple guard appeared to kidnap Yoda himself, with Skywalker failing to catch up to the escaping enemy on a jetpack. After being returned to the council chamber after the jetpack failed him, Skywalker reported what he had seen, with one temple guard finding the seemingly unconscious guard to actually be a disguised battle droid. When Skywalker spotted a non-Techno Union logo on the droid's head, Kenobi and him traveled to the temple archives, where they learned that it was the symbol of the Nova Crime Syndicate. Traveling to the Syndicate's base of operations on the Wheel space station, albeit in disguise to not disrupt the uneasy truce the Jedi held with its Baron Administrator Jaspara, the two Jedi located whom they believed to be Grynask Sandberge. 
the leader of the Nova Syndicate. With their mind tricks appearing to work, the supposed criminal gave them new information that pointed them to the planet Glee Anselm, where they encountered several aquatic battle droids and found the fake Temple Guard's underwater base of operations. Upon finding Yoda trapped in the base within a thick seaweed and besting the fake Temple Guard, Kenobi allowed Skywalker to unmask their foes as thanks for noticing the Nova symbol on the battle droid back of the temple. Upon unmasking the enemy, however, Skywalker and Kenobi were shocked to see that it was Irin. Their confusion was only increased when Senberge appeared, only to reveal himself to be a Force-sensitive and then remove his mask, showing himself to actually be Windu in disguise. When Skywalker realized the entire adventure had been a test, Yoda easily freed himself from the seaweed and confirmed Skywalker's theory, revealing that it was a test for Skywalker and Kenobi both. Having seen how well they could work together instead of arguing, Skywalker and Kenobi began to view each other as brothers. To leave the world, the two lifted their shuttle off the seabed together. A memorable training session. Later, Skywalker was waiting for his master in one of the Jedi Temple's training areas, where he gazed out the window until Kenobi joined him for a sparring session. After exchanging lighthearted remarks with his master, whom he had started to think would not be coming, Skywalker and Kenobi began their duel, during which Skywalker showed extreme aggression. Kenobi warned his Padawan that the fighting style was antithetical to the Jedi mission to protect life, but Skywalker, certain his aggression would win him the duel, rebutted by claiming mercy was no way to defeat an enemy. He continued with aggressive strikes until Kenobi was backed into a corner, where he locked sabers with his master and demanded he admit defeat. Instead, Kenobi slipped away when Skywalker raised his blade and inadvertently created an opening. The duel carried on as Skywalker again continued to beat Kenobi back until he knocked his master's lightsaber away, which Skywalker took as a sign that the duel was over. However, Kenobi noticed his Padawan was blinded by a need for victory, telling him as such before continuing the duel without a lightsaber. Kenobi managed to get behind Skywalker and used the Force to claim his lightsaber as his own, using it as proof that Skywalker's need to prove himself would always keep him back. While admitting his Padawan was a great warrior, he told his apprentice he would never advance to become a Jedi Knight if he failed to overcome his need to show his worth. Skywalker was given back his lightsaber by Kenobi, who smiled at his apprentice after his warning. Skywalker then followed Kenobi out of the room. Both men remember the training session for years to come. At some other point, Skywalker and Kenobi were also involved in a mission to Terrace, during which Skywalker worked on a Rasbohan high encryption comlink. Reuniting Ten years after the Battle of Naboo in 22 BBY, as the Separatist Crisis threatened to tear the Galactic Republic apart, the 19-year-old Skywalker and Kenobi were involved in an important mission to settle a border dispute on Ancyon. Upon their return to Coruscant, an assassination attempt on Padme Amidalia, now Senator of Naboo, prompted the Jedi Council, at the behest of Chancellor Palpatine, to send Skywalker and Kenobi to protect Amidala from future attacks. Anakin was delighted to see her after so many years. He had thought about her every day since since they parted. In at least her first year in the Senate, Amidala had at times thought about the boys she met on Tatooine, such as when she passed the Jedi Temple. She also dispatched Sabe to free slaves on Tatooine with the particular mission to free Shmi, feeling as though she made an unofficial promise to set her free, but Sabe was unable to locate Skywalker's mother. When Padme said she wanted to know who wanted her dead, and Obi-Wan started to explain they were only there to protect her life, not to investigate, Anakin promised Padme to find who was responsible, annoying Obi-Wan. When Padme returned to her chambers, Anakin was disappointed, claiming that Padme hardly even recognized him. However, Jar Jar, who was a representative in the Senate during this time, said Padme was very happy to see him too. During that night, Anakin and Padme agreed on a plan of using her as bait in order to capture the assassin, much to Obi-Wan's dismay. Anakin told him that although Padme had covered the cameras in her bedchamber, he was certain he would sense if anything were to happen in the room. Kenobi had doubts about his Padawan's power. Shortly after, when his master noticed that Skywalker was tired, he admitted that he had constant nightmares about his mother. He also revealed his powerful affection for Amidala. Obi-Wan warned him to control his emotions, saying that Padme was a politician after all and could not be trusted. This led the two into a debate about whether every politician, including Amidala and Palpatine, was corrupt. As Skywalker expressed his faith in Palpatine's benevolence, he sensed something in Padme's room. He arrived just in time to cut two venomous cohuns in half, just a few centimeters from the senator's face. Obi-Wan noticed the assassin's droid at the window and threw himself out, grabbing it. Anakin rushed to a row of speeders parked near Padme's apartment. When the bounty hunter Zam Wessel shot her droid down, Skywalker arrived on the scene as his master was in freefall. Catching Kenobi, the Padawan continued in the pursuit of Wessel's airspeeder. Spotting the Jedi, Wessel took her speeder on a nosedive, plunging several meters towards the lower levels of Coruscant. 
With the Jedi relentlessly pursuing her, Wessel flew through the exhaust flames of the Kurdos Company recycling plant, hoping the flames would scorch her adversaries in the open top speeder. Seeing the pair still chasing her and unharmed by the flames, Wessel fired at the couplings of a nearby electrical plant, causing the Jedi's speeder to be inundated by electrical shock. Skywalker, an expert pilot himself, quickly caught up to Wessel. The bounty hunter steered her craft into a network of sky tunnels, aiming once again to lose the pursuing Jedi. Skywalker did not chase directly into the tunnel, but opted to travel an alternate route. Wessel wove through the local network of tunnels. Anakin and Obi-Wan thought they lost her, but just a few minutes later, Anakin noticed the bounty hunter's airspeeder below and jumped out, let his body drop the intervening distance through the air, and then latched a firm hand grip to its rear canopy handle. He ultimately was forced to let go when she shot at him, although not before getting a good look at her, wherein he deduced that Zam was not only a female but also a changeling. He briefly glimpsed Wessel's true form when she looked up. The Jedi ignited his lightsaber and sliced at the windscreen, knocking out the guidance systems. Wessel shot the lightsaber out of Skywalker's hand, but the ensuing struggle caused Wessel to misfire her blaster pistol, damaging the control pipes. Meanwhile, Kenobi, who was behind Wessel at this point, caught Skywalker's lightsaber. The airspeeder began to plummet towards the surface, crashing near the outlet club. Wessel crawled from the crash site and fled into the club. Anakin was about to follow Zem into the building when Obi-Wan stopped him, returning to him his lightsaber, reiterating this weapon is your life. As they headed to the Outlander, Kenobi said that he had the feeling his apprentice would be the death of him. Anakin indignantly responded that Obi-Wan was like a father to him. Anakin was instructed by his master to search the premises while he went for a drink at the bar. Wessel hid until the two Jedi separated and then slowly approached the seemingly vulnerable Jedi at the bar. To secure the accuracy of her shot, she continued approaching the Jedi with her weapon drawn while Kenobi, through the Force, sensed the bounty hunter's intention. In an instant, Kenobi ignited his lightsaber, spun around, and severed Wessel's arm below the elbow. Skywalker and Kenobi took the wounded bounty hunter and dragged her from the club, setting her in an alley behind the club for interrogation. Wessel was initially reluctant to give any information about who hired her, replying that it had simply been a job. As Skywalker pressed her, however, Wessel prepared to divulge the information. Suddenly, a mysterious figure fired a toxic dart into Zam's neck. Return to Tatooine Subsequently, the Council sent the Master and Padawan on separate missions. Skywalker, on his first solo mission, would protect Amidala on Naboo, whereas Kenobi continued on an investigation into Amidala's aggressors that took him to Kamino. Joined by R2-D2, Skywalker and Amidala departed for Naboo, aboard the Jandirian Valley, a refugee ship leaving from the western spaceport. On Naboo, the two visited Amidala's family home, and Skywalker noticed how much she loved the flower garden maintained by her father, Rui Naberi. While on Naboo, as he experienced inner conflict about his strong desires for her and his duties as a Jedi, Skywalker revealed to Amidala his love for her, but she refused since Skywalker was not supposed to form attachments as a Jedi, even though she felt the same for him. Skywalker was also troubled by dreams of his mother suffering, which prompted him to return to Tatooine and rescue her, to which Amidala agreed to accompany him. On Tatooine, the two located Watto, who revealed that he had sold Shmi to a moisture farmer named Kleag Lars. The two then visited the Lars farm, only to discover that Shmi had been been abducted by Tusken Raiders about a month before their arrival, and was feared to be dead. Determined to save her at all costs, Skywalker took the swoop bike of his stepbrother Owen Lars and searched for his mother. Though he managed to find her in a Tusken camp, she had her wrist tied up to a stick, and she had a cut on the side of her face, and then she died in his arms moments later. Consumed with grief and rage, Skywalker slaughtered the entire village of Tusken Raiders, men, women, and children. Only then did Skywalker bring his mother's body back to the homestead, where her funeral was held, and he claimed that he would become so powerful in the Force that he could stop the people he loved from dying. This event left him full of pain and guilt for failing her and failing as a Jedi, as well as haunted by the prospect of letting go of the people he loved. First Battle of Geonosis It was then that Skywalker received a message from Kenobi telling him of Separatist presence on Geonosis, which they retransmitted to Coruscant so that the Jedi Council could see it for themselves. Upon learning he had been captured, Skywalker and Amidala departed for the planet, where they entered one of the factories where his lightsaber was destroyed, but were subsequently captured and placed with Kenobi into the Petronaki Arena to be executed by beasts. However, the two managed to avoid the creatures, in Skywalker's case, Arik, only to be surrounded by droidicas on Count Dooku's orders. However, a Jedi assault team led by Mace Windu arrived to rescue them. Nevertheless, they fought a losing battle against an overwhelming amount of battle droids, including droidicas, B1 series battle droids, and B2 series super battle droids until Master Yoda arrived with the newly established Grand Army of the Republic and safely boarded the survivors of the arena into LAAT gunships. 
As the battle raged between the clone troopers and the Separatist droid army, they caught sight of Dooku. When Amidala and a clone trooper were knocked from the troop bay by a cannon blast, Skywalker argued with Kenobi about going after her. After he proclaimed he did not care if he'd be expelled from the Jedi Order if it meant saving her, Skywalker only agreed to continue when Kenobi reminded him Amidala would continue on her duties if she had been in a similar crisis. Skywalker then looked back at where she had fallen as they continued to race after Dooku. Kenobi and Skywalker pursued the Count to a secret hangar where they engaged with him in a duel. Both were defeated, and though Kenobi suffered minor wounds, Skywalker lost his right forearm. It was then that Yoda arrived and fought Dooku until the Sith Lord made his escape on his Solar Sailor. The battle marked the start of the Pan-Galactic Clone Wars, and Skywalker received a cybernetic replacement for his lost arm. Marriage to Padme Amidala while Kenobi returned to Coruscant, Skywalker accompanied Amidala to Naboo, where they were secretly married, their sole attendants being their faithful droids R2-D2 and C-3PO. As he still needed to recover from the Battle of Geonosis, Skywalker was able to remain on Naboo for several days, enjoying his honeymoon and time after it with Amidala. Clone Wars Begin Following the engagement on Geonosis, Skywalker built a new lightsaber to replace the one he lost. Early in the war, Skywalker quickly came to have encounters with Dooku's personal agents. When Senators Amidala and Yaruo were ambushed by General Grievous on the moon of Stagak, Kenobi volunteered himself and Skywalker for the mission. Shortly after they arrived on the moon, Skywalker followed a trail of footprints into a nearby forest. There, he and Kenobi discovered Yaruo's daughter, Vivian, who gave Skywalker a flower and led the Jedi to the ship where her father had been taken. When Vivine headed for the ship, Kenobi ran after her, causing him to be captured by the surrounding battle droids. Skywalker attacked the battle droids and tried to stop Kenobi and Vivine from being captured, but was too late. As the ship left, Skywalker lamented not leaving any droids intact for interrogation. Calming his mind, he meditated to think of a solution. Skywalker then used the Republic shuttle they'd arrived in to sneak into the Providence-class dreadnought Grievous was commanding. Alongside Kenobi, Skywalker cut down the remaining droids and ran off to find Amidala while Kenobi went to confront Grievous. By the time he reached her, however, he found that the Senator had already rescued herself and her associates. Skywalker then returned with the group to the Republic shuttle. Kenobi arrived shortly after with Vivine, informing the group that Yarua had died saving his daughter. After leaving the ship and escaping into hyperspace, Kenobi reported to Yoda while Skywalker checked in Amidala, who comforted Vivine over her loss. Serving as a Jedi Commander Later, Skywalker served with his Jedi Master as a Jedi Commander, participating in battles on a rocky planet alongside Kenobi's 7th Sky Corps and Clone Marshal Commander Cody. Afterwards, Skywalker encountered the clone trooper known as Sister, who was arranging the helmets of her fallen brothers beneath a tree as a memorial. Skywalker spoke with Sister, and she explained that she was saddened by her brother's deaths, as well as the origins of her name and the camaraderie her clone brothers had shown for her and her gender identity. Skywalker shared that the Jedi supported such identity and the belief of rising above things, such as Sister's transcendence of the concept of gender. Sister agreed, and both moved to rendezvous with Kenobi at his location. Business on Kato Nemoidia a short time later, Skywalker was promoted to the rank of Jedi Knight. This was initially done informally as a result of the increased need for Jedi on the battlefield, but was soon legitimized by a knighting ceremony. Though the Jedi were not yet formally integrated within the Grand Army of the Republic, this appointment to knighthood made Skywalker an acting Jedi General. Skywalker spent the night after his knighting ceremony with Amidala, in which he presented her with a Padawan braid pendant that he had made for her after his Padawan braid was cut. Shortly after his knighting ceremony, the purse world of Cato Nemoidia, the headquarters of the Trade Federation, was rocked by a destructive explosion that was blamed on the Republic. Kenobi, now a Jedi Master and acting council member, was selected to travel to Cato Nemoidia to investigate the explosion. Wanting to clear any separatist involvement, Dooku sent his own agent to Cato Nemoidia as well, which was later revealed to be Asajj Ventress. Skywalker expressed his desire to accompany Kenobi on this mission, but was instead assigned to instruct a group of younglings, passing on what he had learned as a Padawan, much to his dismay. Before Kenobi left for Kato Nemoidia, Skywalker gave him a Rasbohan high encryption comm link so they could remain in contact. He later accompanied the younglings on an aid mission to Langston, in which he was given command of the 302nd Battalion, with Clone Commander Theo serving as his second in command. While en route to Langston, Skywalker became acquainted with the youngling Mil Alibeth, a Zabrak girl who was experiencing nausea as a result of a unique connection to the Force. Empathizing with her struggles as a mirror of his own, Skywalker chose to guide an 
instruct Alibeth as she grew to accept the Force and her connection to it. Kenobi eventually contacted Skywalker, asking him to analyze data he had found that incriminated the Republic in the bombing. When he lost contact with Kenobi, Skywalker disobeyed orders to rescue his former master with Alibeth by his side. Shortly after arriving on Cato Nemoidia, Skywalker and Alibeth found a series of bombs planted in important Nemoidian landmarks, which they later discovered were planted by Katar Nor to send a message to the Republic. They came to find that Kenobi was on trial for conspiracy against Cato Nemoidia after Ventress found the data that incriminated the Republic. Skywalker rescued Kenobi moments before rifles from Nemoidian guards fired on him. With the help of Rube Quarnam and Amidala, the Republic was cleared of any involvement with the bombing, instead revealing that an outside actor orchestrated the bombing to point to the Republic and Separatists in order to play on the fear of both sides of the new war. When they returned to Coruscant, Palpatine passed the Jedi Military Integration Act, officially making the Jedi a part of the Grand Army of the Republic, and marking the beginnings of General Skywalker and General Kenobi. Ali Beth, now apprenticed to Rignima, providing special medical and spiritual assistance, bid farewell to Skywalker and Kenobi, thanking the former for his guidance. This mission was one of the several that Skywalker counted as the times he saved Kenobi's life, but Kenobi, however, insisted that the business on Cato Nemoidia does not count. Skywalker also believed the operation was the first time he encountered Ventress, but he recognized her Genevax class Fanblade Starfighter and she already knew his name. General of the 501st. The 501st Legion was under Skywalker's command during the war effort, with his first in command often being Clone Captain CT7567, who was also just known by his nickname, Rex. While at first Rex needed to adapt to his maverick Jedi General because of the clone captain's by the book and no nonsense nature, Rex would come to admire and would sometimes emulate Skywalker's willingness to bend the rules and genius for improvisation. And Skywalker and Rex would even become friends. The Venator class Star Destroyer Resolute served as his personal flagship under the Admiralty of Wolf Yularen. During the war, Skywalker cut the B1 battle droid R0GR down on a number of occasions. Years later, after R0GR met C3PO and learned the protocol droid had been built by Skywalker, he thought this fact practically made him and 3PO unit family. At some point before he received a scar over his right eye, Skywalker participated in the Battle of Arantara. During the battle, Rex was wounded and rendered unconscious. After being found by Skywalker, Rex was surprised to see that he had come back for him, as acts like this were not extremely common amongst the Jedi. Skywalker responded that it should have been him in his place, telling his captain that a true leader always led from the front. Siege of Hisin some time later, the Jedi Council sent Skywalker, along with Kenobi and Jedi Master Plo Koon, along with their respective battalions to the besieged planet of Hisin, in order to stop a Separatist victory on the planet. While protecting a village from oncoming droid forces, the clones required backup before Skywalker, Kenobi, and Koon arrived to rescue them. The three jumped into combat as Koon used the Force to push several droids into one another, destroying them. After a short battle with the droids, the Republic emerged victorious over that wave of droid forces. With this, Skywalker deactivated his lightsaber and met with Cody, Clone Commander CC3636, and as well as Clone Captain Rex, regarding the Hessenian Parliament, as well as a Hessenian Premier who was to meet with Count Dooku and Asajj Ventress, which could possibly lead to Dooku dissolving the government on Hessen and allow him to control the planet. With that, Kenobi informed the clones that they would need to hold that position while the three went after Dooku and Ventress. With that, the three Jedi left to confront them. Meanwhile, Rex told a story about him and Skywalker during a mission on Bangalore. Eventually, the three managed to find Dooku, leading Skywalker to enter a a duel with him while Kuhn contacted Trooper CT4860, requesting immediate aid. As Skywalker and his fellow Jedi chased Dooku and Ventress, they received a distress call from Rex, leading to the Jedi breaking off their pursuit to help their soldiers. Upon rescuing their clones, it was clear the day had been won for the Republic, because the soldiers had rescued the Hessenian Parliament from Dooku's droids. Skywalker and his allies then departed Hessen to return to Coruscant. Battle of Christophsis a few months into the war, Skywalker and his former master, Kenobi, were tasked by the Jedi Council to break the Separatist blockade on Christophsis and assist Alderanian Senator Bail Organa on his relief effort on the planet's surface. Initially overwhelmed, Kenobi presented Skywalker with a Republic stealth ship prototype with a cloaking device and tasked him with flying it past the blockade in order to deliver supplies to Organa. Accompanied by Eulerian, Skywalker chose instead to engage Separatist Admiral Trench directly and divert his attention from Organa on the surface, decloaking 
attacking his stealth ship, Skywalker launched torpedoes at the Dreadnought Invincible, but his missiles were repelled by the ship's powerful thermal shields. After successfully evading Trench's return fire, Trench sent a message over an open frequency, warning that he had faced this kind of ship before, and that they should retreat before they were destroyed. Using the information supplied by Kenobi, Skywalker surmised that Trench would lock onto the ship's magnetic signature to destroy it, and so Skywalker decloaked once more, firing another volley of missiles at Trench's dreadnought. Trench took the bait and locked onto the stealth ship's magnetic signature, firing several tracking torpedoes. Skywalker steered the ship straight into the Invincible, scraping right past its hull before Trench's missiles struck the bridge. As Trench had just fired the missiles, his ship's shields were still recharging, and the dreadnought was destroyed. After defeating Trench, Skywalker delivered the supplies to Organa. After breaking the blockade, Kenobi joined Skywalker and the rest of the Republic forces on Kristoff's surface, and together, they planned an ambush on the advancing droid army. Instead, they were ambushed and forced to evacuate. Aware of a possible traitor amidst them, the Jedi duo decided to go behind enemy lines in order to seek information, leaving Rex and Cody to find the traitor. In the empty Separatist headquarters, Skywalker and Kenobi ran into Asajj Ventress, whom they dueled before flying two STAPs back to base. They soon arrived to discover Rex and Cody apprehending Sergeant Slit, the double agent. As the battle raged, Skywalker's squad and the rest of the Republic forces managed to force the Separatists into a temporary retreat, but the need for reinforcements was evident. Instead, a young Togruta girl, Ahsoka Tano, arrived to relay Master Yoda's message for them to return to Coruscant for a new mission, presenting herself as Skywalker's new Padawan, much to his dismay. The impending Separatist threat made it impossible for them to leave their post, so Skywalker and Tano, whom Skywalker nicknamed Snips, went behind the enemy lines to destroy their droid's deflector shield generator, while Kenobi stalled for time by holding a fake surrender negotiation with General Loathsome. Despite having to fight a few droids that protected the generator, the two managed to destroy it, allowing the Republic army to finish off the droids and win the battle. Only then did Skywalker and Tano find common ground, and he accepted the responsibility of mentoring her. Battle of Teth as Yoda arrived with reinforcements, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Tano were informed that Jabba Deslegicture's son, Rata, had been kidnapped, and Skywalker and Tano were to go to Teth to search for the Hutlet, whereas Kenobi would speak with Jabba on Tatooine. With a time limit of only one planetary rotation to deliver Rata, Skywalker and his Padawan landed in Teth, where they were flanked by battle droids. Fighting their way up a cliffside, they make their way into a monastery. Once inside, they discovered that it was Asajj Ventress who had kidnapped the Hutlet. With considerable effort, the Master Padawan pair seized Rada and escaped aboard an abandoned R9 Rigger class light freighter, the Twilight. They saw that help had arrived and planned to take the Hutlet to one of their Star Destroyers for help, as he had gotten sick. Unfortunately, the cruiser was destroyed, forcing them to take Rada to his father on their own. Missions in Hut Territory Upon arriving on Tatooine, they were attacked by Magna Guards, and though they defeated them, the Twilight crashed, forcing them to travel through the desert. Choosing to split up in the Dune Sea, Tano took Rada to Jabba's palace, whereas Skywalker was confronted by Count Dooku. After a brief duel, Skywalker stole Dooku's speeder bike, knowing his Padawan was in trouble, and reached Jabba's palace, where he was told that Rada had not been delivered and that he would be killed. Just then, Senator Amidala contacted the Hut Crime Lord and informed him that his uncle Zero was involved in the kidnapping, just for Tano to arrive along with Rada, resolving matters to Jabba's satisfaction. Sometime after the treaty between the Republic and Hut Clan was finalized, Skywalker and Amidala were sent to meet with Lannix Senator Zas Trivak on the luxury MPO 1400 Pergil class star cruiser Halcyon, and ensure that he would not sway Lannick to align with the Separatists and to cut off Republic supply routes. After assisting a logistics droid named D-309, Skywalker and Amidala observed Trivac as he hurriedly returned to his cabin. Knowing that Kenobi had the ship's destination staked out with a unit of clones, due to reports of Separatist agents, the couple decided to enjoy their time together on the Star Cruiser. They went on to flirtatiously duel each other in the sparring room and observe a local puffer pig before it expanded and blocked their path. As they relaxed in the climate simulator, Skywalker suddenly sensed Ventress on the ship and realized that she was there to extract Trivac. He and Amidala then broke into the senator's cabin and discovered a hole cut into the floor. Following the trail, they quickly found Trivac being escorted by Ventress. As Skywalker dueled Ventress, he and Amidala were threatened by a few guards before Amidala stunned them with the help of a young Thalathian boy named Shor Comrin. Just then, the fighting was stopped by a hut who had the combatants surrounded by security. When the hut threatened to end the hut clan's treaty with the Republic, Amidala explained to him that they were to root out a traitor and reminded him of the mid-rim trade routes that they benefited from, 
While Trivac begged the hut for mercy, Ventress stabbed the senator in the back and used her lightsabers to shatter a nearby window, leaping out into space and escaping in her fanblade starfighter. Amidala held onto Shore's hand as Skywalker sealed the opening with the Force. She then commended the boy for his bravery while Skywalker watched as Ventress flew away. Following the Battle of Hypori, Kenobi, Cody, and the 212th Attack Battalion were sent to aid Commander Mechadrix and his forces from Rune at a battle on Abrion Major. As he went to meet with Yularen, Kenobi contacted Skywalker and the Jedi wished each other luck before Kenobi left for his mission. The Malevolence when news reached them of the destruction of Jedi Master Plo Koon's fleet in the Upper Gato system, Skywalker and his Padawan set out to rescue him and any survivors, in spite of his orders to rendezvous with Kenobi's fleet. Though he sent his ships and most of his men, Skywalker himself and Tano used the Twilight to rescue Koon and three other clones, who told them of a new Separatist superweapon, the Subjugator-class heavy cruiser Malevolence, which was commanded by Grievous. After yet another attack from the Malevolent, Skywalker decided to lead the Shadow Squadron into an attack against the Heavy Cruiser, only to narrowly escape the Malevolence's Ion Cannon, which left too many bombers destroyed or incapacitated. Forced to change the plan, Skywalker and the bombers dropped their payload on the Ion Cannon, forcing it to overload, damaging the ship, and causing the Malevolence to retreat from its attack on a Republic medical station. While making his escape, Grievous captured Senator Amidala, who entered the system under the belief that she was sent to negotiate with the Intergalactic Banking Clan's Supreme Executive, rather than a trap. Ordering their ships to halt their fire, Skywalker and Kenobi boarded the Malevolence to rescue her. While on the ship, Skywalker sabotaged the ship's navigation system to cause the ship to crash into a moon, should the hyperdrive be engaged, before escaping the ship alongside Amidala and Kenobi. Battles at Corvair Sector and Kudo 3 Following the Malevolence campaign, Skywalker later led several of his bombers and fighters against the Separatists in the Corvair Sector. After defeating the Separatist fighters, Skywalker spoke with Admiral Yolaren aboard the Resolute. Yolaren confirmed that the Separatist contingent came from the droid foundry on Kudo 3. Skywalker agreed to attack the foundry quickly before Separatist reinforcements arrived. However, Skywalker did not approve of the attack's high casualties that included the Kudon. Yolaren suggested that they should do a surgical strike on the foundry's generator. Skywalker spoke with Master Kenobi about his plan for attack, who reminded Skywalker to trust his feelings and the Force. Skywalker took R2 with him aboard his interceptor and made his way to Kudo. After Skywalker landed, he made his way to the foundry and saw the Kudon being used as slave labor. Skywalker fought the battle droids and freed the Kudon. Skywalker was able to convince them to arm themselves and fight the battle droids. The mission was a success, and Skywalker returned to the Resolute. Following the battle, wherein a group of clones from Rishi Station prevented a surprise attack on Kamino, Skywalker and Kenobi awarded medals to two of its survivors, newcomers Echo and Fives, with Skywalker welcoming them into the 501st Legion. R2-D2 Lost Following numerous Separatist victories from General Grievous and the defeat of the Falin Battle Group, Skywalker attempted to stop the Cyborg from taking his sector and planned an ambush for the Separatist forces as they were passing through Bothoi's asteroid field. Placing ATTEs on the nearby asteroids, he managed to destroy the Separatist frigates and force Grievous to retreat in the Soulless One, resulting in a pursuit by Skywalker. However, debris from the destroyed Separatist frigates damaged his ship, leaving him to be rescued by Rex at the cost of losing R2-D2. Though he was supplied with a new astromech droid, R3-S6, Skywalker was saddened by the loss of his friend and did not take to the new droid, and felt something suspicious about its true allegiance. Instead, he launched a search, scouring the battlefield, unable to find R2-D2. They boarded a nearby scavenger ship, the Vulture's Claw, only to leave empty-handed as Ga Nacht delivered R2-D2 to Grievous. With all hope lost, Skywalker attempted to continue life without the droid, scouting for a possible Separatist listening outpost, until R2-D2 sent a message revealing his location at Skytop Station. Upon arrival, Skywalker ordered Tano and Rex to fulfill the mission objective, to destroy the station, while he went to find his lost droid. Though Skywalker engaged several Magna Guards, he found R2-D2 and met up with Rex and Denal, who told them that Tano would want to distract Grievous alone while they completed the mission. It was then, as Anakin already suspected about R3-S6's true allegiance, that R3 revealed himself to be Grievous' spy, and set several Vulture droids and Super Battle droids against them. As they resisted, Tano rejoined the group, only to be scolded by her master for engaging the droid general alone. R2-D2 opened the hangar doors, defeating R3-S6 in the process, to be retrieved by a happy Skywalker. Walker, delighted to have his longtime friend back safe. Following Viceroy Newt Gunray's capture in Rhodia by Amidala, Skywalker separated from Tano, who went on to serve as Gunray's escort alongside Luminara Unduli. 
Although the two failed in their task, Skywalker reunited with Tano at the rendezvous point. Captured on Florum Together with Kenobi, Skywalker spearheaded an attempt near the planet Vancor to capture Count Dooku, where Skywalker let himself be captured by Dooku's Munificent Class Star Frigate and taken to a prison cell, only for Kenobi to come and rescue him. The two Jedi then gave chase to Dooku, who escaped in his Solar Sailor, with a Sheathapede Class Transport Shuttle. After taking direct hits to their shuttle, they were forced to crash land on the planet. In a nearby cave, the two Jedi began to hunt for Dooku, but the Sith Lord ambushed them by causing a sudden collapse in the cave ceiling. While Dooku escaped the cave, they had to render a gun dark unconscious, only to nearly succumb to poison gas released from a trapped pocket in the cave. They were saved just in time as Tano and a detachment of clone troopers rescued them. Later, as Supreme Chancellor Palpatine and his representatives were contacted by Hondo Onaka to receive a reward for capturing Count Dooku, Skywalker and Kenobi were assigned to verify the pirate gang's custody of Dooku, agreeing to the pirate's condition to arrive unarmed. The Jedi were met at gunpoint in the twilight and escorted to Onaka, who arranged a meeting with their prisoner. The Jedi mocked Dooku's imprisonment, and the Sith Lord warned them not to underestimate the weak way. Skywalker and Kenobi were invited to a party by the pirates only to wind up passed out in a cell chained together with Dooku. Despite several attempts by the Jedi and Sith to escape on their own, Representative Binks was the one to rescue them, although the mission came at the cost of Senator Karras' life and Dooku's escape. Obi-Wan told Anakin not to harm Hondo and left peacefully. Quell and Meridun Sent in as reinforcements for Jedi Master Isla Sakura's and Commander Bly's forces, which were heavily outnumbered and overpowered during the Battle of Quell, Skywalker, Tano, Rex, and their forces assisted in an evacuation of Sakura's cruiser as it fell under heavy separatist fire. Meeting with Sakura, a raging inferno ran through the cruiser, and Skywalker sacrificed himself to save the others, severely injuring himself in the process. Tano and Sakura dragged Skywalker onto the evacuation frigate, where he was given medical treatment for his injuries. As they prepared to dock with the Resolute, an ambush by several Vulture droids caused the ship's hyperdrive to activate, sending them into deep space. After narrowly avoiding an incoming star, they crash-landed on Meridun, where Skywalker was left in the care of Rex, while Sakura, Tano, and Bly set out to ask the natives for medical support. Rex defended Skywalker from several vicious Mastiff Fallones until Tano arrived back with Bly and Lermit Healer Wag 2, before a final confrontation against the vicious attackers. Soon after their arrival, Separatist forces landed on the planet, and the Lerman leader, T. Wat Ka, accused the Jedi of bringing the war to their peaceful planet, ordering them to leave immediately. Though they did, the Jedi returned to the Lerman village after learning about the Separatist sinister objective, to test their new super weapon, the Defoliator on the Lerman. The group set up a shield generator to protect the village from the blast of the weapon, as well as the incoming waves of battle droids. As their shield was destroyed and the defoliator was being reloaded for another shot, Skywalker disabled the weapon before capturing Separatist General Locke Durd. The Jedi then left the planet, now peaceful again, on several Republic cruisers sent by Ularin. Orto Plutonia After losing contact with the Republic outpost on Orto Plutonia, Skywalker, his droids C-3PO and R2-D2, and Kenobi were sent to investigate with a squad of cold assault troopers under the command of Captain Rex in the company of Pantora Senator Ryo Chuchi and Chairman Chi Cho. Skywalker and Kenobi investigated the outpost following the mysterious death of all of its clone troopers, and the two Jedi deduced that all the clones had been killed, but not by battle droids, since another nearby Separatist base had also been attacked. Skywalker and Kenobi followed their clues to a nearby canyon, where they found a village inhabited by Tals who explained that they were only trying to protect their home as translated by C-3PO. Acting as a mediator, Kenobi proposed a peace meeting between the Tals and Chairman Cho, but the latter refused to share the moon with the Tals and declared war, despite the Jedi's efforts to bring peace. As battle broke out amongst the clone troopers and the Tals, Senator Chuchi convened with the Pantoran assembly and called Cho out of order. The battle came to an end when Cho was killed and Chuchi gave a proposal to the Tals to share the moon with them. Blue Shadow Virus Upon Amidala's petition to send Skywalker and Kenobi to assist them in locating suspected Separatist presence on Naboo, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Tano arrived to find that Amidala and Binks had gone to investigate the eastern swamps. Sending the young Padawan with Pepe Bo to find them, the two Jedi were informed by Captain Gregor Typho that before losing contact with Amidala, she had informed them of the laboratory's location and of Dr. Nouveau Vindi's intentions to release the dangerous blue shadow virus back into the galaxy. While Tano led an attack on the southern entrance, providing a distraction for Kenobi and Skywalker to enter through the hatches undetected, 
Skywalker confronted Vindy, who electrified Amidala and Binks to make his escape. After saving the Senator, Skywalker pursued the scientist, capturing him with the help of Peppy Bo and Kenobi on the swamp above. Preparing to transport Vindy to feed for his trial, they heard an alarm go off below them, and then Skywalker contacted Tano. She told him that Vindy's servant droid had set off one of the viral bombs, liberating the virus, and that she, along with the clones, were trapped in the laboratory, just like Amidala was. Once in feed, Captain Typho told the two Jedi that they had found a possible antidote for the virus, a Rixa root, but that it could only be found on the planet of Aiego. Despite Typho's warnings that it was suicide, Skywalker set off alongside Kenobi aboard the Twilight. Upon arrival, Skywalker and Kenobi were greeted by a group of inoffensive B-1 series battle droids that had been reprogrammed to do the bidding of a local boy, J. Bo Hood. He told the Jedi that the planet was protected by a deity known as Droll, who would not let any who arrived on the planet leave again, but also instructed them on how to retrieve the Rixa roots. Though the plant attacked them, they obtained the root and bid farewell to Hood before taking off, only to be forced to turn back after encountering a laser web, the work of the Separatists. On their second attempt, however, they used Hood's reprogrammed vulture droids, and Kenobi managed to shoot the laser generator, liberating the inhabitants of Aiego. Skywalker and Kenobi then arrived in time to rescue their friends on Naboo. Battle of Ryloth During the Battle of Ryloth, Skywalker gave Tano command of a squadron to fend off Martuk's blockade to make way for Kenobi's ground assault, encouraging Tano to overcome her nervousness about leading her first squad. However, during the battle, she disobeyed her master's orders and lost many men, for which Skywalker reprimanded her when she arrived back at the Resolute, yet understood her good intentions. Skywalker then reported his losses to Windu and Kenobi. He gave her some time to recover, but informed her that they needed to proceed with the attack on the blockade, which upset Tano because he was rushing the plan despite their recent losses. Though he told her to go cool off somewhere, Skywalker had an idea. He evacuated the damaged Defender, which he could pilot by himself into the Ryloth system to distract the Separatists, while he gave Tano full command of the attack operation. By the time Turk realized the ruse, it was too late, for Skywalker had already escaped in an escape pod and let the Defender collide with Took's control ship. Though Took escaped, Tano destroyed the Confederate fleet and Skywalker was rescued from his escape pod. After Kenobi and his men were able to take out the proton cannons and allow the transports to land, whereas Windu headed for Lesu with his forces, Skywalker and his forces secured the space around Ryloth, forcing the remaining Separatist cruisers to flee. He reported this on a holographic conference with Chancellor Palpatine, Yoda, Admiral Yolarin, Senator Orin Frita, and Windu. However, Separatist General Wat Tambor soon deployed hyena-class droid bombers to destroy Ryloth's villages, and Skywalker engaged them in his interceptor, accompanied by Tano and clones. Before Lesu was destroyed on Count Dooku's orders, Skywalker and Tano both shot them down. Subsequently, Tambor was captured and the Republic was victorious. Ryloth was finally free once more. Holocron Heist Skywalker and Clone Commander Wolf fought alongside each other during the Battle of Korm, where the clone officer lost his right eye to Ventress. Sometime later, during the First Battle of Felucia, Skywalker, Tano, and Kenobi fought against the droid army, but while Tano was away on a jungle patrol, Skywalker, Kenobi, and their clones were surrounded. However, a Republic fleet commanded by Wolf was able to break past the Separatist blockade, so Skywalker and the others could be evacuated by Master Plo Koon. However, Tano refused to retreat, and Kenobi and Skywalker went to retrieve her before her forces were overrun by droids. While Skywalker and Tano argued about the retreat, as Tano believed the droids were retreating, she boarded the gunship in time, and the three Jedi watched as her abandoned vehicles were destroyed. Back at the Jedi Temple, Skywalker attempted to take the blame for her disobedience, citing that he had given her more freedom due to her skills. Still, the Council relegated her to guard duty in the Jedi Archives to reflect on what she had done. When Yoda sensed that thieves would arrive at the temple, Skywalker and Kenobi inaccurately deduced that their enemies were after their transmission codes and went to secure them, only to be proven wrong when they located the intruder's position at the ventilation shaft. They were misdirected then to the communication center, where they narrowly escaped an exploding Toto, and realized only too late that Cad Bane had stolen a holocron from the vault. Furthermore, the bounty hunter that was assisting Bane, Kato Parasiti, revealed that Bane's next target was Bala Ropal, keeper of the Kyber Memory Crystal, which contained a list of all known Force-sensitive children in the Republic. Skywalker then volunteered himself and Tano to meet with Ropal, arriving in the Deveron system to cut off the Separatist fleet that was assisting Bane, who had already captured Ropal and tortured him to death in a containment field after he defiantly refused to open the holocron. 
Skywalker, Tano, and Rex boarded Bane's munificent class frigate and stormed its bridge, where R2-D2 accessed the ship's computer to locate Ropal, or rather Ropal's dead body. After an explosion rocked the ship, the Jedi spotted Bane and chased him into a trap. After a duel with Tano, the bounty hunter took her as hostage, and Skywalker was forced to bow to Bane's demands to open the holocron. Though he did so, Skywalker also pulled his and Tano's lightsabers to himself and attacked Bane. However, Bane distracted him by opening the airlock on Tano's cell and escaped, while Skywalker saved his Padawan and made their way to the hangar, where the troopers had stolen a shuttle and escaped the exploding Separatist ship back to the Resolute, but not before letting Bane enter disguised in trooper armor. After landing on the Resolute, Rex later noticed Duro's blood in the shuttle and pursued Bane, who nevertheless managed to escape in a V-19 Starfighter. Skywalker and Tano returned to the Jedi Council to report their failure. Skywalker, along with Kenobi, Windu, and Yoda, meditated in hope of finding the children that Bane was after before he kidnapped them. Seeing the future, Skywalker and Tano were assigned to Naboo to set a trap for Bane in Jungwa City, capturing him as he attempted to kidnap Ruru Page. With the real child safe, the two Jedi took Bane to the Resolute, where Skywalker, Windu, and Kenobi interrogated the bounty hunter with a combined mind trick. Exhausted, Bane gave them coordinates that Kenobi and Windu were to follow, while Skywalker reported the details to Palpatine on Coruscant, from which Skywalker and Tano deduced from the ashes on it and its refueling record that Bane had been to Mustafar. With nothing else to do, the Jedi pair left on the twilight for the planet where they found the children. Though one of the droids set the building to be destroyed in the lava on Sidious's orders, Skywalker and Tano saved the children and returned to Coruscant. Skywalker admitted to the Council that they were unable to find out who was behind the kidnappings, to which Yoda advised caution on the path ahead. Battle of Felucia on a mission to investigate the disappearance of Felucia Medical Station HCTFF2 that was orbiting over Felucia, their shuttle was attacked by a group of six Vulture droids deployed from an automated deployment station, forcing them to crash land on Felucia. Trapped on the planet, they came across a Nicillan farm village after searching around for a while. They soon realized that the Felucian villagers were being protected by a group of bounty hunters, led by Sugi Embo, Rumi Paramita, and Serapas. The village elder, Cassus Mitagatis, explained to the Jedi trio that they had hired the bounty hunters because pirates had been taking their crops. After some debate amongst them, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Tano decided to help the farmers defend themselves. That night, they were visited by the pirates, Hondo Onaka's gang, familiar to Skywalker and Kenobi. Onaka then told the group that he would be back, but by then, Skywalker had taught the Felucians how to fight with their staves. Though slow at first, they eventually picked up the craft. After a few days, the Onaka gang returned as promised and a skirmish ensued between the factions. During the confrontation, Skywalker dueled Onaka and his Electro Staff, leaving him hanging off a cliff and begging for mercy, to which the Jedi Knight pulled him up and Onaka realized that their efforts were no longer profitable, leaving on his ship. Alongside the bounty hunters, the Jedi themselves left soon as well, to reach the closest Republic outpost. The Zillow Beast during the lengthy campaign on Malastare, Skywalker discussed with Palpatine, who contacted them via hologram, and Windu, the effects of the new Electro-Proton Bomb, just as the Separatist droid army prepared a new attack, with the Republic expecting to successfully defend the Dugs and secure a treaty for their fuel. Though exceedingly effective, the bomb created a crater, which Windu went to investigate, whereas Skywalker was to ensure the treaty with Doge Urus, only to be called by Windu to assist him in the scouting. The two soon discovered a gigantic creature whose armored skin was impervious even to lightsabers, the Zillow Beast, from which they fled, only to be told by Urus that they wanted it killed, even though it was previously thought to be extinct. With the use of RX-200 Falchion-class assault tanks, the Republic forces put the creature to sleep, convincing the Dugs that it was dead. With the treaty signed, and Malastare now a member of the Republic, Palpatine ordered the beast to be shipped to Coruscant for study, despite Windu's objections. After the Zillow Beast was brought to the Republic capital, Kenobi and Amidala asked Skywalker to speak with Palpatine about the fate of the creature. Reluctantly, he agreed. When both he and Amidala met with the Chancellor, Palpatine and Vice Chair Mas Ameda tried to justify killing the beast was for the greater good. Amidala objected to their claims, but Skywalker chose to stay neutral, instead of opposing either his wife, Amidala, or his friend Palpatine. Although Palpatine claimed that he wished to kill the beast, he in fact wanted to research it as he was intrigued by the durability of the Zillow Beast's armor. However, the beast escaped from captivity in Dr. Ball's laboratory and directly targeted the Chancellor himself for his attempts to kill it. Cornered by the beast, Skywalker and the others evacuated his office on his executive shuttle, only for the beast to grab it upon takeoff. They were freed when Skywalker sliced the shuttle in half, causing everyone to fall out of the shuttle, with Skywalker saving Amidala from falling from the Senate building's roof. The beast was ultimately killed when gunships fired gas at its mouth on Palpatine's orders. Another mission to Cato Nemoidia 
Even as the Clone Wars continued with no end in sight, Skywalker was allowed to leave after a long tour of duty. After returning home to his wife's apartment for a romantic evening, Skywalker was recalled to the temple by the Jedi Council. Believing Senator Rush Clovis to be a Separatist supporter, they decided they needed a spy. In this case, Senator Amidala, of whom Clovis was an old friend. The next day, Skywalker met Amidala in the Senate and asked her about Clovis, who initially refused to do it until she heard that Clovis could be a Separatist. Skywalker accompanied her to the Jedi Council, where the Masters encouraged her to find out about his possible treachery. After learning that he was planning to go to Keda Nemoidia, Skywalker dressed as the pilot of Padme's starship and took them there, all the while frustrating Clovis's attempt to get closer to his wife. During the mission, Skywalker and R2-D2 waited for Amidala to give them the signal. When she did, Skywalker sneaked into her quarters, where he saw Amidala and Clovis embracing. Though it prompted a surge of anger and jealousy in Skywalker, she discreetly showed him the disc she had stolen from Clovis and gave it to Skywalker. After which the Jedi retreated. It was soon after that the poison that Amidala had been given by Lot Dodd began to set in and she passed out. After Dodd revealed to Clovis she was a spy, he helped Skywalker take her back to their ship, back to Coruscant, and forced Dodd to give him the antidote, only for Skywalker to leave Clovis behind, stranded on the planet. Second Battle of Geonosis Immediately after routing Separatists near Doran, Skywalker and Tano were sent to participate in the Second Battle of Geonosis, alongside Kenobi and Ki Adi Mundi as the Republic returned to destroy the Geonosian primary droid factory. Intending to make a three-pronged attack against the shield generator, Skywalker Tano and the 501st Legion set out to attack the Separatist defense lines from the south to reach the rendezvous point. With only Kenobi's forces arriving at the landing zone, as both Mundi and Skywalker's transports were shot down and forced to make their way to Kenobi by foot. Though they encountered resistance, Skywalker's team met up with Mundi's forces. After contacting Yalaren to deploy a squadron of BTLBY wings to help with them, they returned with Kenobi and his company, where they planned the assault on the shield generator. They then improvised on their plan, leading the charge, Skywalker and Tano disabled the enemy cannons with EMP grenades, enabling the ATTEs to destroy the shield generator as the gunships arrived, the Geonosians in the area surrendered. Though Mundi and Kenobi left for medical treatment, the Republic forces continued pushing forward towards the massive droid foundry, and Skywalker and Tano were joined by Luminara Unduli and her Padawan, Baris Afi who met as Skywalker and Tano angrily discussed Skywalker's lack of trust in Tano's dependability. As Afi and Tano were sent into the Geonosian catacombs under the factory to plant explosives, Unduli realized that Skywalker was unable to let go of Tano and put her at risk, rather than distrusting her. Nevertheless, the two Jedi generals went on to distracting the droid army by marching straight into the factory and engaging the enemy. As Poggle the Lesser had his super tanks deployed, Skywalker and Luminara left their men behind and destroyed the bridge, only to learn that their Padawans had not returned yet. Cornered by droids coming from the factory, Skywalker was contacted by Tano and she apologized, uncertain that she and Afi would survive their ordeal before using a super tank to destroy the facility. Refusing to let his Padawan die, Skywalker ordered to have them found. Unduli, however, told him that he needed to let go of his attachment to her if she were to be dead. Fortunately for them, Skywalker was contacted by Tano. After locating them, they rescued the two Padawans. Sending Tano and Afi to recover out of the battlefield, Kenobi and Mundi returned to join in the cleanup of Separatist forces. For her part, Unduli left in search of Poggle before he could escape when a sandstorm broke out. Forced to wait until the storm lifted after her last contact, Skywalker and Kenobi went to Unduli's last known location, the Progate Temple. Entering the catacombs below, not only did they discover undead Geonosian warriors, they also encountered the captive Unduli, Poggle, and the Geonosian queen, Karina the Great. Setting up their men to surround the queen and her brethren, Skywalker and Kenobi tried to negotiate with her, for Kenobi wanted to know how the undead warriors were created. After discovering her use of parasitic brain worms, they freed Unduli, captured Poggle, and fled from the queen, with Rex and Cody burying the queen in her lair. With Poggle in Republic custody, the four Jedi generals prepared to deliver him to Coruscant, where they sent Tano and Afi on a mission to transport medical supplies from a medical station near Ord Cestus to Mace Windu on Dantooine. Unbeknownst to them, one of the troopers, Scythe, was infected with one of the Queen's brain worms and boarded their Pelta-class frigate, the TB-73, forcing the two Padawans to fend off the infected clones. When the ship failed to report in as scheduled, Skywalker believed there to have been a complication and was proven right when Tano contacted him about the situation. Angered, Skywalker went to Poggle's cell on his own and told the guard troopers to leave them alone. He demanded that Poggle answer his questions with a mind trick, but the Archduke informed him that it would have no effect on a Geonosian like him. It was then that Skywalker resorted to physical violence, attacking the captive Geonosian with Poggle still unwilling to talk. Skywalker gave in to his anger and began to force choke him. Only then did Poggle tell the Jedi Knight, through a translator droid, that the worms were affected by cold. 
Skywalker relayed this information to his Padawan, telling her through the comlink to rupture the cooling system. Thanks to his advice, Tana was able to defeat the worms as they reached the medical station. Skywalker rushed to her encounter, where he consoled Tano on her doubts about sparing her friend's life. Salukamai Following the capture of Jedi Master Eeth Koth in the Outer Rim, General Grievous sent a hollow transmission to the Jedi Council, in which Grievous stated that he did not care about the Jedi's politics nor their Republic, concluding that he lived only to see them all die. As Kenobi decoded Koth's hand signals that told him of their location at the Salukamai system, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Adigalia were dispatched on a mission to rescue him. As a distraction, Admiral Yularen and Kenobi engaged Grievous' forces over Salukamai, with Kenobi allowing the Surrogator to be boarded by Grievous. Discreetly, Skywalker, Galia, Rex, and a group of clone troopers would execute a hyperspace jump into the system in an ambassador's shuttle that would bring them right alongside Grievous' cruiser. Once they boarded it, Skywalker and Galia made their way to the stern of the cruiser, where they encountered a T-Series tactical droid with a group of BX-Series droid commandos. The two Jedi destroyed all the droids and rescued Koth, with Skywalker taking the injured Koth back to the shuttle. When Kenobi reported that Grievous had defeated him and escaped, Galia left them to help Kenobi flank Grievous to capture him once and for all. Unsuccessful in their endeavor, Skywalker picked the two up at the hangar with their shuttle, only to leave for the Resolute, where he waited while Kenobi conducted a search mission for Grievous on the planet below alongside Cody, Rex, and the other troopers. Sometime later, Skywalker and his Padawan spearheaded a mission to Coruscant's underworld to apprehend Kar Afa an arms dealer selling Republic weapons to Separatists. When they arrived at a cantina where Afa was hiding, Skywalker instructed Tano to wait outside while he apprehended the fugitive. The confrontation, however, caused a crowd to leave the bar at once, during which Tano lost her lightsaber, which prompted her to seek the help of Jedi Master Terra Sinube when they went back to the temple, as she did not want Skywalker to find out that she had lost her weapon. Mandalore Following allegations that Mandalore had allied with the Separatists and Kenobi was sent to the planet to speak with his old friend, Duchess Satine Cries, Skywalker joined them to escort the Duchess on her journey to Coruscant aboard the Coronet. On the ship, Skywalker and Kenobi told their men to be on alert when Cries requested their presence before her and Skywalker correctly surmised that Kenobi had strong feelings for her just as his former master told him of their past together. When R2-D2 picked up readings in the cargo hold, the two generals were informed by Rex and Skywalker went to investigate, only to be attacked by assassin probes. After destroying two of them, Skywalker informed Kenobi that there might be a traitor aboard the ship, and Skywalker returned to sweep the hold in search of more. After Kenobi lured the traitor out, Tal Merrick, and Skywalker destroyed another probe, he helped search the coronet for Merrick and Cries, now his hostage, until several B2 super battle droids sent by the Death Watch boarded the ship. Leaving Kenobi to save his girlfriend, he destroyed the droids and then went to find Kenobi, who like Cries, hesitated to kill Merrick. Skywalker, however, had no such compunctions and impaled Merrick, branding himself a cold blooded killer to retrieve the Senator's detonator before he could destroy the ship. With no further complications, they arrived at Coruscant. As Cries complimented Kenobi, Skywalker noted that she was quite the remarkable woman. Following the Mandalore defense resolution, Skywalker and Kenobi escorted Amidala to a meeting with the Chancellor in which he thanked her, but also apologized to Cries before leaving Kenobi and Cries alone. Trapped on Vancor Preparing to rendezvous with a Republic frigate, Skywalker and Mace Windu traveled aboard the Endurance, on which they greeted a squad of clone cadets with an infiltrated Boba Fett among them. After Fett sabotaged the ship and everyone had to evacuate in escape pods, including himself, before being rescued by Bosk and Aura Singh on the Slave One, Skywalker and Windu rescued the missing cadet's damaged pod. As the survivors were being transferred to a medical frigate, the two went to the Endurance's crash site, where they searched for Admiral Killian and any other survivors. As the bridge appeared relatively intact, they resolved to enter the wreckage, even with R2-D2's misgivings, which prompted Windu to chastise Skywalker for encouraging individuality in his astromech. Leaving R2-D2 and R8-B7 to scan for life forms, Skywalker and Windu entered the bridge to find the survivors executed, with Skywalker noticing a Mandalorian helmet. With Windu correctly surmising that it was bait set by Boba Fett, he saved Skywalker from taking the full brunt of the explosion set off by touching the helmet. Now trapped under the rubble, the wounded Skywalker and the unconscious Windu were soon found by R2-D2, whom Skywalker told to call the temple for help. As they waited for the astromech to come back, Windu told Skywalker why Fett wanted him dead. He sought revenge for killing his father, Jango, during the first battle of Geonosis. As the Endurance began to collapse, they were rescued by Tano, Plo Koon, and a clone squad, thanks to R2-D2 delivering the message at the temple itself. 
After spending time in a Bacta tank at the temple, Skywalker urged Windu to track Fett down and bring him to justice. The Jedi Master did not agree until Kun and Tano showed him a message from Fett and Singh, with hostages, one of them, Pons, killed in cold blood by Singh. Though Windu decided to go, Kun said that he would take the mission alongside Tano since both Windu and Skywalker were both recovering from their injuries. As they arrived on Coruscant with Bosk and Fett in custody, Skywalker was present as Fett apologized for causing so much destruction, but claimed he would never forgive Windu for killing his father, before they were taken away to the Republic Judiciary Central Detention Center. Balith Following his wife's mission to discover a conspiracy on Mandalore, Skywalker and Captain Rex escorted Tano to her solo mission on Mandalore to instruct cadets at the Royal Academy of Government at the behest of Duchess Cries and the Jedi Council. Upon their arrival at Sundari, Skywalker presented Tano to the Duchess and Prime Minister Almec. Before leaving to join with Kit Fisto, Skywalker took his Padawan's lightsaber to respect Mandalore's laws. After Tano exposed Almec's black market operation, Skywalker reunited with his Padawan, to whom he returned her lightsaber. Back in the Jedi Temple, the Jedi Council congratulated Tano on her courage and strength, but also ordered Skywalker to command the Third Legion on Balith to give assistance in their civil war. Told by the Council to stay behind so she could give them her full report, Tano pleaded to Skywalker Walker to let her come along, but he told her that she should use this time in the library to prove him wrong about his assertion that she learned more on the battlefield than in the temple, before leaving for Balith with Rex. Skywalker returned to Coruscant to greet, along with Yoda, his Padawan, Amidala, and Bail Organa after the Alderaan Refugee Conference, during which Tano captured Aura Singh. Wondering who would pay for Amidala's assassination, Yoda had Tano use her improved precognitive abilities to find out who was behind the assassination attempt. With her description, Amidala realized who it was. Zero the Hut. Skywalker and his Padawan then went to the Judiciary Detention Center to question Zero, who was tricked by Tano into confessing that he had hired Singh for the job. Satisfied, Skywalker and his Padawan then left the Hut to his misery. The Battle of Kamino Forwarded by the destruction of Rishi Station and an intercepted transmission between Asajj Ventress and General Grievous, Skywalker and Kenobi traveled to Kamino to warn Shakti and Prime Minister Lama Su of the upcoming Separatist attack, with Rex, Cody, Echo, Fives, and the rest of the 501st Legion in their company. Shortly, Grievous's fleet arrived and Skywalker led the Republic Space Forces, scoring several serious hits against the enemy. On the planet below, Topoka City was attacked by Trident-class assault ship and AQ-series battle droids, prompting Kenobi to recall Skywalker to the city. Soon after returning, Skywalker engaged Ventress, who had stolen the prime DNA sample of the clone's template, Jango Fett. With the aid of a clone trooper platoon, Skywalker recovered the sample from Ventress, but she, like Grievous, managed to escape yet again. The Blockade of Pantora Skywalker was later informed by his apprentice that Pantora Chairman Papanoida's daughters had been kidnapped. Knowing that the Jedi could not get officially involved, he slyly gave her permission to rescue them due to personal concerns. This turned out to be successful, with both daughters being safely returned to their father. Senate Crisis Supposed to be on a meditative retreat, Skywalker spent some time with his wife in her apartment, observing as Amidala anxiously arranged a party for Senator Aang, who held the deciding vote on the Military Oversight Committee. Skywalker tried to ease her mind, telling her that the party would work out and that she should relax when they saw C-3PO being fuzzy about the arrangements. At Amidala's request, Skywalker sent the protocol droid and R2-D2 to buy the Jogan fruit that the latter had forgotten to buy for Aang's favorite dessert, Jogan fruitcake. Although they were delayed, Amidala nevertheless hosted the party all the same, with her and Skywalker waiting for the droids to come back, who did so just in time to present the cake to Senator Aang. Not too long after, Skywalker went to the Senate building to convince Amidala to go away together for two weeks to a faraway place where no one would recognize them, so that they could actually be husband and wife instead of Senator and Jedi. Amidala, however, rejected the idea, for she was preparing an important bill for the Senate. Skywalker retorted that the bill seemed more important than their love, but Amidala countered that it was not, just that they both lived to serve the Republic. However, Skywalker stated that there was nothing more important than the way that he felt about her, and proved it by giving Amidala his lightsaber, which Kenobi had once told him was his life. Though she believed he was teasing her, Skywalker was sincere about his feelings, and the two shared a kiss. They were soon interrupted by C-3PO and Senator Organa's voices, prompting Skywalker to hide under her desk and Amidala to hide his lightsaber in her sleeve. She went to the lobby to attend a meeting about the Enhanced Privacy Invasion Bill, only to be taken hostage along with several other senators by Cad Bane and his team. Following her, Skywalker saw the situation when Bane spotted him and sent his henchmen to capture him, but Skywalker avoided them long enough to contact Palpatine and defeat an IG-86 Sentinel droid empty-handed. 
before being shocked into unconsciousness by Robonino and Aura Singh and brought before the senators. After the bounty hunters placed bombs that would go off if their laser detectors were triggered and left the building, Skywalker woke up and Amidala returned his lightsaber. He then used it to cut a hole in the floor, dropping all the senators one floor down to safety, just before Bane triggered the bombs and escaped alongside now freed Zero. Meeting Madam Sinata Following the crisis, Skywalker went with Amidala to Kamas to board legendary actress Madame Risha Sinata's private ship. However, they were late to see her play about Darth Kristav. After they arrived, Skywalker and Amidala met Sinata. Skywalker agreed to see her museum despite Amidala's reluctance. Skywalker took Amidala to her room. The next day, Skywalker and Amidala went to the museum. There, they saw a display of Varikino where they exchanged their vows. Skywalker and Amidala came under attack by several robots from the displays. Skywalker fought them off and helped Amidala escape with them. Skywalker and Amidala discovered that Sinata was collaborating with Dooku and the Separatists. Skywalker then took one of these Separatist agents while Amidala discovered a list of anti-Separatist senators. Skywalker and Amidala then found out that along with Amidala, Sinata planned to kill them with Deoxys gas. Skywalker and Amidala fought several LEP servant droids to stop Sinata from killing the senators. With assistance from R2-D2, Skywalker and Amidala reached the theater. As Amidala told the audience to run, Skywalker borrowed a mask and helmet from an actor before confronting Sinata, who had her own lightsaber. Skywalker fought Sinata until he held her at the end of his lightsaber. Skywalker and Amidala then reported their trip to the Jedi Council. Intense Training after arriving late to one of Tano's training sessions, Skywalker became frustrated with the simplicity of the exercises. In turn, he told her to meet with him later for an actual training session. Later, Skywalker took Tano to an isolated area with Rex and the 501st. He then had the clones surround Tano and fire stun bolts at her. The sessions continued for hours until Tano told Skywalker that the battle droids weren't nearly as good as the clones. Skywalker explained that this was the point and he wanted her training to be difficult so that she would know how to protect herself. Tano would continue the sessions with Rex and the 501st throughout the war. Jedi Ceremony One day, Skywalker was waiting with Master Yoda in the Jedi Temple grounds for Tano. Once she arrived, Skywalker reprimanded her for being late, but Yoda praised her for helping out and proceeded to extend her Padawan braid. Following a debate in the Senate about a financial reform bill, Skywalker was asked by Amidala to persuade the Jedi Council to speak with Palpatine about denying the continuation of the war. Skywalker allowed Tano to go with Amidala in order for her to learn more about politics. After an apparent Separatist attack, Skywalker confronted his apprentice about how her and Amidala's meeting with Onderon's senator, Mina Bonteri, on Raxus Secundus and how foolish it was. Despite that, Skywalker's apprentice learned that politics were not as black and white as she'd previously thought. Dathomirian Threat One year and eight months or so into the Clone Wars, Skywalker and Kenobi commanded Republic forces in a battle against Asajj Ventress's fleet in the Sullust system. Directly participating in the battle in their starfighters, Kenobi was singled out and attacked by Ventress, whose Genevex class fanblade starfighter was, in turn, disabled by Skywalker. As Kenobi and Ventress crashed into the hangar of the Separatist command ship, Skywalker soon landed to assist his former master. Together, the two Jedi engaged Ventress in a duel. They were interrupted, however, by the destruction of the ship, secretly ordered by Count Dooku. The two Jedi fled in their interceptors, presuming Ventress to be doomed. After the massacre on Devaron, Skywalker and Kenobi were sent to Dothamir, as footage had shown that the Council of a Dothamirian's role during the attack on Devaron. Once on Dathomir, they made their way to a village, where they were ambushed by the Knight Brothers until Skywalker took their leader hostage. The Zabrak then told the Jedi that a Knight Sister had taken one of them to their fortress, prompting the Jedi to go there. Skywalker and Kenobi questioned Mother Talzin, who told them his name, Savage Opress, and his whereabouts. The two Jedi then headed to Toydaria where they confronted Opress, but failed to stop him from killing King Katunko. Using the King's ship as theirs was destroyed, Skywalker and Kenobi caught up with their target on Dooku's Separatist flagship. However, Opress managed to overpower them, forcing the two to retreat and leave the ship, killing a defector. Following their encounter with Opress, Skywalker and Kenobi were called away from a blockade at Herdessa to meet with Ylarin. The Admiral informed them that Mechadrix had gone missing. In addition, an execution squad known as the Deathwind had been striking at Republic and Separatist targets. The group's namesake, the Deathwind Corridor, also passed by Mechadrix's home planet of Rune, creating a possible link. Ylarin went on to say that the Deathwind may have taken up a covert position on Ando. As such, Skywalker and Kenobi were to locate the Deathwind and kill Mechadrix if he was involved with them. Skywalker initially refused, believing that killing a potential ally would make the Jedi like the Separatists. Kenobi assured Skywalker that they would attempt to find a peaceful solution before they departed. After arriving on the planet and pushing through the local swamplands, the Jedi came upon empty sets of clone armor being used as effigies. 
Upon reaching the terminus of a river, they discovered an outpost built from the ruins of a Sith temple. They were then met by the Death Wind, who allowed the Jedi to see their leader in exchange for their lightsabers. Entering the outpost, Skywalker and Kenobi came upon Mechadrix, seated on a throne wielding a sword. Mechadrix claimed he had saved his victims by showing them the truth, that the purpose of existence was to kill and die. When Mechadrix revealed that his sword was made from the bones of a clone trooper, Kenobi asked what the clone's name was. Kenobi went on to claim that life gave the galaxy meaning and that death had no use for a sunrise, a name, a home, or a friend. Mechadrix then lunged at Kenobi, but Skywalker retrieved his lightsaber and stabbed Mechadrix through his chest. Skywalker expressed regret over killing him, but Mechadrix assured him that this was the quickest way back to the sunrise before he passed away. The Destiny of the Chosen One When the Jedi Council received a 2,000-year-old Jedi distress signal, Skywalker, along with Kenobi and Tano, were sent by the High Council to the Curlithium system, where they were supposed to meet up with Captain Rex and an armed cruiser. Though they both made it to the rendezvous point, neither Rex nor the Jedi's ship could see each other. In fact, the Jedi's ship was guided to a mysterious planet, Mortis, where they met a mysterious figure called the Daughter, who asked Skywalker if he was the One and who wanted to lead them to the Father. When Skywalker was separated from Kenobi and Tano and the Daughter, Skywalker tried to follow her only to reach the monastery where he met the Father and was given shelter for the night. As he tried to sleep, the figure of his mother, Shmi, appeared before him and encouraged him to tell her of his pain and guilt, that he was too late to save her and that he had failed as a Jedi and that he had failed her, having tasted only vengeance when he slaughtered so many to avenge her death. But as he mentioned his wife, who he claimed was everything to him, the father finally revealed itself to be the son, briefly assuming a monstrous appearance before disappearing. Shaken by the encounter, he confronted the father, who told of his family's history and wondered if he was truly the Chosen One. Though Skywalker dismissed the prophecy as a myth, the father arranged a test to see whether the Jedi Knight was fit to fulfill his destiny. Ordering his children to kill Tano and Kenobi, the father goaded Skywalker into choosing between his master and his apprentice, but Skywalker instead controlled the two beings, bringing them to their knees. Having proven himself to be the Chosen One, the father pleaded with him to stay, but Skywalker refused, leaving with Tano and Kenobi on their shuttle. They were interrupted when the son kidnapped Tano, prompting Skywalker to pursue him at the cost of damaging their ship near Sun's Cathedral. Despite Kenobi's reservations, Skywalker went after his Padawan and climbed the tower to find Tano, corrupted by the dark side. Skywalker fought her, soon to be joined by Kenobi, only to be interrupted by the father's arrival. Kenobi tried to hand Skywalker the Dagger of Mortis, but Tano grabbed it and gave it to the son, who killed her, for she was no longer useful. The dark side user then mortally wounded his sister as she stepped in to save her father. Skywalker begged the father to save Tano, and the dying daughter used Skywalker as a conduit to channel the last of her life force into Tano, resurrecting her. The father then told them to leave the planet before the son used their ship to do so. The ship's repairs forced them to stay a little longer though, and Skywalker went to the father for guidance. On their meeting, the father was determined to kill Son, but refused Skywalker's offer of aid, telling the Jedi Knight to look inside of himself for the answer of what was to be done. Leaving him, Skywalker encountered the Force spirit of his first mentor, Kaigon Jin. Though Skywalker Walker sought his advice, Jin advised him to remember his training and trust his instincts, and to go to the well of the dark side to face his most personal challenge. There, the son forced Skywalker to confront his future, one consumed by the dark side. Horrified, Skywalker submitted to the son as he promised him the power to avert his destiny. Soon, Kenobi arrived, and Skywalker left him trapped at the well, claiming to have seen the truth, that it was the Jedi who would stand in the way of peace. Skywalker arrived at his Padawan, disabled the ship, and went to rescue Kenobi, while the son went to steal the dagger. As Skywalker waited, the father appeared before him and recognized that his son had broken the rules of time. He wiped Skywalker's memory of those future visions, leaving him unconscious, and brought him to his monastery. Skywalker awoke to find the father, Kenobi, and Tano moments before the son arrived with the dagger. To end the conflict, the father impaled himself to distract his son, while Skywalker killed the son with his lightsaber. As the father also died, he warned Skywalker to be wary of his feelings as they could lead to his downfall. As was noted by the father, Skywalker had brought balance to the Force on Mortis through the deaths of the Force wielders, and he still had a chance to do so for the full galaxy. After the father's death, the three Jedi were transplanted back into the galaxy to finally rendezvous with Rex. Surprised to learn that, to Rex and the others, they'd only been gone for a moment, they returned to the Star Destroyer. They would later report this to the Council, with Skywalker even mentioning that he had spoken with Jin to Yoda. Even though Skywalker was not entirely convinced, they came to believe it had merely been an illusion of the old mentor. In reality, it had truly been the spirit of Jin. The Citadel Following the capture of Jedi Council member Even Piel by the Separatists, 
Skywalker and Kenobi were briefed by Master Plo Koon and sent along with their team, which included Rex, Cody, Echo, and Fives, to infiltrate the Citadel on Lola Sayu to retrieve Master Piel, who held the information on the Nexus route. Refusing to let Tano risk her life on such a dangerous mission, Skywalker devised a strategy to bypass the life form scanners of the prison. The whole team underwent carbon freezing and were transported to the Citadel by Commander R2-D2 and his reprogrammed battle droid squadron. After landing, Skywalker was thawed out and found to his surprise that Tano had disobeyed orders and followed him. Forced to take her along, the team made its way to the facilities, leaving the Astromech to guard their shuttle. After free climbing to the entry point through a cliff wall blasted by a strong gale and littered with electromines, and after Tano deactivated the ray shield on the entrance, the team was able to enter except for Charger who fell to his death and alerted the prison staff, led by Osi Sobek, of their presence. Inside, they lost long shot, but finally made it to Master Piel, whom they freed and who told them they needed to rescue his officers. Despite the many traps laid throughout the fortress, the team rescued the officers. When they met the other carrier of the Nexus route coordinates, Captain Wilhuff Tarkin, the team was split into two. While Kenobi's team created a diversion, Skywalker would lead the others away. In Tarkin's company, Skywalker and his team escaped through the cavern system below the prison. When Tarkin expressed some skepticism about the Jedi's plan, to which Skywalker told Tarkin that he reserved his trust to those who understood gratitude. However, they soon found common ground, for they both believed the Jedi Code prevented the Order from going far enough to achieve victory in the ongoing war, and Tarkin developed a grudging appreciation for Skywalker. As they made their way out of the fuel line to rendezvous with R2-D2 and the shuttle, they were attacked by droids and forced to join Kenobi at the pickup point, with the shuttle heavily guarded. During the skirmish, Echo tried to defend the shuttle, but its destruction and subsequent explosion seemingly killed him. As they ran into the cave system, Skywalker and Kenobi contacted the Council, telling them they needed to escape, and Kuhn immediately departed to pick them up. They contacted the Council again to be informed of the extraction point, and as they proceeded to the location, Sobek sent Anubis after them. The creatures claimed Master Piel's life, who passed his intel on Tano, and the group took a moment to honor his death. Ultimately, they got to the extraction point on time, and fled on Plo Koon's rescue shuttle, with Sacy Tin's fleet covering them, allowing them to escape back to Coruscant. Padawan Lost Skywalker, Tano, and 501st forces fought on Felucia alongside Plo Koon and his clones in taking out a reinforced Separatist outpost. Breaking their forces into three groups, Skywalker and Rex's team were responsible for attacking the front gate and destroying the tactical droid, TZ-33, securing the outpost together with Koon and Tano's teams. However, Skywalker then noticed that Tano had disappeared during the battle and ordered a perimeter sweep. Skywalker had his men search around the outpost to no avail several times over. Master Kuhn then informed him that he alerted all forces throughout the Outer Rim and assured Skywalker that she would be found eventually, but also firmly told him that their mission on Felucia was finished and that they had to return to Coruscant. However, Skywalker refused to abandon her, to which Kuhn observed his emotions were clouding his judgment. Skywalker countered, I will not leave her fate up to others. Kuhn insisted, it's time to go. Only then did Skywalker comply and call everyone in to leave the planet. Back at the temple, Skywalker relentlessly searched for possibilities in the star charts, which prompted Kuhn to suggest that he should trust in Tano's abilities. Following the events on Waska, Skywalker's search for his Padawan came to an end when she arrived on the temple on the Halo, in company of her Wookiee allies and the younglings Omer and Jinx. Upon seeing her, Skywalker profusely apologized for all that happened, heavily blaming himself for his apparent inability to protect her. Tano, however, assured him that his instruction gave her the skills necessary to survive, and thanked him for his guidance. The two bowed to each other in newfound mutual respect under the delighted eye of Master Yoda. Battle of Horain Sometime later, Skywalker participated in the Battle of Horain, alongside Kenobi and Rex. Skywalker was contacted by Rex, who was requesting assistance, though he was already preoccupied in a group of vulture droids. Skywalker later met Kenobi and Rex in disbelief, noticing they had hijacked an AAT alongside faulty battle droid bats. Skirmish on Retta on Retta, Skywalker ambushed a group of B-1 battle droids alongside Grandmaster Yoda. Skywalker was soon attacked by Krita, a Segreto who was attempting to scare the Jedi away. However, Krita soon became friendly to the Jedi as she was an old friend of Yoda. When Skywalker attempted to recruit Krita as a spy, the Segreto left, and Skywalker and Yoda were attacked by battle droids soon after. After being separated from Yoda, he met the Jedi Master and Krita again, the latter of whom explaining that she was protecting refugees of the Clone Wars. Using a hat from one of the individuals she was protecting, Skywalker pretended to be using the cloaking cap to distract General Flebic, allowing Yoda to take out a B-1. Believing there was no secret to invisibility and that it had all been a trick, Flebic fled the arena and boarded her ship. Upon being asked what his report would entail, Yoda told 
told Skywalker that he would tell Mace Windu that there was nothing of interest on Retta. The Battle of Moncala After the assassination of King Kalina of Moncala and a new discord in the fragile peace between Mon Calamari and the Quarin, Skywalker and Amidala, sent as representatives of the Republic, arrived at the planet at the behest of Captain Giel Akmar of the Mon Calamari Guard and protector of young Prince Lee Char, but so did Rift Hamson, Separatist Ambassador. Though Skywalker and Amidala tried to mediate between the parties, the Quarren left the Council Hall, dissatisfied with the Mon Calamari rule. Along with Akbar, they contacted Yoda and Windu, who dispatched a company of clone troopers equipped for underwater combat under the command of Kit Fisto and Tano. In the meantime, during the Quarren attack, assisted by Separatist aqua droids, Skywalker and Amidala accompanied Lee Char, who in turn was bodyguarded by Akbar. He engaged the Quarren soldiers until he was recalled by his wife to help Senator Mina Tills, while leaving Tano to cover the prince and rescue him from Tamsin. As the first Separatist Quarren assault came to an end, Skywalker reunited with Amidala, Tano, Fisto, Akbar, Lichar, and Tills to await the second assault, this time assisted by the Hydroid Medusas, which proved incredibly effective against the Republic Mon Calamari army. Forced to retreat into the caves below, they regrouped to decide their next course of action, to retreat to the surface, only to return to the seafloor as their frigate was destroyed and they were attacked by more enemies. They split into two groups. Skywalker was sent with his wife, Akbar, and Tills, whereas Fisto, Tano, and two troopers accompanied the prince. Expecting Republic reinforcements to come soon, Skywalker and his group proceeded to the Mon Calamari Central Planetary Scanner Facility, where the Jedi Knight collapsed the entire structure with the Force, rendering planetary defenses blind to upcoming Republic reinforcements, the Gungan Grand Army, and Representative Binks, sent at the behest of the High Council. However, Tamsin used Trident-class assault ship to create whirlpools, disorienting the Republic Gungan forces, and though Skywalker managed to destroy one of them, all but Tano and Lee Char were captured. Brought before Rift Hamson, Skywalker and Fisto were restrained by electric eels, whereas Amidala and Jar Jar Binks were imprisoned within containment devices, interrogating the two Jedi about the whereabouts of Prince Lee Char. During the interrogation, Tamsin attempted to force them to talk by biting a tiny hole into Amidala's helmet, allowing her suit to fill up with water. However, Tamsin left to see the located prince in person. Skywalker and Fisto used the force to remove the water from her helmet, while Binks used his own saliva to seal the puncture, saving her from drowning. The four were soon taken to witness Prince Lee Char's execution, in which Nasar Ri, the Quarren leader, saved the prince at the critical moment and turned his people against the Separatists, resulting in the victory of the Mon Cala people. With the peace restored, Skywalker and his friends were present for the coronation of Lee Char, now recognized by both Mon Calamari and Quarren as their new monarch. Naboo Following rumors that the Gungans planned to aid the Separatists in an attack on Theed, Skywalker accompanied Amidala to Theed and later to the Gungan territory near Lake Ponga, where they met with Binks, who confirmed the troubling rumors. He took the couple to Oto Gunga, where they spoke to Boss Lyoni, and realized that he was under the influence of a mind-controlling necklace, which Skywalker telekinetically snatched, making him recover. Lyoni told them that new minister Rish Lu had given it to him. Skywalker, Amidala, and Binks assisted Lyoni as he confronted Lu, only to face droid commandos, and for Lyoni to be stabbed by Lu before the minister's escape. Taking the boss to an infirmary, the couple noticed the uncanny resemblance between the unconscious Lyoni and Binks, who they convinced to impersonate Lyoni and cancel the Gungan assault on Theed. As he did so, uncovering Lu's deception to the army, Skywalker pursued the fugitive minister to a trap set by Count Dooku in Lu's laboratory. As Dooku killed Lu and revealed his secret input in the Battle of Naboo, Skywalker dueled the Count, only to be overwhelmed by Dooku's powers and his four Magna Guards. Dooku then contacted Amidala and offered an exchange, the Jedi Knight for General Grievous, who had been captured by the Gungan Grand Army, thanks to Gungan General Tarpal's sacrifice. An hour later, Skywalker was brought and handed over to Amidala, Queen Nyotni, and the Gungans, while Grievous was allowed to remain free. Battle of Umbara during the campaign on Umbara, Skywalker and Kenobi discussed their attack strategy against the Umbaran capital city, which was being defended by Confederate and local militia forces. Together with Rex and Fives, Skywalker prepared to repel enemy reinforces striking against Kenobi's joint attack with Jedi Masters Sai Si Tin and Pong Krell, who would be supporting Kenobi from the south, whereas Skywalker and the 501st Legion would advance from the north. Amidst heavy fire, Skywalker and his battalion made it to the landing site, and then to a ridge which they used as a staging area. As he and Rex awaited the rest of their men, hoping to move out soon and reinforce General Kenobi's battalion, Dogma reported that all platoons had reported in, and Skywalker told him to get some rest. 
Dogma replied that he was fine, but Rex told him it was a direct order, prompting Dogma to do as he was told. As Rex observed Dogma was wound tight but loyal, Skywalker joked that he reminded him of Rex, who disagreed, saying that it was him in the old days. Shortly after this, the Umbarans ambushed Skywalker and his troops, but an airstrike by Master Krell and Oddball saved them. After the quick save, Krell approached Skywalker with a disconcerting message. The Council had ordered Skywalker back to Coruscant effective immediately as requested by Supreme Chancellor Palpatine for reasons unknown. Though reluctant to leave his troops in the midst of battle, Skywalker was forced to relinquish command over his troops to Master Krell before making his journey back to Coruscant. Despite Krell's efforts to sabotage the Republic effort by tricking the 501st and the 212th battalions into attacking each other, Kenobi was successful in taking the capital and routing the remaining Umbaran forces, securing all sectors of the planet for the Republic. Kiros After 10 rotations since Yoda's last contact with the Togruta colonists on Kiros, Skywalker, Tano, Rex, Cody, Kenobi, and their forces arrived at the world to investigate its silence, with Skywalker particularly worried that they would be too late. After landing, suspicious of the lack of colonists in the town, they used BARC speeders to break through the city and surround the governor's tower, used as the separatist headquarters. The enemy commander, Darts Dinar, then sent a message to Kenobi to discuss terms of surrender. Skywalker then took the hollow projector out of Cody's hand and called Dinar Zygarian scum. Though Skywalker wanted to deal with the slaver himself, Kenobi told him to locate the missing colonists while he negotiated. As Skywalker contacted Admiral Yolaren to conduct a planetary bioscan to find them, Kenobi explained Skywalker's behavior to Tano. Overhearing from Kenobi's negotiations that Dinar had planted bombs throughout the city, Skywalker and Tano set out to disarm them. Despite sniper droids, they destroyed the bombs in the nick of time just for Kenobi to tell them Dinar was escaping on the Takora. With some effort, they managed to board the ship, inside which Dinar pitted a Blixis against them, but Skywalker managed to throw it off the ship while Tano bested Dinar in the cockpit. Soon, Skywalker joined her and with frightening intensity threatened the Zygarian into revealing the colonist's location, much to Tano's surprise. However, it proved effective as Dinar revealed that his queen would hold the royal slave auction. Zygaria when Skywalker, Kenobi, Yularen, and Tano told the Jedi Council of their findings, they were tasked with locating the colonists. On the Takora, and disguised as Zygarian, they land on the capital city of Zygaria, splitting into two teams. Kenobi and Rex went to locate the colonists, Skywalker and Tano went to meet Queen Mirage Skintel, with Skywalker posing as Lars Quell and bringing news of Bruno Denturi's supposed death, and presenting Tano as a present. He quickly won Skintel's favor, with the Queen inviting him to accompany her during the slave auction, where she intended to have Skywalker prove himself a slaver by torturing Kenobi. Instead, he freed Kenobi and tried to escape with R2-D2 returning their lightsabers, Rex providing covering fire, and Tano confronting the Queen. Despite their efforts, however, they were subdued, but Skintel saw Skywalker's determination, for five Electro Whips were needed to reduce him. Despite Dooku and half her kingdom demanding his death, Skintel had Skywalker brought to her quarters. There he woke up and interrogated Skintel about his friend's whereabouts while he throttled the queen with the force. However, Skintel gasped that her friends would die unless he obeyed her, and Skywalker was forced to comply and become her bodyguard and escort as she became infatuated by him. A few days later, Dooku would arrive, and Skywalker observed that she too was a slave to the Count before she left to receive the Sith Lord. With the help of R2-D2, he escaped his guards and freed Tano from her cage and sent her to prep the ship, while he interrogated Skintel to tell him Kenobi and Rex's location. However, he found himself before Atai Molek, who betrayed Skintel and Dooku, with whom Skywalker futilely dueled before Dooku blamed him of killing Skintel before her guards. Skywalker then took Skintel and escaped to the Takora, aboard which she told him Kenobi was in the Kadavo system. System, and that she, just like Skywalker, was a slave before dying. After contacting Plo Koon to send reinforcements, Skywalker and Tano soon reached Kadavo and entered the slave processing facility. During the battle that ensued, Skywalker disabled the turrets that were attacking Koon and his forces, while Tano saved the Togruta colonists from falling to their deaths, as caused by Keeper Agrus, by placing Admiral Barton Coburn's Arquidens class light cruiser Hand of Justice underneath the facility. Along with Rex and Kenobi, Skywalker evacuated the facility before it was destroyed on Kuhn's orders, before returning to the rest of Kuhn's fleet. Palpatine Kidnapped After the capture of Moralo Ival, rumored to be the mastermind of a plot to kidnap Supreme Chancellor Palpatine, Skywalker, Tano, and Kenobi were recalled to an emergency meeting by the High Council while they walked through the nightly streets of Coruscant. 
On their way to the temple, however, a sniper opened fire at them, which prompted the three Jedi to chase their aggressor. However, the sniper killed Kenobi before escaping on a speeder, prompting Skywalker to return to his master to find Tano crying and his master dead, whom he called several times trying to get him to respond. Becoming withdrawn and grim, Skywalker would not say a word since then, until after the funeral held to honor Kenobi, when he went on a self-imposed mission to locate his murderer, Rako Hardeen, at Troopings. Though Skywalker would rather kill him, he arrested Hardeen and ferried him to the Republic Detention Center. After hearing that Hardeen had escaped from jail, Skywalker would hold a meeting with his friend Palpatine when Windu informed the Chancellor that they would remove the bounty on Hardeen and the two other escapees, Eval and Cad Bane, a decision that did not sit well with Skywalker. Palpatine suggested that the Council perhaps did not trust him to control his feelings, and Skywalker felt the Council was doing nothing to catch the murderer of his master, his best friend. Exploiting this to his advantage, Palpatine told him not to deny his feelings, for they were what made him special, and deliberately sent Skywalker and Tano to Nal Hutta. There, the two Jedi harshly interrogated locals for information, which led them to Arandia, the fugitive's last known location. After spotting their quarry as they prepared to leave, Skywalker rammed their ship into submission and board it mid-flight, but was foiled by Bane and a subsequent crash landing of both parties resulting from the chase. Surrounded by smoke, Hardeen left the ship and Skywalker confronted him, ready to kill Hardeen when Bane interrupted him. Hardeen intervened and wrestled with Skywalker, whispering into Skywalker's ear, Anakin, don't follow me. As he felt a connection, Skywalker passed out, only for Tano to protect him for Bane's attempts to execute him. As they returned to Coruscant, Yoda summoned Skywalker to his chambers and revealed the truth to him, that Kenobi was Rako Hardeen. Afterwards, Skywalker was briefed along with his Padawan about the security plans the Council had for the Chancellor during the Festival of Light on Naboo. Skywalker, Tano, and Windu would escort Palpatine and Mas Amedha to Theed, where Skywalker was greeted by his wife. At the festival itself, the abduction was initially successful, with Cad Bane and Morello Eval ferrying Palpatine away, while Skywalker and Windu captured Ambo and Twazi. However, Kenobi stopped Eval and Bane, long enough for Windu and Skywalker to arrive and take the two into custody. As he reunited with his old master, he voiced his resentment for the Council's lack of trust in him as well as Kenobi's decision to hide the truth. Wondering how many other lies he had been told by the Council, he set out on his own to bodyguard Palpatine, who continued to place seeds of doubt in Skywalker until they were greeted by Dooku. After destroying two of his Magna Guards, Skywalker dueled the Count with ferocity until Kenobi arrived to help him rescue the Chancellor whereas Dooku fled. A Phantom Menace some time later, when Skywalker and Tano were on their way to rendezvous with the cruiser, they decided to land at the Stobar spaceport, as Skywalker was hungry and tired of government rations. The two walked into Plop Dribbles only to find police droids and an unconscious waitress. Though they attempted to investigate the assault, both the police and its owner, Lubo, told them not to worry. Instead, he offered them a free meal. However, Skywalker sensed a disturbance in the Force, something sinister and familiar, which, unbeknownst to him, heralded the return of the now-renegade Sith Lord Maul. Onderon Rebellion Following a plea made by a rebel cell in Onderon, the Jedi Council considered how to help them fight the Separatists. Skywalker suggested training the rebels in subversive combat tactics, though it verged on terrorism which the Jedi would not support. The High Council decided to send advisors to the Rebel Cell for the upcoming battle. On the new class transport Valkyrie 2929, Skywalker, Tano, Rex, and Kenobi reached the planet during the night, where they met Stila Guerrera and were guided to their Rebel secret base, where they met her brother, Saw. The team trained the Rebels to combat droids until Separatist probe droids discovered their outpost and attacked, which prompted the Cell to enter Aziz. After some successful operations, Skywalker, Kenobi, and Rex decided to return to Coruscant and report to the Council, while Tano stayed behind as a liaison to the Rebels, without revealing herself as a Jedi. They kept in frequent communication with her to provide guidance, but also to provide help by hiring Hondo Onaka to deliver missile launchers to the Onderon Rebels for the final assault. Skywalker attended the funeral service for Stila Guerrera. Skywalker lent the Twilight to Kenobi, who used it to travel to Mandalore to rescue Satine Kryze. With all of its technical problems, after landing on Mandalore, Kenobi vowed not to borrow another ship from Skywalker. However, as he escaped, the ship was shot down by Mandalorian commandos and destroyed, moments before Kryze was murdered by Maul during the Mandalorian Civil War. Skywalker was later present when the Jedi Council sent Mieber Gascon and a team of Republic droids to steal an encryption module from the Separatists. Later, Skywalker participated in the Republic Strategy Conference on the space station Valor, while on the station, he noticed the Renown was going a little too fast. Tarkin told Skywalker that they're scanning Rhydonium on the ship, and Skywalker instantly realized it was a bomb. 
Skywalker was later contacted and informed by Gascon of R2's sacrifice. However, Skywalker refused to believe that his friend was gone. He sent out salvage teams to scour the wreckage who retrieved R2's remains and repaired him. The two reunited, Anakin was happy to have him back. Maul's Return Skywalker was later present when the Jedi High Council met up with the Chancellor to discuss Maul's return, during which they decided to leave him alone even though they knew he was still alive. Final Lessons Sometime later, Skywalker was sparring with Tano when Master Yoda entered to spar with her. He watched on as Tano was defeated by Yoda but managed to progress as Yoda taught her some skills. Tano's Trial During the defense of Kato Nemoidia, Skywalker and Tano engaged Separatist forces on their Eta II Actus-class interceptors until they received an urgent mission recalling them back to the Jedi Temple. Its hangar had been bombed, and as the two had been off-world during the attack, Skywalker and Tano were to lead the investigation to uncover the criminal, likely to be a Jedi. They went to the crime scene where they met Russo ISC, whom Skywalker sent alongside Tano to interview the witnesses, whereas he mediated at the hangar. Unable to discover anything, he met up with Tano who told him about their missing suspect, Jakar Bomani, a clue which in turn led to his wife, Leta Thurmond, who under pressure admitted defeating Bomani with nanodroids, but would not reveal her motives. Skywalker was present at Yoda's eulogy for the six Jedi who died during the explosion, and later took the opportunity to speak with Tarkin. Skywalker and his Padawan were then summoned to the War Room to be briefed about a Separatist attack on Seleucami. When Tarkin informed them that Termond had requested to speak with Tano, when she was framed with Termond's death and imprisoned, he was forbidden to see her, and only returned to track her down on her escape following Tano into the pipelines. Alone, they revealed that their trust in each other was absolute, but as Skywalker pleaded for her to surrender herself and make her case to the Council, she refused to take the blame for something she had not done, and asked Skywalker to trust her, just as she jumped onto a passing ship, thus escaping to the Coruscant underworld. As Tarkin declared she was being accused of sedition, Yoda assigned Skywalker and Plo Koon to search for Tano, with some resistance from Windu, who did not believe Skywalker to be emotionally detached enough to do what had to be done. Nevertheless, when she was captured, Skywalker escorted her to the temple, where he was later summoned to the Chamber of Judgment along with his Padawan. He was outraged to learn that the Council had already made their decision and that the meeting was simply a formality, and they proceeded to expel her from the Order. Resentful of the Council, he asked his wife Amidala to defend Tano at her trial before leaving to capture Ventress himself. Skywalker soon found and interrogated Ventress, who admitted she was about to turn in Tano to the authorities, until she realized that Tano had been abandoned by Skywalker and the Jedi Order, just like she had been forsaken by Dooku. She also said that whoever had attacked Tano had stolen her lightsabers, and that Tano had contacted Barriss Afi for help. Promising to kill Ventress if she lied, Skywalker left for the temple, where he went to Afi's quarters and questioned her, only to engage her in a duel. After subduing her, Skywalker brought Afi to the Republic military base where Tano was being judged. As the Miryalan Padawan confessed, all charges against Tano were lifted. Back at the temple, Skywalker and the Council apologized to Tano and invited her back into the Order, with Skywalker offering her severed Padawan braid. However, Tano apologized, leaving him in possession of her braid and declined the offer. As she left the temple, Skywalker followed her and asked her to reconsider. Tano, however, declared that she felt she could not stay with the Order due to their lack of trust in her. Despite Skywalker's heartfelt protests and his mentioning that he himself had considered leaving the Order before, she chose to walk away. Tano's departure had a deep impact on Skywalker, leaving him feeling more alone than ever in bearing the expectations of being the prophesied chosen one. These circumstances surrounding her departure also served to intensify his frustration with the High Council, as he felt they had betrayed her by not backing her innocence. Without Tano as the counterbalance to his concerns and passions, Skywalker's attentions also focused ever more upon Amidala. Kamino Conspiracy a short time after Tano left the Jedi Order, Skywalker, alongside Jedi Generals Tiplar and Tip Lee, and the 501st were sent to take control of Ringo Vinda's planet-wide station back from Admiral Trench. Only after seven rotations of stalemated combat did they manage to push Trench's forces to a breaking point. However, one of Skywalker's troopers, Tup, intentionally killed General Tiplar, forcing Skywalker to order his and Tip Lee's troops to follow back. He then had Tup checked out to see if he'd been brainwashed by the Separatists, only to find nothing in him, even as he repeated non-stop, good soldiers follow orders, as well as apparent amnesia. Though he did not find anything in him, Skywalker had Tup sent to Kamino for further examination. After Tup's shuttle was destroyed and he was taken prisoner by Trench, Skywalker investigated the wreckage. Seeing that Tup was not among the dead, Skywalker decided to infiltrate the Separatist lines. 
Alongside Rex and Fives, Skywalker reached the Separatist hangar and saw that Commander Kraken had Tup aboard his shuttle. Skywalker and the others boarded the shuttle and took out Kraken's crew, including Kraken himself, who refused to reveal why they had abducted Tup. Skywalker then had Tup transported to Kamina with Fives and Rex as escorts. Following the end of Skywalker and the 501st Legion's participation on Ringo Vinda and the death of Tup, Skywalker and the High Council were informed by Shock T that Fives attempted to kill the Chancellor. Windu, aware that the Jedi were not requested to participate in the manhunt, allowed Skywalker and Rex to secretly search for the clone. They were soon contacted by Kix, who told them that Five wanted to meet the two of them at a warehouse in level 1325. As Anakin and Rex entered the warehouse, they dropped their weapons on Fives' request. After doing so, they were encircled with a ray shield, which prompted Skywalker to question Fives' actions, but he and Rex listened to the fugitive side of the story. Skywalker refused to believe that the Chancellor was involved in this conspiracy about the inhibitor chips, but their conversation was cut short by the arrival of the Coruscant Guard. Skywalker watched as they gunned Fives down, dying in Rex's arms. He would report the event to Yoda, Windu, T, and the Chancellor, who was swift to lie to the Jedi that they had been the product of a parasite from Ringo Vinda, one that had caused the decay of Fives and Tups' chips. Palpatine urged the Jedi to leave the matter behind, for each day they grew closer and closer to victory. From that point onward, Skywalker was faced with the fact that Tup and Fives, two of his best men, had died under mysterious circumstances, which became another weight on his emotional health. Mission to Batu. Skywalker was told by Senator Amidala that one of her former handmaidens, Duja, had found something near Batu, and that she and Skywalker should investigate. Unfortunately, Skywalker was unable to join her due to being sent to battle. Skywalker allowed her to travel to Batu by herself. Upon his return to Coruscant after the battle, Skywalker could find records of Amidala's travels in the Outer Rim. After another battle, Skywalker received a message that Amidala's ship was found on Batu. Skywalker, along with R2-D2, took his interceptor to Batu. En route, Skywalker encountered a freighter. Skywalker spoke with the freighter's captain, Chiss Defense Fleet Commander Mithra Nurodu, simply known as Thrawn. Unbeknownst to Skywalker, Thrawn was actually a senior captain. Skywalker accepted Thrawn's assistance in finding Amidala and Duja. Skywalker found Amidala's ship near Batuu's Black Spire outpost. There, he stopped a group of smugglers who were angry about the ship being their landing spot. Skywalker fought them until Thrawn broke up the fight. Together, they investigated Amidala's ship and learned about Duja's ship, Nomad 4. The two then went to a nearby cantina. After speaking with the bartender, Skywalker and Thrawn came under assault by four assailants. The two of them were able to kill the assailants. Thrawn suspected the assailants were sent to kill Skywalker and that there was a fifth nearby. Skywalker and Thrawn came up with a plan to capture the last assailant. After Skywalker took one of the assailant's bodies, he pretended to suffer engine damage in his interceptor. After landing, Skywalker came under attack by an assassin droid but was able to destroy it. Thrawn was able to capture the assailant and found his freighter, which belonged to the Separatists. Mission to Mokivja Skywalker and Thrawn took out the droids guarding the freighter. Together, they found that the freighter was heading to Surmao. As they returned to Black Spire, they came under attack by several thugs. Thrawn was unable to use their speeder to capture the thugs. Skywalker and Thrawn questioned the cargo inspector Oenti, who revealed that the cantina's bartender, Janet, had ties to the Separatist Duke Solha. They learned that they were shipping supplies to a droid factory. After learning of Duja's death, Skywalker told Thrawn about the politics behind the Clone Wars. Skywalker and Thrawn traveled to Mokibja, where they discovered that the Separatists were mining Cortosis and discovered a factory. Following Skywalker's and Thrawn's location of the factory, and later their change of clothing, Skywalker contacted the Duke to infiltrate the factory and informed him that Captain Barakliff was indisposed and that there was trouble at Black Spire and that he and the others were losing. The Serenian was shocked when he heard this news and asked if the Separatist captain and his companions were dead, to which Skywalker replied that he did not know as he was not there at the end of the battle. The Jedi Knight offered the Separatists to bring the cargo he had lost to his factory. Solha accepted and told him that he'd open the shield when he was on the coordinates of the courtyard, that he was not stupid and he would not open it until it was truly necessary, just when he was in position to land. Following their arrival, the Jedi Knight and the Chiss Commander were hailed by the Serenian Duke, escorted by a pair of B-2 series super battle droids and two series of B-1 series battle droids, who inquired their possession of an astromech droid that belonged to the Republic, R2-D2. In response, the Jedi explained that they had found the droid and believed it would be worth something if he desired to purchase it. The Chiss Commander and the Jedi Knight asked the Serenian what happened to Amidala's former handmaiden, Duja. 
They also told him how they acquired Barakliff's ship, the Larker, and that they came to Mokibja because they had a present hyperspace course on the ship. The Serenian asked who had put it on that course, to which they replied they assumed the Separatist captain did. The Duke then warned the pair that they did not have anything else to bargain with and that he could have them shot. However, the pair told them that there was another preset hyperspace course locked below the current one, which was locked by a two-stage encryption passcode, and that each of them had one half. Skywalker then presented his Chiss companion as Bricks. The Serenian ordered all of his droids to lower their weapons and to escort them while they entered the factory. The lights went off while the group was entering the building and the Jedi sliced a droid squad and threw his lightsaber to the top of the building so the Duke would not be aware that Skywalker was in fact a Jedi. The two B2s blocked the courtyard's opening to prevent any escape. Solha knew there was a Jedi loose on the factory, however he didn't know who Skywalker was. He then sent Thrawn and Skywalker to some improvised prison cells. Calling the Jedi a thief, the Serenian aimed at Skywalker from the corridor in front of his cell with his blaster, and said that the Jedi wanted to be here, and that he got here thanks to Skywalker, and for that alone, he should be shot. He then revealed that he was the Duke Solha of the free system of Sereno, to which the Jedi Knight replied if he should be impressed. Solha said he should be, and that he would be at some point. One B2 series super battle droid took all of their weapons and communications devices, even taking Thrawn's small holdout blaster located in his boot. Solha and the droids left with R2, who was dropping oil so Skywalker knew where they had taken him. They left the room and locked the cell's doors. The pair agreed on running a test, which would discover if Skywalker's wife had been captured, if she was free or was not on the factory by waiting two hours as Amidala, and if she did not join them on the detention block, they would break out and try to locate her. Thrawn asked the Jedi if he recognized the ship in the courtyard, telling him it was an ore carrier, which was full of ore, so this was not a staging ground but a manufacturing facility. He also told Skywalker where there was more activity and where there was less, as Chiss could see more infrared than humans and he noticed the heat signatures, and that where they were was in the most active section. Following the completion of Thrawn and Skywalker's test, the Chiss crafted a cord from the clothing he got from the Larker and unlocked their cells from the inside. Meanwhile, the Senator had entered the building and was accompanied by a group of locals, consisting of maintenance workers from the factory, Simi, Huga, and Lebjow. They had entered the factory through the service level, which was usually unprotected, and only they and the Separatists knew of it. Amidala had promised the group a fortune, which would later be given to them by her uncle Anakin if they helped her access the factory. The group later arrived at the detention block, defeated the droid guards, and found the Chiss and Jedi Knight inside. After the Chiss was presented to the newcomers by Skywalker, the group created a plan to retrieve Skywalker's lightsaber, which involved Thrawn and the Senator going to the roof alone to retrieve it. The Jedi was scared of her going alone with the Chiss, but accepted it. After the Chiss and the Senator left, the Jedi began to wander across the facility and found a section of the factory that produced Cortosis B2 super battle droids, which was guarded by the Duke and his relatives and some droid sentries. The Serenians were protecting themselves with clone trooper armor covered with Cortosis. Skywalker tried to confuse Solha's droids, but he only achieved making the Serenians aware of his presence. Skywalker then left the room and began his search for the Senator once again. On the roof of the building, Amidala and Thrawn retrieved Skywalker's lightsaber. They also witnessed some spheres which descended onto the factory, which were part of a Chiss mission to retrieve a deflector shield generator from the factory. The Senator asked the Chiss commander to continue helping them, but he insisted that his mission came first. Meanwhile, the Jedi, disarmed, used the Force to see where Solha and his droid sentries were, so he did not have to fight them while he traveled across the maze of rooms and corridors that the factory contained. He then met with his wife, who gave him his lightsaber and told him that Thrawn had abandoned them. Their meeting also coincided with the Chiss Ascendancy's raid on the factory retrieving the shield generator. Skywalker fought several B2s and discovered that their armor disabled lightsabers and deflected blaster bolts. However, he used the force and disabled them. In the meantime, Amidala evacuated the workers with Lebjow before the factory was destroyed. Thrawn joined the Senators and the Jedi Knight, who revealed that the ore was Cortosis, and that it deflected blaster bolts and disabled lightsabers thanks to its large energy absorption rate. They learned that the ore was mined in the river next to the factory and strengthened the battle droid's armor, making them invulnerable, something that could change the Clone Wars forever. Thrawn then agreed to destroy the factory after the Chiss retrieved the shield generator. Amidala encountered the Duke, who wore clone trooper armor covered with cortosis, which protected him from the lightsaber. 
He then told her that by using the factory, he was going to build his name in the Confederacy. As he knew Skywalker and the Senator, he rejected Amidala's ultimatum to surrender and told her that he had no doubts that he'd live and that he'd never surrender. In another section of the factory, the Jedi and Chiss learned that the Separatists were also producing clone trooper armor covered with cortosis. The Jedi thought that they were planning to infiltrate the Republic by sending Serenian troopers wearing clone trooper armor to Coruscant. After the battle droids protecting the room were defeated by Skywalker and Thrawn and the Serenian Duke by the Senator, knocking him out with her grappling hook, they left the facility and then destroyed the factory. Skywalker decided to destroy the mine too, so the Separatists could not start again on Mokibja, although Amidala, Thrawn, and Lebjow asked him not to do it, he ignored their petition and destroyed the mine as well, which gained him the anger and devastation of the already devastated Mokibja, as it caused massive explosion expanded by the Cortosis. Aftermath of Mokibja the mission ended with a catastrophe for Mokija and an end to Solha's career. In an attempt to collapse the Separatists' efforts to produce Cortosis battle droids, Skywalker accidentally sent lava, ash, and smoke into the planet's best cropland and water. Skywalker did not know the Cortosis in the mine would redirect the heat of the explosions. The heat was sent down into the planet's crust, activating volcanic activity and leading to widespread devastation, deforestation, and desertification on Mokija resulting in the explosive force doing more than merely collapsing the mine's tunnels. The catastrophe forced Lebjow to move to another planet, as the population knew he had collaborated with the ones who devastated his planet. Thrawn had warned Amidala that Skywalker's plan seemed reckless, yet she had known that he'd be unable to be talked out of it, leaving the Jedi and Senator to regret their actions as they looked upon the ruined world. Thrawn had also warned Skywalker that his theory about the clone armor being used to infiltrate the Republic seemed unlikely based on how great the risk of discovery would be. Despite Skywalker's short-sighted plan, Thrawn continued to respect the man and still viewed him as an effective warrior. Clovis Returns Upon his wife's mission to Scipio and subsequent re-encounter with Rush Clovis, when she was accused of sabotage and her aide Tekla Mina was killed, Skywalker was sent to protect Amidala, but was upset to hear that Clovis was involved. Nevertheless, he agreed to help her, and together they went to Clovis's residence to assist in exposing the banking clan's corruption. As they were about to depart along with Clovis, Skywalker defended both senators from the bounty hunter Embo and his Pantanuba Merak. The trio were able to escape Embo thanks to R2-D2 and made their way to Coruscant. Escorted by Yoda, they met with Palpatine and other members of the Jedi Council, and Senator Bail Organa, during which Skywalker's animosity towards Clovis was perceived by Yoda. As Amidala was appointed by the Chancellor to work closely alongside Clovis to investigate the banking clan, Skywalker questioned her decision, as he wanted her away from Clovis, who he greatly distrusted. Though he demanded that she step away from her assignment, she refused and left with Clovis. Frustrated, Skywalker went to his quarters, where Kenobi, at the behest of Yoda, spoke to him, revealing that he was well aware of Skywalker's feelings for Amidala, and asked his former apprentice not to let himself get carried away before leaving. Later that night, Skywalker went to his wife's apartment, where he found Clovis about to kiss her for which Skywalker briefly force choked him before giving him a one-sided beatdown despite Amidala's protests, willing to kill Clovis in his jealousy. Before it was too late, he realized his mistake and stopped, only for Captain Typho to enter. Much to his surprise, Clovis lied about the attack. As they carried Clovis to Amidala's bedroom, Skywalker tried to apologize to his wife, but she told him to stay away from her. Only when they were alone afterward, she questioned their marriage, too steeped in lies and deception, and decided that they would take a break from one another after admitting to not feeling safe around Skywalker, who, in turn, admitted to being unable to control himself, even though he did not know why. Clovis was accepted as the new head of the banking clan by the Senate, and Skywalker confided to the Chancellor of his distrust in Clovis, which Palpatine shared. Soon, when Clovis apparently joined the Separatists the day after, which Skywalker found strange, and Scipio was occupied by Separatists, Skywalker was then sent to retake Scipio. After landing, Skywalker went to Clovis' office and tried to reason with him to make him let go of Amidala. At that moment though, a vulture droid crashed into the office making it unstable and causing Amidala and Clovis to fall, but Skywalker grabbed them both, each with one hand. As he could not hold the two, Clovis told Skywalker to let go of him, but he would not. Clovis apologized to Amidala and then let go of Skywalker, falling to his death. Though Skywalker and Amidala reconciled, the banking clan came under the control of the Chancellor. Sifo Diaz's Secret after Jedi Master Plo Koon intercepted a distress call from a lost shuttle and discovered Sifo Diaz's lightsaber, its late owner being responsible for the secret creation of the clone army. 
Relaunching the investigation on Sifo Diaz's death, Skywalker and Kenobi were sent to Felucia, where they spoke to the tribal leaders to find out what happened to the late Jedi Master. Kenobi was told that the Felucians had cremated his body and that another Jedi had been with him when he was killed, and they reported their findings to Master Yoda. The two were then sent to Obadia when former Chancellor Finnis Valorum told Yoda that Sifo Diaz had been sent to negotiate with the Pike Syndicate to stop an underground war. Valorum, however, said that there was no Jedi sent alongside Sifo Diaz, but rather his personal aide, Silman. On Obadia, Kenobi and Skywalker met Lom Pike, who denied any involvement until Kenobi noticed that he was wearing the crest of Valorum, and Skywalker grabbed the necktie and told Pike to stop playing games. Lom finally complied with the Jedi and told them that he had been paid by a man called Tyrannus to shoot Sifo Diaz's shuttle down. However, as they feared that anyone who paid for the death of a Jedi was dangerous, they kept Silman locked away for 10 years as insurance. Once they met Silman, they realized that he had gone mad after being locked up for so long, and they were unable to learn much from him before Dooku arrived to kill him, before Skywalker and Kenobi's eyes. After engaging Dooku in combat, they learned that the man called Tyrannus was, in fact, the Count. Although Skywalker pursued the Count after he tried to escape on a Coruscant freighter, Dooku escaped aboard his solar sailor, leaving the Jedi without the chance to learn more about the clone army. Nevertheless, having learned the identity of Tyrannus, they informed the Council of their findings, only for them to question why Dooku had been behind the creation of the clone army, and what game the yet unidentified Dark Lord of the Sith was playing. Yoda's Journey Upon Yoda's brief contact with Qui-Gon Jinn, Yoda requested that Skywalker meet him on the temple's training grounds to speak about their experience on Mortis, where both he and Kenobi had spoken to Jinn. As Skywalker too was in disbelief of the idea that an individual could retain its identity after death, Yoda left him to rest. Later, when Yoda submitted himself for medical examination by Rig Nima, Skywalker informed them that Chancellor Palpatine wanted to hold an emergency meeting with Yoda, to which Windu responded, leaving the Grand Master free to undergo a deprivation ritual. Skywalker, Mundi, Kenobi, Kun, and Nima watched over the Old Master until Kenobi interrupted it before it was too late, and Yoda claimed to have spoken with the dead. With the Council worried for his health, Yoda was placed under the surveillance of guards, so the Jedi Master asked Skywalker to see him. Yoda asked Skywalker to help him escape, which Skywalker did. Accompanying Yoda to his fighter, Skywalker even lent R2-D2 to Yoda to accompany him on a journey that would take him to Dagobah, a mysterious planet and moribund, to learn that the Jedi Order would not win the war and that there was another Skywalker. Bombing of the Temple Skywalker and R2-D2 were in the Jedi Temple prior to it being bombed by Separatist Captain Rackham Seer. The bomber was foiled by Depa Bilaba and Caleb Doom. Amidala's Departure Prior to a mission that Amidala was taking to Clabron, Skywalker insisted that he be allowed to assist her, under the impression that it was a diplomatic mission to Duro. After assurance from Amidala, Skywalker agreed to remain on Coruscant, kissing Amidala. He was startled when he realized Amidala's handmaiden, Moti, had witnessed their display of affection, though Amidala assured Skywalker that she understood discretion. Crystal Crisis on Utapau during the last months of the war, Kenobi and Skywalker were sent to Utapau to investigate the mysterious death of Jedi Master Tu'an. Once they landed on Pau City, Inspector Jen Jun led them to see the corpse at the morgue. After examining the body, they went over to the place where she had been found, only to determine that she'd been hit in the optic nerve with a precision laser dart by a sniper. As they found the sniper's position from the building's owner, Gari, the two Jedi learned of the involvement of Magna Guards and began to suspect the involvement of General Grievous, and had Inspector June analyze some slimy substance they had found, the secretion of an Amani's skin. Though Governor Toro Blom asked them to leave Utapau, Skywalker and Kenobi persevered and rented two Dactylians to go talk to the leader of an Amani tribe who revealed that an Amani outcast had entered one of the caves. The two Jedi entered it to find Magna Guards. Despite some resistance, they managed to have the droids reveal the involvement of the Sugi and went to see Inspector June again. Soon after, the two attended the funeral for Tu An. As they reached the Amani settlement that they'd been looking for, the Amani scattered, leaving Skywalker and Kenobi to follow the tracks of one that appeared to be their leader. During the hunt, Skywalker mentioned Tano for the first time since her departure, and Kenobi asked if he wanted to talk about it. Yet Skywalker refused. Kenobi then suggested that they set up camp and rest. However, he insisted on the subject, prompting Skywalker to tell Kenobi he missed Tano and to voice his anger at the High Council for turning its back on her. To Skywalker's annoyance, Kenobi stood by the Council's authority, asserting that it had been Tano's decision to leave, and that she had allowed her emotions to cloud her judgment, something against the Jedi way. 
Then Kenobi suggested he rest, but Skywalker declined so that he could keep the first watch. Finally, he questioned Kenobi on what would happen if he had turned out to be a major disappointment, but Kenobi wanted to believe it would never happen. However, they both fell asleep and were captured by a group of Sugis led by Chong, who brought them before Endente as Kenobi told Chong of their intention to buy weapons. They learned Endente was in fact selling a kyber crystal and Skywalker prompted him to show it before they made the deal. Brought to the starship where the crystal was being kept, they escaped from their captors and Skywalker eliminated all the Sugi, except for Endente who fled. After they discovered the massive kyber crystal inside of the ship, the two Jedi managed to transport the crystal through Utapau's planes until they reached Pau City, where Blom had the two Jedi surrounded with his men and Grievous's droids. As the kyber crystal was loaded into a shuttle and sent to a ship on orbit, Kenobi and Skywalker stole a freighter to recover the crystal. During the persecution, Grievous damaged their ship, forcing them to perform a number 5 special. They crashed it to disable the hyperdrive and with their escape pods boarded the ship where the crystal was held. As they became separated, Kenobi was captured by Grievous and Skywalker recovered his lightsaber, located the crystal, and freed Kenobi. Together they made their way to the kyber crystal at the vault, where they were temporarily trapped until a squad discovered them. Using the crystal and the force to knock them out, he managed to get to the hangar, where Skywalker stole a shuttle to escape. Meanwhile, Kenobi sent several AATs to shoot and overload the crystal, destroying the crystal and the ship while they escaped from the explosion in the nick of time and returned to Coruscant to report to the Council. Stationed on Coruscant Some time later, while on a Venator-class Star Destroyer, Skywalker discovered an unknown ship, the Silver Angel, in military airspace. Skywalker then asked Admiral Yolaren who was on that transport. After he closed his eyes and sensed Ahsoka Tano's presence through the Force, he decided not to send a detachment to arrest the crew and let Ahsoka and her companions leave. Voss and Ventress Jedi Master Quinlan Voss had been tasked by the Jedi Council to assassinate Dooku with the help of Asajj Ventress, but during a mission to Raxus Secundus, the Jedi turned to the dark side due to Dooku's manipulations and Ventress's training. Ventress staged a rescue mission which failed and prompted her to contact the Jedi Council. When she arrived at the Jedi Temple, Skywalker and Kenobi escorted her to the Council Chamber, where despite Mace Windu's open disapproval, Yoda dispatched Skywalker and Kenobi to go with Ventress to rescue Voss above Taurus. Soon enough, Kenobi, Skywalker, and Ventress were on the cockpit of her ship, the Banshee, to infiltrate the Separatist Dreadnought from which Voss, or rather Admiral Enigma, was issuing orders. Stealthily, the three boarded the ship and made their way to the bridge, where they found Dooku instead of Voss. Skywalker then engaged in a duel with the Count, distracting him while Kenobi and Ventress discovered a captive Voss. Though she knew Voss was consumed by hatred, they escaped to the Banshee, and Skywalker joined with them to escape the enemy ship. Back in the Jedi Temple, Skywalker saw as the Council welcomed Voss and pardoned Ventress. That same night, Skywalker reunited with his wife, Amidala, for a moment of respite, during which Skywalker told her of the ordeal. After which, Amidala conferred that perhaps Ventress's love could be Voss's way back from the dark side, leaving Skywalker at a loss for words. A month later, Skywalker was sent alongside Kenobi, Voss, and Akar Deshu in a mission to take over a Separatist supply storage base and redistribute the supplies to the worlds in need of them. However, their mission went awry when Voss, unbeknownst to them, arranged the base's destruction. After another failed mission to Voss's name, he was suspected of treason. Skywalker and Kenobi were sent to spy on Voss and Ventress as they were deployed to assassinate Dooku during the Second Battle of Christophsis. When they saw Voss attempt to force the Count to lead him to his master, Darth Sidious, rather than kill him, Skywalker and Kenobi intervened, taking the pair by surprise and arresting them. However, Voss and Dooku soon escaped from the Vigilance, causing the death of Akar Deshu and Cav Bayons, and boarded Ventress's ship, Banshee, to escape Christophsis. Skywalker had the Banshee fired on, forcing the Renegades to land on the planet below. He and Kenobi pursued the three injured fugitives to a Separatist-controlled tower, where they surrounded them. There, Skywalker and Kenobi witnessed Ventress's last moments, sacrificing herself to save Voss from Dooku's fatal Force Lightning. After her death, Skywalker and Kenobi were joined by the redeemed Voss, and they tried to capture Dooku, but to no avail. And they then transported Ventress's body and Voss to Coruscant, where the fallen Jedi confessed his crimes and Kenobi defended Ventress. Anaxes. Following an assault on Cato Nemoidia, Skywalker was dispatched alongside Windu to participate in the Battle of Anaxis to defend the Republic shipyards on the planet. With mounting losses on the Republic side, Captain Rex told Skywalker and Windu his theory that the Separatists had learned his own strategy. Considering this possibility, Windu sent Rex and Commander Cody to take a squad and Clone Force 99 behind enemy lines to infiltrate a Separatist cyber center, while he and Skywalker held the line. 
The general staff was told about the possibility of sending a mission to Skako Minor, and Skywalker was sure the Jedi High Council would approve it. Clone Sergeant Hunter then stated the Bad Batch would go with them. Although Rex was eager to get going, Skywalker informed him that they had a thing to do, and although Rex felt that they did not have time, they both went to the barracks. Rex remained outside on watch, while Skywalker, holding Rex's helmet, went in and contacted Amidala. Skywalker apologized for being away for so long, but as the two spoke, Obi-Wan Kenobi approached Rex. The clone captain knocked on the door to speed up Skywalker. Skywalker confided that he was worried about his captain, worrying that Rex was letting his personal feelings drive him too much on the mission, although Amidala believed Rex had learned that trait from him. Outside, Rex tried to lie about what Skywalker was doing. However, Skywalker and her ended their conversation, and both went on their way to Skako, although Kenobi revealed that he knew that he'd been talking to Amidala. As they reached Skako Minor on the Marauder, Skywalker was captured by the Politech on their Kiradax, prompting Rex and the Bad Batch to follow them to the village and rescue the Jedi General. They apologized and explained the situation, and the Chief helped them reach Perkol, which they infiltrated with some effort. When they reached the antechamber, Foreman Watt Tambor sent a transmission saying they had violated the Techno Union's neutrality and sent droid reinforcements. While Skywalker, Hunter, Wrecker, and Crosshair destroyed them, Rex and Tech found Echo, alive but as a cyborg. Tech managed to unplug Echo and they escaped to the ventilation system before being vaporized by Tambor's decimator, after which Wrecker destroyed the foreman's main computers with explosives. As they escaped, however, they were surrounded by his D1 series aerial battle droids, but thanks to Tech, they rode Kiradax to the Polytech village. There, they convinced the natives to help them against the Techno Union's forces, including their Octopatara tri-droids, with Skywalker effectively destroying two of them. Following the skirmish, Skywalker, Rex, and Clone Force 99 returned to Fort Anaxes, where Windu and Kenobi were to take the Separatist Assembly complex by air, whereas Echo was to be escorted by the Bad Batch, Skywalker, and Rex into Trench's communications vault on a dreadnought on the planet's orbit, where he would plug himself into the dreadnought to feed the Separatist strategic movements. When Echo did so and deactivated the droids attacking the assembly complex, he realized that Trench had initiated a countdown for an explosion that could destroy most of Anaxis. While Kenobi assisted in the evacuation efforts and Windu deactivated the bomb, Skywalker went to the Dreadnought's bridge to confront Trench, destroying his droid bodyguards. Trench refused to give the final sequence number, believing that Skywalker would not harm him. Skywalker amputated Trench's prosthetic attachments, prompting the hearts to immediately give in. After relaying it to Windu, who deactivated the bomb, Trench then tried to electrocute him. In response, Anakin thrust his lightsaber through his chest, killing him. He then took the self-destruct detonator for the Dreadnought and reunited with the rest of his team. As they left aboard the Marauder, Skywalker let Wrecker destroy Trench's flagship, the Invulnerable, damaging the nearby Separatist fleet, and they went back to Fort Anaxis. Following the victory, Corporal Echo joined the Bad Batch. The Birth of Darth Vader At some point before the Battle of Coruscant, Skywalker was on Tithe and had another encounter with Dooku, yet he failed to defeat the Count. Along with the 501st and the 212th, Skywalker and Kenobi were sent to Yerbana to take down the Separatist forces on the planet. The fight caused Skywalker and Kenobi to split their respective battalions into two fronts. Skywalker, Rex, and the 501st Legion defeated the Separatist droid army on their front, so they left to assist Kenobi and his 212th Attack Battalion, which was suffering heavy casualties from the ongoing conflict. While Kenobi and Commander Cody were taking cover from the blast, Skywalker ordered his men to hide under the bridge, while R2-D2 would tell them when to launch. Next, Skywalker stepped into the fight and convinced his master to follow his plan. Skywalker faked a surrender to draw out the droid commander, who saw through the lies of the Jedi Knight. However, it was too late as Skywalker used his Force abilities to destroy the droid commander, allowing his 501st Legion led by Captain Rex to make a surprising ambush on the rest of the droid army, ending the conflict. The 212th Attack Battalion proceeded to help the 501st while Skywalker was approached by Kenobi who complimented him, which Skywalker answered by thanking Kenobi for helping him achieve victory. The two were soon contacted by Admiral Wolf Yularen, who informed them of an upcoming transmission going under the code Fulcrum. While the two Jedi thought it might have been Saw Gerrera, Yularen confirmed otherwise, saying it was necessary for the generals to attend the call themselves. The last meeting of a friendship. At Yularen's ship, Skywalker and Kenobi were surprised to see Ahsoka Tano and Bo-Katan Kryze were the ones who had made the call. 
Emotionally shocked to see his former apprentice after several months of being apart, Skywalker barely managed to control himself and proceeded to talk to Tano, who remarked that the moment was not a reunion, as Maul had been located on Mandalore and they had an opportunity to capture him. Tano had hoped Skywalker and Kenobi would be able to join forces with her to confront him. Tano, cries, and her Mandalorians boarded the ship, where they were greeted by Skywalker and Kenobi. The former tried to greet Tano, but his former apprentice turned him down, saying they had to act immediately if they wanted to capture Maul. The group went to discuss the possible attack, but Kenobi was not willing to help Tano and her allies unless the Jedi Council gave them permission, causing Skywalker to unnoticeably scowl at him. While Kenobi contacted the Council, Skywalker had Tano accompany him through the complex. Skywalker led Tano to a room full of the 501st clone troopers, including Rex, who had painted their helmets as a way to honor their former commander. Skywalker then prepared to give Tano her old lightsabers, but before he could do so, the ship's alarm suddenly went off. Kenobi rushed in and informed Skywalker and Rex that they would be jumping to hyperspace immediately. When Skywalker asked if this meant that the attack on Mandalore was approved, Kenobi revealed that they were actually heading for Coruscant, where a dire situation was happening. General Grievous had launched a full-scale attack on the capital of the Republic, and the Jedi Council lost contact with Shock T, Chancellor Palpatine's assigned protector. Skywalker was visibly uncomfortable with this news, but Kenobi assured him that their fleet would arrive at Coruscant very soon. Tano, however, was angered by her former master's decision to abandon Mandalore. Kenobi pointed out that they were entering a pivotal moment in the Clone Wars, but Tano countered that Kenobi was playing politics and that the Jedi Order had lost their way by forgetting that their duty was to help people and not politicians, which was why the people and Tano herself had lost faith in them. Skywalker heard the argument and weighed in, so as to help Tano in the upcoming siege while also taking part in the mission to rescue the Chancellor. Skywalker promoted Rex to commander so he could lead the new formation of the 501st that was dubbed as the 332nd Division, assigning Tano to assist as an advisor due to her being unable to hold an official military title. When Kenobi agreed, Tano accepted the proposal. Kenobi left the room to prepare their troops, leaving Skywalker and Tano behind. Skywalker gave Tano her new lightsabers, complimenting them as better than before. Skywalker then headed to rescue the Chancellor, believing the defeats of Maul and Grievous would mark an end to the war. While he was leaving, Tano stopped him by wishing him good luck in his mission. Happy to have been reunited with his apprentice, Skywalker smiled and they parted ways. Unbeknownst to either of them, this would be the last time they ever saw each other as friends. Confrontation on the Invisible Hand Having been away from Coruscant for months due to the Outer Rim sieges, Skywalker and his master finally returned to the planet after leaving Tano to lead the rescue of the Chancellor from General Grievous before the Cyborg's fleet could flee the besieged capital. Assisted by a squadron of ARC-170 starfighters led by Clone Commander Oddball, the two Jedi fought their way through a swarm of Vulture and Tri-Fighter droid starfighters protecting the Invisible Hand, General Grievous' flagship. Skywalker and Kenobi headed for the ship while the clones distracted the droids, but Kenobi's ship was damaged and partially disabled by buzz droids. Although Kenobi told Skywalker to abandon him and complete the mission, the younger Jedi refused and cleared his former master's ship of droids before escorting him to the Invisible Hand's hangar. After crash landing, the two Jedi disposed of the few remaining droids in the hangar while R2-D2 located the Chancellor. Once they discovered that he was being held at the top of the ship's observation spire, they concluded that they were walking into a trap when Skywalker sensed the presence of Count Dooku. Not long after they arrived at the top of the spire, the Sith Lord appeared before them and the two Jedi engaged him in a duel. Dooku managed to gain the upper hand and knocked Kenobi out, but his taunting, intended to erode Skywalker's morale, instead enraged him. Skywalker unleashed his fury on the Sith Lord, brutally overwhelming him and slicing off both his hands. Taking Dooku's lightsaber, he crossed both his and the Count's blades at the Count's throat, and Palpatine urged him to kill his helpless opponent. Skywalker initially hesitated, but after after the Chancellor's continued insistence, he gave into his hatred of his nemesis and beheaded Dooku. He expressed regret afterward, stating that it was not the Jedi way, but the Chancellor assured him that he had been right to kill the Count. Despite the Chancellor's pleas, he carried Kenobi on his back to make their escape. However, the elevators leaving the spire had been disabled. With help from R2 and the attack taking place on the Invisible Hand by a neighboring Republic cruiser, they were able to escape in the elevator shaft until the ship's crew was able to regain control of the ship, restoring its gravity 
gravity and turning the shaft once more into a well. Kenobi regained consciousness while they were hanging on inside the shaft, and together, he and Skywalker were able to escape the shaft, just as a reactivated elevator was about to crush them. However, their good fortune failed them, and they were trapped by a ray shield and apprehended, along with R2, by battle droids. The two Jedi and the Chancellor were then brought before Grievous in the Invisible Hands control room. The cyborg personally taunted them, derisively commenting on Skywalker's youth considering his reputation. Skywalker retorted with a taunt about the general being shorter than he had expected. Eventually, R2-D2 caused a distraction, allowing Kenobi to draw his lightsaber to him with the Force, freeing himself and then Skywalker. Once the younger Jedi had also summoned his weapon, they engaged and made short work of Grievous's Magna Guards and the battle droids holding them in the Chancellor. However, as they attempted to apprehend Grievous, he used one of the Magna Guards' electro staves to shatter the viewport, depressurizing the bridge and letting the vacuum take him. Skywalker and Kenobi caught onto nearby command consoles until security measures allowed the bridge to depressurize. Before they could reach him, however, Grievous escaped, jettisoning all the escape pods to prevent them from escaping. As the command crew had fled, Skywalker took control of the damaged flagship, which had begun to enter Coruscant's atmosphere. Although he briefly managed to slow the ship's descent, the damage it had sustained proved too great, and the invisible hand broke in half, picking up considerable speed as it fell towards the Republic capital. Skywalker eventually succeeded in crash landing the invisible hand on a deserted landing strip, returning the once captive Chancellor to Coruscant unharmed. Looming fatherhood. Following the ordeal, the two escorted the Chancellor back to the Senate building, where they separated. While Kenobi went back to Jedi Temple to report to the Council, Skywalker remained with the Senators, who had come to greet the returning Chancellor. He briefly spoke with Senator Organa, who expressed hope that Count Dooku's death would bring a quick end to the war. Skywalker disagreed, saying that as long as General Grievous remained as the leader of the Separatist armies, the war would continue. At that moment, he noticed Amidala behind one of the columns, took his leave from the Senator, and reunited with his wife for the first time in months. Having been away fighting in the Outer Rim sieges, Skywalker's single focus was reuniting with her. Amidala then revealed to her husband that she was pregnant. Though they were both worried that this might expose their secret, Amidala especially, Skywalker was overjoyed and told her not to worry, saying that it was the happiest moment of his life. The couple returned to Amidala's apartment, where they began to make plans for when the baby would be born, deciding that their child would be raised on Naboo in the lake country. Amidala also planned to head there before the birth to prepare the room. However, that same night, Skywalker's happiness was marred when he suffered a nightmare of his wife dying in childbirth, similar to the visions he had of his mother before her death. Although Amidala tried to comfort him that it was only a dream, he was terrified that he would lose her, as he had lost his mother. Amidala tried to convince him that they needed help and suggested that they ask Kenobi for assistance. Skywalker refused, insisting that their baby was a blessing, not a curse. The next day, at the Jedi Temple, he sought Yoda's counsel concerning these dreams, but the Grand Master told Skywalker that death was a natural part of life, and to let go of all that he was afraid to lose. Tensions of Loyalty at the same time, tensions were rising between Chancellor Palpatine and the Jedi Council, who were concerned with his increasing power. Matters were made worse when the Senate announced that they planned to grant him more executive powers in order to facilitate the end of the war. When Skywalker was informed of this by Kenobi, he was supportive of the measure, and despite the reservations of the Council and Kenobi's warning to be wary of Palpatine, he then told him that the Chancellor had requested his presence for unknown reasons, without informing the Council. So Skywalker met with Palpatine at his office, where he told him that he was appointing the young Jedi to be his personal representative on the Council, a decision that Skywalker believed the Jedi Masters would never accept. When informed of this, the Council allowed Skywalker to sit on the Council, yet they refused to grant him the position of Master, a decision which greatly angered Skywalker. Skywalker turned to his former Master and friend, Kenobi, expecting him to back him up, but he was caught between his friendship with Skywalker and his loyalty to the Council, and so remained silent. Angered more by this, Skywalker reluctantly accepted his position and took his seat on the Council. At the end of that meeting, Kenobi acknowledged to Skywalker that his appointment had been accepted so that, on behalf of the Council, he could spy on the Chancellor, which Skywalker was reluctant to do. At the Galaxy's Opera House in the Uskru District, Skywalker joined Palpatine in watching the Mon Calamari Aquatic Ballet performing Squid Lake. During the performance, the Chancellor began to stir Skywalker's distrust in the Jedi Council, deducing that they had asked Skywalker to spy on him. He claimed that the Jedi were only perceived as good because good is a point of view, stating that the Jedi and the Sith were not so different. Skywalker rebutted by saying that the Sith were selfish while the Jedi were selfless. The Chancellor then recounted the tragedy of Darth Plagueis to Skywalker, showing that not all Sith were as evil as the Jedi claimed, while also seducing the Jedi with knowledge of the power to stop death. 
Afterwards, Skywalker bid farewell to Kenobi, showing gratitude for his teachings and saying to each other, may the force be with you before parting ways. Fall to the dark side. Shortly afterwards, Anakin and Windu attended a hologram meeting with Yoda, Ki Adimundi, and Aayla Sakura. During the meeting, Cody joined and informed the group that Obi-Wan had engaged Grievous on Utapau. Windu then tasked Anakin with informing the Chancellor and to see what his reaction is in order to learn his true intentions. Skywalker informed the Chancellor of Kenobi's forces engaging Grievous's, but during the meeting, Palpatine revealed that he knew the dark side of the Force, leading Skywalker to realize that he was the Sith Lord that they'd been searching for. Palpatine told Anakin that if he turned him over to the Jedi, then he'd be unable to aid in saving his wife, Amidala, from her fated death that Anakin had been dreaming of. Despite his confusion, Skywalker was still loyal to the Jedi Order. He told his findings to Mace Windu, who went with Kit Fisto, Sacy Tin, and Agent Kolar to arrest Palpatine, leaving Skywalker Skywalker behind. After recalling Sidious's words, Skywalker headed to Palpatine's office. During the ensuing duel, Sidious killed three of the four Jedi with ease, but was disarmed by Windu just before Skywalker arrived in his office. Skywalker pleaded with Windu not to kill Sidious, saying that he should be left for the Senate to judge. But Windu felt that Sidious was too dangerous to be left alive, as he was essentially controlling the Senate. Ignoring Skywalker's words, Windu prepared to execute the Sith Lord, but a desperate Skywalker who needed Sidious alive to save Padme drew his lightsaber and severed the unsuspecting Windu's right hand, causing Windu to drop his lightsaber and allowing Sidious to send him plummeting out of a shattered window with a blast of force lightning, all of which was sensed by Tano. Though horrified that he betrayed and contributed to the death of Windu, Skywalker saw this as the final straw against the Jedi Order. As such, there was no turning back for him. Desperate to save Padme, he reluctantly betrayed the Jedi and pledged himself to service under his new Sith Master, Darth Sidious. Sidious named him Darth Vader, a title that he did not bestow lightly. After Sidious declared all Jedi enemies of the Republic, he ordered Vader to kill the Jedi at the Temple and execute the Separatist Council on the Mustafar system. Sidious then executed Order 60 Six, during which the clone troopers were forcibly brainwashed into turning on their Jedi generals and executing them on the spot, while Vader led the 501st Legion to attack the Jedi Temple. During the assault, Vader entered the council chamber and found a group of younglings trying to hide. Thinking Vader was still a Jedi Knight, one boy asked him what they should do, but the new Sith Lord slaughtered the boy and the other younglings. Similarly, as he led a force of clones further into the temple, he encountered a group of younglings who assumed he had arrived to help. Instead, however, he cut the children down down, leaving only one survivor. After Vader stabbed her and looked her in the eyes, the human youngling Reva Savander, growing to be filled with rage, survived because she played dead amongst the corpses of her classmates. Also during the battle, Vader killed Jedi Masters such as Sindralig, before meeting with Sidious, who then sent him to Mustafar. Following the attack, he went back home to Amidala and told her that the Jedi Order had tried to topple the Republic, much to her belief, and that he was about to go to the Mustafar system, where the Executive Separatist Council was, telling her that he would end the war, they kissed and he left aboard his green Eta 2 Actus class light interceptor, which replaced the interceptor he had lost in the Battle of Coruscant. On Mustafar, Vader slaughtered the entire Separatist Council, including Wat Tambor, Poggle the Lesser, and Newt Gunray, along with their aides, his eyes now yellow and red with rage. Simultaneously, Sidious carried out the proclamation of the New Order in an emergency session of the Senate, claiming that the Jedi Order had committed treason against the Republic, and reorganized the Republic into the First Galactic Empire with himself as its emperor. During this time, Vader was followed by Kakan, who believed he was a Jedi. Vader showed his face and eyes to Kakan and chased after him to ensure there would be no witness. During this chase, Vader ran into a cloud of lava fumes. The fumes caused Vader to see hallucinations of his fellow Jedi, such as Windu, Jin, Kun, Bilaba, Yoda, and his former apprentice Tano. Vader was able to push the fumes away from himself and dismiss the hallucinations. Soon, Vader reported his mission's completion to Sidious. On his orders, Vader sent a shutdown signal to the Confederate Navy and Army, effectively ending the Clone Wars. With his mission completed and the Separatists dead, Vader looked on from a balcony and shed a tear at the man he had become but knew it was too late to turn back. Duel on Mustafar Soon thereafter, Vader saw Amidala's star skiff land and ran to meet her. She told Vader that Obi-Wan had discovered their secret, and had also told her that Vader had joined the dark side, hoping that he'd prove Obi-Wan wrong. However, Vader only confirmed it to be true. Driven power-hungry by the dark side, Vader tried to convince her that they could be happy together in the new empire, stating that, given time, he could overthrow Sidious and they could rule the galaxy together. Horrified by what her husband had now become, Amidala begged him to stop and leave everything behind while they still can. But at the 
the moment, Vader saw Obi-Wan walking out of Amidala's ship due to him secretly stowing away. Convinced that this meant that his wife had betrayed him for his old master and that she brought Kenobi there to kill him, Vader force-choked Amidala until Kenobi demanded he let her go, by which point she had already fallen unconscious. Although Kenobi tried to reason with his former pupil, Vader refused to listen, as the new Empire was everything he wanted the galaxy to be. Unable to come to an understanding, and both believing themselves to be in the right, the two former friends then engaged in a fierce duel, which ripped across the Separatist facility, eventually causing it to deactivate and fall into the lava river below. The duel ended on the banks of the river, where Kenobi claimed the high ground and warned Vader not to attack. Blinded by rage and arrogance, Vader leapt to continue the duel, only to have his remaining limbs severed by his former master's blade, leaving only his cybernetic arm. Crippled, Vader slid down to the riverbank while screaming his undying hatred for his former master. Kenobi, taking Skywalker's lightsaber, told him he had considered him his brother, and remorsefully left him for dead as a flap of Vader's clothing caught fire and he started burning. Kenobi then left the planet with Amidala, C-3PO, and R2-D2 as Vader lay screaming and burning on the riverbank. Rebirth Although Vader survived, he was horrifically scarred, both physically and mentally, and had damaged lungs due to the hot ash in the air. Shortly afterward, the Emperor, having sensed his apprentice's peril, arrived on Mustafar where he found the severely wounded Vader and took him back to Coruscant in a medical capsule. As the Emperor could not afford to lose Vader, he turned to the Republic's best scientists, among which was Silo, who in doing so gained private access to Vader's cybernetics. And by the Emperor's orders, Vader was put into a life-sustaining black suit of armor and outfitted with three new robotic limbs by numerous droids, skilled in both cybernetic reconstruction and medical surgery. Among the droids working on Vader was FX-6, an FX-9 surgical assistant who previously worked on General Grievous's armor. After two days of non-stop labor, he was finally sealed within his new armor. His eyes showed a brief flicker of fear before his mask and helmet locked together and he drew his first breath. Vader's rebirth was complete. Upon regaining consciousness, Vader asked the Emperor what had become of his wife, and he told Vader that he had killed her in his anger. Unbeknownst to either of the two Sith, Amidala gave birth to the twins Luke and Leia before her death. Overwhelmed by his despair in the belief that he had killed Amidala and their unborn child, which fulfilled his prophetic dreams of her death, Vader incidentally destroyed the medical droids and severely damaged the entire room with the Force. He broke free of his bindings on the operating table, and despite struggling to walk under the sheer weight of his new prosthesis and armor, let out a cry of despair over losing everything he had loved. Vader's despair then turned to rage as he telekinetically slammed the Emperor against a wall in the surgical bay, snarling that his master had promised to save Amidala. The Emperor, as Vader attempted unsuccessfully to strangle him with the Force, responded that in death, Amidala had provided Vader a gift, pain. The Emperor continued by giving Vader a choice to either accept and use that gift or to die. For a moment, Vader replied that he would live. The Emperor then immediately launched a barrage of Force Lightning at his apprentice and rhetorically demanded that Vader use the power of his lightsaber to defend himself, but Vader replied that his lightsaber had been taken by Kenobi at the conclusion of their duel. As he continued his barrage, the Emperor angrily shouted that the weapon Vader spoke of was not his. Rather, it had belonged to a Jedi, and Vader was now a Sith. Ceasing his Force-based Salt, the Emperor drew his own lightsaber. He put the blade to Vader's throat and stated that he understood how traumatic the last few days had been for his apprentice, but warned that should Vader ever use the Force against him again, he would finish what Kenobi could not. The Emperor then deactivated his weapon and stated that, as friends, he hoped that the two of them would never find themselves in a similar situation. He instructed Vader to put aside his rage and lust for revenge against the Jedi for the time being, for the two of them had a great deal of work to accomplish. Hunting a Kyber Crystal Immediately after his surgery, the Emperor took Vader to a balcony overlooking the old Jedi Temple. There, he and Vader watched as Mas Ameta directed a ceremonial burning of all the lightsabers from the Jedi who had been killed in the temple. As they listened to Ameta's speech, the Emperor asked if his apprentice knew how or why Sith lightsaber blades were red in color. Vader replied that he did not, as the temple's information on the subject had been incomplete. The Emperor laughed and contemptuously mused that the Jedi had been uncomfortable with the information and had buried it as a result. He then explained that kyber crystals felt pain just like any living being, and could be made to bleed after a fashion by pouring rage, pain, and hate into them. He asked Vader if he understood, to which Vader replied that he did, stating that he could have given him any of the burning Jedi lightsabers to corrupt, even Yoda's. But he had not, as Vader realized that the crystal of a Sith's lightsaber should be taken directly from a Jedi by that Sith. As the ceremony progressed, the clone troopers attending the vent threw a basket full of various lightsabers into the 
incinerator, including Yoda's. The lightsabers caught on fire, and a moment later, a powerful blast of energy was released into the air as the kyber crystals were destroyed. Afterward, the Emperor brought Vader to a desert astronomical object in the mid-rim, and assigned him the task of hunting down a Jedi to take a kyber crystal from. The Emperor took his apprentice to a site where he had arranged for a starship to be delivered for Vader's use, but the ship had been stolen by a group of pirates. Leaving Vader to reclaim the vessel, the Emperor departed, and Vader struck out for the planet's nearest settlement on foot. Once there, he eliminated the group of pirates who had stolen the ship and traveled to a Jedi outpost. The station was garrisoned by a group of clone troopers who noted Vader's approach and hailed him. Though he could have provided the security codes necessary to secure the clone troopers' assistance, Vader decided instead to simply kill them. After exterminating the garrison, Vader tasked the droid co-pilot of his ship to search through the station's archives for data on any Jedi who had taken the Barrage vow prior to Order 66. Vader's hope was that any Jedi who had taken the vow, one of complete non-interference in all Jedi affairs, would have not been only out of harm's way when Order 66 was issued, but would have ignored its occurrence in accordance with the vow. The search identified Jedi Master Karak in Phila, a Jedi who had been completely dedicated to combat to the exclusion of all else. When a grenade was thrown at him by two surviving clones, he managed to contain the explosion, which the clones believed would make him unable to do anything else as all his concentration was diverted on freezing the explosion. As they talked of how they would restrain and bring in what they believed was just another Jedi survivor before the Emperor in the hopes of being rewarded, Vader proved their beliefs that he was too preoccupied with the explosive to be false by telekinetically throttling the clones and breaking their necks, before walking far away enough from the explosion to release it. Vader quickly located the Jedi on the River Moon of Al Dolim, and sensed as he disembarked his ship that Infala was waiting for him. The Jedi Master immediately confronted Vader and was seized in a force choke by the Dark Lord. However, Infala quickly released a force blast at Vader, which staggered him and disrupted his concentration. Infala declared his barrage to be complete and began to ascend the mountain upon which he lived, calling out to Vader to follow if he could. One of the Jedi Master's training droids, Erex, then opened a sluice gate which sent a river of water crashing down upon Vader. The Sith Lord was visibly battered by the rush of water but managed to telekinetically part the river and walked to the shore. He was then set upon by a group of gigantic carnivorous birds, which damaged one of his cybernetic legs. Vader eventually crushed them all with the force and made his way to the peak of the mountain. There, he found Infala and Eryx awaiting him. Vader quickly unleashed a force push that blasted Infala off his feet and dazed him long enough for Vader, who was unarmed, to destroy Eryx and take the droid's training lightsaber. He threw the droid off the mountain and engaged Infala, who sensed that Vader not only wanted to kill him but wished to take his lightsaber as well. However, Vader's previously undamaged leg broke apart at the knee a short time into the duel, rendering him unable to continue the fight. Infala then declared his intention to seek out Sidious and kill him and blasted Vader off the top of the mountain with the Force. Regaining consciousness, Vader used the Force to reassemble his cybernetic limbs with the dismembered pieces of Eric, who coincidentally had landed near where Vader had fallen. He then tracked Infala to Ambalar City, where he re-engaged the astonished Jedi Master. Fighting atop the Ambalar City Dam, the two crossed blades until the duel was interrupted by a trio of security guards. Annoyed, Vader telekinetically flung the guards from the top of the dam, but Infala caught them and used the Force to lower them to safety. Infila then shouted at Vader not to involve anyone else in their duel, but Vader instead took advantage of Infila's concern for innocence by ripping apart a building-sized water storage tank situated in the city below. As Infila attempted without success to use his own powers to stop the destruction, Vader telekinetically removed the Jedi's lightsaber from his belt and claimed it for his own. He then grabbed Infila in a forced choke and lifted him from the dam. Infila pleaded with Vader to spare the civilians below the dam, but Vader ignored him. As the enormous tank burst completely, flooding the city, Vader crushed Infila's throat with the force and tossed his body into the wreckage below. After obtaining a Jedi lightsaber and the kyber crystal within, Vader reboarded his ship, whereupon the droid co-pilot seized control of the vessel and jumped to hyperspace. The droid then began to play a pre-recorded message from the Emperor to Vader. The message stated that, per the Emperor's instructions, the droid had plotted a course to the planet Mustafar, where Vader would find a dark side locus, which he could use to help him corrupt the kyber crystal. As the message concluded, Vader touched down on Mustafar and quickly found the locus the Emperor had spoken of, an ancient Sith shrine within a shallow cavern. There, he disassembled Infala's lightsaber on a small, flat rock formation and removed the kyber crystal. However, when he attempted to corrupt it, the crystal resisted and used the force to send Vader careening into one of the cavern walls. The crystal then caused Vader to experience a vision wherein he rejected the dark side, journeyed to Coruscant, and killed Palpatine. In the vision, Vader then found Obi-Wan and begged for his forgiveness. 
As he knelt in contrition in front of his former master, Obi-Wan called out to Vader by his former name, Anakin. Upon hearing this, Vader snapped out of his vision and angrily rejected the possibility shown to him by the crystal, declaring, this is all there is. He then began to pour his hatred, pain, and rage into the crystal. As the planet around the cave was consumed in a violent storm, Vader succeeded in corrupting the crystal. Afterwards, Vader returned to Coruscant and stormed into the Emperor's office during the middle of a discussion between Tarkin, Mas Ameta, and the Emperor regarding the construction of the Death Star. As Vader was completely unknown to anyone other than Palpatine at the time, the royal guards in the Emperor's office attempted to intercept him, only to be blasted back into the office's large window. Seeing Vader, the Emperor dismissed both both Tarkin and Ameta, the former of whom expressed concern for his safety. Reassuring Tarkin, the Emperor repeated his command, and the two Imperial officials departed, leaving Vader to triumphantly display Karak Infala's lightsaber, now emitting a crimson blade, to the Emperor. Training the Inquisitorious Shortly after returning to his master, Vader retired to a medical chamber to repair his damaged cybernetic components as the Emperor congratulated him for taking his first step to mastery of the dark side. Leaving Vader to repair his armor and limbs, the Emperor informed Vader that he had a new mission for him to undertake once his convalescence was complete. A short time later, Vader was informed of an intruder in the Jedi Temple archives. He promptly confronted the intruder who wielded a red lightsaber. As the two fought each other, the intruder appeared to take the advantage, but after after a time, Vader revealed that he had simply been testing the modifications that he had recently made to his armor, and promptly destroyed the intruder's lightsaber. As Vader went in for the kill, the Emperor arrived and told him that the intruder, titled the Grand Inquisitor, was in part of the Inquisitorius. Vader was then taken to the works, where Vader saw the rest of the Inquisitorius training themselves. Vader was told that most of the Inquisitorius were Jedi who converted to the dark side in the wake of the Order's destruction in order to save themselves. Vader and the Inquisitorius were then given the mission to finish the remaining surviving Jedi of the Emperor's Purge. Vader dueled the sixth brother in a training session and cut off his arm in order to teach him about loss. Vader then spoke with the Grand Inquisitor about improving the Inquisitorius' training methods. They began to search for any other Jedi that survived the Purge. Vader saw the target list and noticed the Jedi Archive's chief librarian, Jocasta, knew on it. He asked the Emperor what was so important about her. The Emperor explained that she had knowledge of the Sith that she and the Jedi Council had kept secret. The Emperor told Vader to find Nu and bring her to him. Vader assigned the Grand Inquisitor to search the archive for information on her. Hunt for Jocasta Nu. At that time, Nu had returned to Coruscant and snuck into the former Jedi Temple to search for a list of young Force sensitives in her secret archives. As she roamed the ruins, her droid, B2, informed her that her ship was about to be discovered. She informed the droid that she would adjust her plans accordingly. As Coruscant security forces came into the hangar, B2 detonated Nu's ship and killed the three security officers. As Nu made for a secret archive vault, she noticed the Grand Inquisitor reading through the Jedi knowledge. She continued, only focusing on the mission at hand. Vader was contacted by an Imperial Security Bureau Major, who had discovered a Jedi insignia on the wreckage of Nu's ship, and then he went to the Imperial Security Bureau headquarters to check it out. When Vader arrived, the Major asked what rank he should address him by, and Vader said Lord. The Major explained to Vader their suspicions that the explosion was premature, and that the Jedi insignia was merely rabble-rousing graffiti, used as a calling card. Vader told him he was wrong, and as the Major explained his experience in intelligence, Vader used the Force to reconstruct Nu's ship, showing the Major that he was indeed wrong about the cause of the explosion. Vader then ordered him to search every level of Coruscant, steering clear of the Jedi Temple. Meanwhile, Nu was about to vacate the temple when she noticed the Grand Inquisitor insulting the Jedi knowledge he was examining. His comments eventually drove her over the edge and she confronted him with her lightsaber. Vader arrived at the temple entrance and Commander Fox had already sealed the place. When Fox asked him what they were expecting to happen, and Vader told them that they had missed a Jedi during Order 66. As Vader entered the temple, Nu was pinning down the Grand Inquisitor with her lightsaber and threatening him. The Grand Grand Inquisitor asked her how she did not remember who he was. Stating the times she had denied him the Jedi knowledge he sought, Nu attacked him, kicking off a short duel where the Grand Inquisitor quickly outwitted her. The Grand Inquisitor would have killed Nu if not for Vader's arrival. As Vader stopped the Grand Inquisitor from slaying the Jedi, Nu used the Force to rain Jedi books on them and she fled the scene. Vader made chase as he followed Nu's trail. She made it to the Archive Vault and used a terminal to purge the entire library of its knowledge. As Vader entered the vault, he was confronted by the droid guard Cater. He identified Vader as Anakin Skywalker and told him he was not authorized to be there. Vader threw his lightsaber at the droid, but being a guard against possible Force-sensitive threats meant that the droid was ready for that move, and it caught Vader's weapon. Vader then punched Cater's arm 
off, and the droid caught his wrist and squeezed it with its robotic hand. Vader drove his fist through the droid's face before it could damage him anymore. But as Cater dropped to the floor, Vader noticed a powerful shot being fired at him and used his lightsaber to reflect it. The shot, fired by New using a lightsaber rifle, knocked Vader back as it ripped through a bookcase. New stood at the entrance of the vault, confronting Vader. As Vader got up again, he tried to convince New to drop her weapon. New ignored him and fired again. Vader dodged her shot, and she fired a third time, further devastating the vault. As she continued firing, she tried to convince Vader that he was just a tool to the Emperor, saying that he could never get rid of the light side of the Force, as it always found vessels. New's rifle then failed to keep firing, and Vader deactivated his lightsaber, telling her she would not be harmed. New's rifle then began beeping, and she threw it towards Vader. He used the Force to push it away, and it exploded, throwing both of them to the floor and breaching the side of the temple. New fled through the fresh hole in the wall to find newly alerted clone troopers around the perimeter. They fired at her, and she jumped down, deflecting their shots back at them. As the clones put more pressure on her, she force pushed them over the ledge behind them. Vader then appeared through the wall, and the clones assumed that he too was a Jedi and fired on him. At that moment, Commander Fox approached the scene on an Imperial patrol ship and realized that they were firing on Vader. He then had his ship fly over to Vader and ordered his units to a ceasefire. Vader jumped onto the ship, and when Fox tried to explain the misunderstanding, he used the force to break his neck. The clones on the ground continued firing on New and managed to disarm her. She then found herself cornered by Vader and the clones, and she attempted to jump off, only for Vader to use the force to catch her. He brought her to his ship, and there she told the clones that he was the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker. Vader used the force to throw the clones off the ship, and when New asked what became of him, he killed her. Vader then crashed the ship and contacted Sidious, telling him that New died in an attempt to escape. With New having revealed Sidious would create more dark side agents with the list and questioning what it was that Vader truly wanted before her death, Vader then crushed the list of Force-sensitive children that she had with her, the Weapon of the Sith. Vader followed his master to the works district on Coruscant, where the two prepared for a sparring match, in which Sidious intended to teach him a lesson. Sidious ignited one of his lightsabers and told Vader to fight him, to which Vader ignited his own saber before his master charged against him. As the blades of the two Sith clashed, Vader was quickly overpowered by Sidious, who knocked the saber out of his hand and later pushed him away with the Force. As Vader was on the ground, his saber was grabbed by Sidious, while he told him that he still fought like a Jedi. His master told him that the lightsaber was not his only weapon, and that the dark side of the Force was his true weapon, a weapon that touches everything. Vader was then hit by multiple pieces of wreckage that Sidious lifted with the Force, while he told him that his lightsaber was merely a symbol of the inferno that consumed all who came against the dark side. On his knees, Vader told his master that he understood his lesson. Defiance from the Imperial Hierarchy Believing he lost all he cared about by his own hand, Darth Vader embraced his role as the Emperor's chief enforcer. Few knew who he was, and even fewer suspected that he had once been Anakin Skywalker. There were some rumors that he was a counterpart to the late Separatist warlord General Grievous, whom Palpatine had kept in reserve. His appearance at the Imperial Court and the favor he carried from the Emperor earned him the distrust of Imperial officers. They resented him for appearing out of nowhere and having authority over them because of his link to his master. They also resented his heavy-handed treatment of them, such as when he used the Force in the presence of his master to choke Colonel Baraki. The situation eventually came to a head when Vader investigated a Jedi sighting on Kabaria. Accompanied by the Ninth Sister, he headed to the bar where the identification had happened. Although the Ninth Sister had originally been planning to investigate alone, Vader had come, claiming that she was not ready to face a Jedi in combat, but secretly because he wanted to fight another Jedi. The Ninth Sister commented on his true desire, using her empathic abilities to read him clearly. As a result, Vader ordered her to remain outside while he investigated. Once inside, the Dark Lord was attacked by a family of bounty hunters named Bada, Ramat, and Chanoth Cha. Using ion grenades, they neutralized all the weapons in the bar while Chanoth tried to seize Vader's lightsaber with a tractor rifle. However, he used the force to seize the lightsaber midair, and under the strain of the two opposing forces, the hilt shattered, leaving only the red kyber crystal. The Chas told the assembled customers that they had only come for the Jedi, and that they were not planning on harming anyone. However, a disarmed Vader disagreed and used the force to turn the customers into projectiles aimed at the bounty hunters. Taken by surprise, Surprise, they turned on their shields to protect themselves. As they attacked him, Vader also used the customers and the bar's furniture as shields. 
Eventually, the hunters realized they could not defeat him and made to flee. Reclaiming his crystal with the Force, Vader pursued them. Emerging from the bar, Vader initially suspected that the Inquisitors had been behind the attempt on his life, and threatened the Ninth Sister with her own lightsaber. The Inquisitors' denials did not sway the Dark Lord, but neither did they prove her guilt. Determined to find who had placed a bounty on his head, he pursued the Chaz. They eluded him for a while until he crashed a massive vehicle into their path, causing their speeder to crash. Seizing Chanoth in a Force choke, he requested they tell him who had ordered his death. They told him about an anonymous bounty with an exorbitant price posted on the hunter net. Ramat Cha, a talented slicer, offered to uncover their employer for him in exchange for their daughter's life. While they demanded that he release Chanath first, Vader refused and threatened to kill them all. However, the Chas countered that even in death they would be together so he could not threaten them with such tactics. Grudgingly impressed, the Dark Lord demanded proof that Ramat could deliver her side of the deal, which she proved by tracking the signal of the bounty back to Coruscant. Vader released Chanath as agreed, at which point the bounty hunters made their daughter swear that she would seek no vengeance against the Dark Lord, a deal Vader chose to honor. To complete the deal, Ramat provided Vader with the information he had requested and gave him the source of the bounty on him, the Imperial Executive Building on Coruscant, specifically the Emperor's office. With their business on Kabaria completed, Vader and the Ninth Sister left the planet and returned to Coruscant. Now suspecting that the Emperor had placed the bounty on his head, the Dark Lord planned to confront his master about his intentions. As the Ninth Sister pilot the ship through hyperspace, Vader worked on creating a new lightsaber. His droid, meanwhile, investigated the origins of the kill contract placed on him, and confirmed that the order would have come from the Emperor's office, with no evidence of slicing to indicate foul play. But as the ship arrived in orbit over Coruscant, the ship's attempt to transmit clearance codes for landing was jammed, and the ship itself was marked as being part of a separatist splinter cell. The Imperial Capital's orbital defenses targeted Vader's ship. Only the Dark Lord's skill as a pilot prevented them from being destroyed although the ship was damaged and forced to crash land. Tired of the repeated attempts on his life, the Dark Lord headed to the former Jedi Temple to confront the Emperor. The Emperor was investigating the horde of artifacts that Jocasta knew had collected and stored in the Jedi archives when Vader arrived. The Emperor sensed that his apprentice did not wish to discuss his recent discovery, although he did praise him for having found the librarian's stash. Vader informed his master of the events on Kabaria, and his investigation into the kill order against him, before directly asking his master whether he had placed it on his head as a part of a test. Noticing Vader's new lightsaber, the Emperor asked to see it, approving of its design. He also chastised his apprentice for believing that he would resort to such methods as placing a bounty on his head if he wanted to have him killed, and that he did not test, he taught. He also told Vader that finding the assassins was his task, not theirs. He echoed a previous lesson that he had taught Vader when he disciplined Colonel Baraki, that they must not kill everyone in the galaxy, but that having power meant they could, and that they would never lack for people to destroy. Vader returned to his headquarters where he meditated on the past events and his master's words. Thinking back to all that had happened, he eventually realized the cause of the conspiracy against him was that his sudden elevation had caused concern and fear among the ranks of Imperial officers, who knew that he had strength, but not that he should the Emperor's power. Despite a lack of proof, Vader became convinced that Colonel Baraki, who had so suddenly borne his displeasure, must be involved in the conspiracy. The Dark Lord met with the Emperor and shared his conclusions, and requested that he be publicly recognized and allowed to show them the consequences of opposing him. The Emperor asked whether he was sure, and Vader confirmed it. He would not kill them all unless he had to, but he would not allow them to act against him with impunity. The Emperor agreed to Vader's plan, but forbade him from killing Tarkin, as he was essential to his plans. The Emperor gathered the elite officers from the growing Imperial military to clarify the new hierarchy. He formally introduced Vader as his emissary, who spoke with his voice, and whose commands would need to be obeyed as if they had come from the Emperor himself. The Emperor then moved aside and allowed Vader to speak. The Dark Lord summoned five officers before him, Corin Faro, Zorta Bingen, June Streffy, Thomas Azoras, and Baraki, informing them that the two attempts on his life had been made from within the officer corps, and that he had his suspicions who had been responsible, he instituted a new rule. For every assassination attempt he survived, and he warned them that he would always survive, five officers chosen at random would be executed. He instantly executed the five designated officers with a force choke before departing, leaving the remaining officers stunned and afraid. With his position in the hierarchy established, Vader never held an official military rank, but acted as the commander-in-chief of the Imperial military. War on Moncala. 
One year into the reign of the Empire, Vader was reliving his duel on Mustafar through meditation. During his experience, he was already in his cybernetic suit, and he used the force to throw lava at Obi-Wan. Obi-Wan jumped up to dodge it, but Vader force choked him and threw him into the rocks. Vader watched Obi-Wan burn before he awoke in his meditation chamber as the Emperor asked for him over the calm. In his throne room, the Emperor told Vader that a year after his ascension, it was time to show that his voice was the only voice within the Empire. Vader asked how, and the Emperor told him that Moncala would make a great example of the price of defiance. He further told Vader that King Lee Char may have had an advisor helping him with his negotiations with the Empire. Vader asked if it could be a Jedi, and the Emperor said it was possible. He told Vader to take a team to investigate this and claimed the military aspects of the operation would be left to Moff Tarkin. Vader arrived at Mon Cala aboard the Zeta-class shuttle Infernum. With him, he took three Inquisitors, the sixth brother, ninth sister, and tenth brother, and a death squad of purge troopers. At this time, the Imperial Ambassador Telvar had just finished another meeting with Lee Char, and the man was walking to his shuttle when he saw Vader descend from the ramp of his shuttle. The ninth sister struggled to get past the King's Chief of Security, Jial Akbar, and Vader confronted the Mon Calamari, asking him if he had read the writ that the ninth sister had given him. Akbar confirmed that he had, but demanded that he know their business, as he had a job to do and so did Vader. Vader complied and explained about a possible enemy of the Empire on Mon Cala. As he said that, Telvar's shuttle took off and flew for Tarkin's Star Destroyer, the Sovereign, which was in orbit above Mon Cala. However, as Akbar denied the possibility of an enemy of the Empire being on Mon Cala, Telvar's shuttle exploded. Telvar's assassination prompted Tarkin to enact a full-scale invasion of Mon Cala. His forces landed at Dock City, where Vader had arrived, and laid siege to the Mon Calamari and Quarren defenses. Vader and his team sprang to life, and soon seized the landing pad where the Inferno was part. He then led them to the Dock City Palace to find Lee Char and ask him about the possible Jedi. They fought their way through the palace guards and entered the palace, where the Ninth Sister began torturing Lee Char for the location of the Jedi. However, another threat loomed over them. A massive tidal wave had suddenly erupted as part of Lee Char's defensive plan. The Sixth Brother warned them of this, and he and the Tenth Brother began shielding Vader and the Ninth Sister from the wave, using the Force. When their attempts began failing, Vader joined them, but it was not enough. The group was washed away by the wave, and Dock City was left in ruins. Vader awoke at the bottom of the Great Unginous Trench. As his oxygen supply was dwindling, he used the Force to form an air bubble for himself. Suddenly, he was attacked by a squid-like creature, and after wrestling with it, he killed it with the Force. Vader then rode its body using the Force and eventually picked up a transmission from the Inquisitors. Vader asked them to come to his position, and they did so in an Imperial submarine. When they picked him up, he asked about the Jedi, and the Inquisitors said that he was still alive somewhere. Vader then asked about Lee Char, and the Ninth Sister said that they did not know, but she then revealed that she had gotten the Jedi's location from him. Knowing exactly where their target was, they began traveling for the Jedi. Vader and his team arrived at the Jedi's location to find the individual and his disciples evacuating. The Jedi, an Iktochi Padawan called Farin Bar, had been notified by Lee Char after he was recovered following the events at Dock City. The group then immediately scattered, but one of the disciples instead attacked the submarine head-on with his blaster. The shots bounced off the window, and Vader used the force to crush his helmet. The other Vader fled in the direction of Bell City, and as Vader caught up with them, another disciple turned around to attack them too. He too died in the process, but managed to slow Vader's submarine, and the rest of the group followed Bar to Bell City. Vader and the Inquisitors arrived at Bell City and marched down the hallway, reinforced by the Inquisitors and the Purge Troopers. Vader was then contacted by Tarkin, who was struggling to deal with the grueling conflict on Mon Cala. Vader told Tarkin that he was busy, but Tarkin knew that and asked him to do something else instead, capture Lee Char. Vader told Tarkin that he did not answer to him, but Tarkin replied that capturing Lee Char was the only way to end the fighting quickly on Mon Cala, as he pledged to owe Vader a favor if he did so. Vader agreed and told the Inquisitors to continue the hunt as he left. Vader arrived at Lee Char's royal command bunker and killed his guards. He then disarmed Lee Char and contacted Tarkin, who told him to take Lee Char to a window and sent him his exact location. Vader asked Tarkin if he was going to send a shuttle, and the man said not yet. Once Vader did as he asked, Tarkin began a bombardment of Mon Cala. Lee Char watched in horror but refused to surrender. The two were interrupted by Bar, who had outsmarted and scattered Vader's team. Bar confronted Vader and the two dueled. As they fought, Bar revealed that he had assassinated Telvar to send the Mon Calamari into war. Lee Char overheard this and realized his mistake in following Bar. He ran to his terminal and sent a message to the Mon Calamari and Quarren forces, ordering them to cease fire. Lee Char then contacted Tarkin, notifying him of the surrender. Tarkin sent a shuttle to pick him up, but continued the bombardment. Vader and Bar continued fighting, and Bar began laughing. Lee Char questioned this, and Bar said that he 
had completed his plan. Barr prophesied that the Mon Calamari vessels would be at the forefront of a great rebellion decades from then, and decades after that. Vader told Barr that he was not a Jedi anymore, and Barr told him that that made two of them, saying that he still beat the Sith. Vader then slew him, and the shuttle arrived to pick up Lee Char. The king told Vader that Mon Cala would rise again, but Vader told him that there was no Mon Cala, only the Empire. Sometime after the mission, Vader ordered to imprison and torture the people of Mon Cala, accepting the dark side. Over the next two decades of the Empire's reign, Vader would remain one of the few who enjoyed direct access to Palpatine, and his preferred envoy for all matters that the Emperor took a direct interest in, becoming known as the Emperor's Fist to both Imperials and, eventually, criminals. Such matters included the elimination of rebel uprisings and the continued construction of the Death Star. One of Vader's earliest missions on the Emperor's behalf was to effect an execution on Mercana. He was also made privy to the secret construction of the Death Star, to be overseen by Wilhuf Tarkin. The Imperial officers remained wary of Vader and his power, as well as his continued devotion to the ancient ways of the Force, but none rose to challenge him without feeling the consequences. Vader's high status also gave him the ability to alter Imperial records under off-the-books Directive 081 Omega. Having killed Tambor along with the rest of the Separatist Council during his mission to Mustafar, Vader was also dispatched to Skako Minor to kill the Techno Union foreman's remaining loyalists by wiping out the planet's ruling council. Massacring the council officials, including Tambor's son, Wat Tambor II, Vader established a new Imperial loyal regime on the planet, which also fell under Imperial occupation. At some point, Vader was deployed to put down resistance on the mineral-rich world of Bandamir, where miners were fighting back against Imperial exploitation. Vader punished them for the rebellion. Despite the mistrust and even hatred he generated among officers, Vader was held in high esteem by the Stormtrooper Corps, as he often fought alongside them at the front line rather than remaining in command centers. As the Emperor's enforcer, Vader retained command of the unit he had commanded during the Clone Wars as Anakin Skywalker, the 501st Legion. When the Emperor retired the clone troopers, the rank and file of the 501st were composed of recruited stormtroopers, some of who received training from the Dark Lord himself, such as Sergeant Creel, an undercover agent whom Vader trained in lightsaber combat. Through their missions on Vader's behalf, the 501st came to be known as Vader's Fist. On one occasion, the stormtrooper Terex met Vader, becoming terrified of him while also respecting him. Vader also garnered strong support from the pilots of the new Imperial Navy. A young officer named Enric Pride personally saw Vader in combat at one point. Investigation on Geonosis Vader soon became aware of a project that was taking up many resources. He began investigating, which led him to the data vault on Scarif. There he found Project Stardust, a project that was a large battle station the size of a small moon. Vader studied its design before he was interrupted by Tarkin, who was very displeased with Vader's snooping. Tarkin told him he was not authorized to be there, and Vader claimed that the Force was all the authorization he needed. Vader denied that he was Tarkin's beast, but the man denied his claim and taunted Vader, saying that he did not need the Force to know he was very angry. Tarkin then produced a hologram of the Emperor, who told Vader he did not recall sending him to Scarif. Vader apologized and told the Emperor he only sought to study the ways in which the Empire would extend its rule over the galaxy. The Emperor told Vader of a new mission he was to go on. There had been certain instances of sabotage during the Death Star's construction that Vader needed to discover the source of before it got worse. The Emperor told Vader that Tarkin had full authority over him, and that if he disappointed him, he disappointed Palpatine. Vader arrived at Geonosis and met with Commander Orson Kallen Krennic. As they greeted, an overhead rock formation exploded and rained down on them. Vader saved himself and Krennic, and they went into his office to discuss the matter. Krennic claimed it was Tarkin sabotaging his efforts in order to get rid of him and take over the project. Vader asked him if there was any proof, and Krennic was not able to produce anything. Krennic then explained to him the incidences that had occurred over the last three months. Vader gave his knowledge on the situation to loyalty officer Sid Udra who met him at the Petronaki Arena to discuss what she suspected. She told Vader that as much as Tarkin and Krennic's rivalry arose tension between them, it was unlikely for either to be the culprit. She then offered Vader with another individual to look into, the scientist Galen Walton Urso. Vader looked through his office and found many kyber crystals in which he bled for himself without issue. He then found a recording of Urso and his family. Vader also noticed that Urso called his daughter Stardust, knowing that was the code name for the Death Star's project. Finally, Vader found an Utheka egg in a box. Knowing that Geonosians were a slave race and were forbidden from breeding freely, he confronted Krennic about this. Krennic denied that it was him, and suggested that some of the slaves may have sent it as a distress call to Urso. Vader then deduced for himself the saboteurs at hand. Vader and a squad of death troopers entered a Geonosian hive and found the queen and her minions. The two sides engaged, but Vader quickly came out on top, slaying the queen. After the battle, he returned to Tarkin on the Carrion Spike and reported his findings. Tarkin asked Vader
Vader how he knew the Queen's Hive had orchestrated the sabotages, and Vader told how their slicers had confirmed the Hive to have installed corrupted tech into production, ensuring accidents. Tarkin then asked Vader how he may have dealt with them, and Vader said that they were animals, and so they were slaughtered like animals. Tarkin finally asked Vader if there was anything else, and he stated to Tarkin that his project, the Death Star, was able to destroy a planet. Tarkin asked how he knew, and he told him of the kyber crystals he saw in Urso's office. Tarkin then asked Vader why he was not happy for this revelation, and Vader said that he distrusted his reliance on technological aberration. Tarkin then told Vader that he was one of those, before realizing that Vader wanted to be the only technological aberration. Vader warned Tarkin that the Death Star may become his tomb, and when Tarkin asked if that was a threat, Vader told him it was only a prediction. Relics of the Clone Wars Years after the skirmish aboard the Tribunal during Order 66, but still during the early Imperial era, Vader traveled to the snowy moon that was the home to the crash site of the Venator-class Star Destroyer. Investigating the wreckage with a contingent of snowtroopers, Vader discovered a memorial to the clone company that perished in the crash, as well as a lightsaber, partly frozen but still functional, that once belonged to his former apprentice, Ahsoka Tano. Igniting the lightsaber's blue blade, Vader heard a squawking sound and turned his head to the sky, where he saw a strange bird soaring through the air. Deep down in his heart, he realized that his former Padawan was alive, but he lacked any concrete proof. After gazing at the bird for a moment, Vader deactivated the lightsaber and turned away from the crash site with the saber in hand, his image reflected in an abandoned clone trooper helmet. Rebellion on Ryloth Five years into the Age of the Empire, Vader, while meditating aboard the Perilous, was informed by Captain Lewitt of an attack on the Yaga Minor shipyards. The attack had been staged by several dozen members of the Free Ryloth Movement, a primarily Twi'lek insurgency intent on liberating their homeworld from the rule of the Empire. The insurgents hijacked an Imperial weapons transport, and Vader led a squadron of V-Wing starfighters in pursuit. After a long chase, during which the transport fled through hyperspace to several different systems, its engines overloaded when it attempted to make yet another jump, and Vader's squadron was fully able to engage it. The squadron brought down the transport's shields with minimal casualties, while Vader crippled the engines. Though the squadron commander suggested allowing the Perilous to tractor the transport into one of its hangar bays when it arrived, Vader assumed correctly that the insurgents planned to destroy the transport by detonating the heavy ordnance present in the ship's cargo bays. In order to prevent this eventuality, Vader crashed his Black Eta II Actis-class light interceptor into one of its gun bubbles and ejected just before the collision. He then entered the ship through the damaged gun emplacement and proceeded to kill all of the insurgent Twi'leks on the ship. After eliminating the insurgent leader, Pock, Vader noticed an active comlink on the bridge. Assuming that another rebel ship was nearby, Vader had his V-Wings fang out in a search pattern, but the rebel ship escaped detection by shutting down nearly all of its systems and hiding in the rings of a nearby planet. Finding nothing, Vader had the Perilous collect the transport and return to Coruscant. In the Imperial Palace, Vader reunited with his master. There, he and Sidious met with Ryloth Senator Orn Free Ta, involving the inconvenience that was the Free Ryloth Movement. The movement, though relatively minor, had been conducting raids on Imperial shipping facilities and transports, and had seriously impacted the flow of spice from the planet. As such, Sidious believed that the situation warranted his personal attention, and decided that he, Ta, and Vader would travel to Ryloth for a state visit. After informing the Senator of the planned journey and dismissing him, Sidious informed his apprentice that Ta almost certainly had a traitor in the midst of his support staff, who was feeding the movement classified information on Imperial doings. Though Vader understood his master's purpose in acting as bait alongside himself and Ta, he saw no reason reason why the Emperor should potentially risk his own safety over such a minor issue. Rather, Vader advocated for simply killing Ta and his entire staff, thereby guaranteeing the elimination of the traitor. However, Sidious wished to eliminate the roots of the treachery, not simply the lone traitor in Ta's staff. To that end, Sidious gave the order for Moff Deli and Mors to be informed that Ta would be arriving for a state visit, but stipulated that she should not be told that either he or Vader would be accompanying the Senator. In this way, Sidious hoped to provide further encouragement for the movement to attack as he assumed that they would discover his and Vader's plans via their spies. Ten days later, Vader, the Emperor, Ta, and a contingent of royal guards journeyed to the Ryloth system aboard the Perilous. Assassination Attempt on the Defiance while traveling from Coruscant to Ryloth, the Emperor ordered the Perilous to stop in the Denon system to consult with several Navy chiefs on how to better integrate disparate naval academies into one Imperial Naval Academy. The Emperor ordered Vader to oversee a training session conducted by Commandant Pel Bailo on the Defiance, while the Emperor met with his naval chiefs in Bailo's office on the training ship. It was during this training session that Vader began to believe that Sidious was treating him much the way the Jedi Council had previously, acting as he knew better, keeping information from 
from him, giving him busy work. Balo ordered the Defiance to enter hyperspace on a course for Christophsis. Cadet Ray Sloan entered the coordinate, only to have her hyperspace path overridden by Balo, who said that she was going to send them too close to a singularity. Sloan studied the path, suspecting that Balo was incorrect in this adjustment. Vader and Sloan discovered that the changed hyperspace route would crash the Defiance into Christophsis' son, killing all aboard. Vader ordered Sloan to correct the problem, and without revealing that he knew of Balo's treachery, Vader and Balo went to see the Emperor. The Emperor ordered Balo to turn over command of the Defiance and take a position at the training center on Corellia. Balo, however, was loyal to the Republic and considered the Empire a hostile power. Instead of turning over his command, Balo offered his resignation from the Navy. Vader then revealed he knew of Balo's plan to crash the Defiance, and the Emperor congratulated Vader for handling the petty problem annoying him. As Balo railed against the Emperor, Vader force choked him to death, drawing the ire of the Emperor, who would wish to see Balo suffer and force him to watch his beloved Navy be turned into something he hated, and have the Defiance be melted down into cafeteria trays. Above all, he wanted to use Balo for his own ambitions, since the old man was willing to kill his own students for a cause. Vader tried to explain that his way was more efficient, but the Emperor wanted to hear nothing of it, as he did not order him to kill Balo. Later, he ordered Sloan to have the Defiance renamed the Obedience as a subtle final jab at Balo, and a not-so-subtle reminder towards Vader to learn his place. Crash Land on Ryloth Shortly thereafter, Vader and the Emperor reboarded the Perilous and resumed their course to the Ryloth system. However, upon their exit from hyperspace, the ship immediately began slamming into spatial mines set up by Cham Syndulla's rebels. Hidden amongst these mines were specialized devices designed to drain the ship's shields, which began to buckle under the continual assault. As the shields neared failure, a swarm of several hundred reprogrammed vulture droids set upon the Perilous from the system's asteroid belt. Vader boarded his personal interceptor and took several squadrons of Imperial pilots to destroy the droid fighters and mines, but discovered a short time into the battle that vulture droids were each carrying a payload of explosive buzz droids. Realizing that the vultures themselves were simply delivery systems meant to unload the buzz droids near or inside the Star Destroyer, Vader ordered his squadron to concentrate fire on them, as they presented a far greater threat than the mines. But between the mines and the vultures, there were simply too many targets for Vader and his squadron to handle, and the Perilous was severely damaged. A second wave of vultures was detected immediately after the first had been destroyed further compounding the already bleak situation. A message came to Vader from Captain Lewitt of the Perilous that the ship could sustain virtually no more damage without being destroyed. Vader moved to intercept the second wave alone, ordering his squadrons to remain near the Perilous to destroy any droids that got past him. Though incredulous, the squadron commander obeyed, and Vader used the force to begin tearing apart the compartments on the vulture droids that housed the explosive buzz droids. He then used the force to begin flinging the buzz droids at other incoming fighters, and repeated this process until the vast majority of the vulture droids had been destroyed. The remaining fighters were annihilated by Vader's squadrons, and he himself returned to the Perilous. Vader marched to the Star Destroyer's bridge and force choked Ta for a short time, informing him of the traitor in his staff that had been responsible for the assault on the Perilous. Utterly terrified, the Senator vowed to find the traitor, but the Emperor had Ta and his staff confined to their quarters. An order was then broadcast from the Imperial Headquarters on Ryloth for any and all repair ships to aid the Perilous as it sped, badly damaged towards the planet. Unbeknownst to Vader, some of the Twi'lek repair teams in fact comprised members of the Free Ryloth movement, one of which was a group of saboteurs with orders to plant timed explosives on the hyperdrive core of the Perilous. Shortly after the teams landed, one of the Free Ryloth groups engaged in a firefight with Imperial Stormtroopers. When Vader learned of this, he ordered all of the Twi'lek repair teams, numbering over 100, to be killed, regardless of whether they were aiding the assault, and proceed to Deck 17, where the firefight had been reported. On the way, he killed a group of apparently uninvolved Twi'lek before proceeding to the hyperdrive chamber. The saboteurs, who were led by Cham's second-in-command, Isval, had managed to seal the hatch to the hyperdrive core before any Imperial troops could interrupt them, and Vader began to use his lightsaber to cut it open. By the time Vader finished cutting through the hatch, the saboteurs had already concluded their business and escaped. The main hyperdrive core had been riddled with timed charges, set to detonate if anyone attempted to disarm or remove them. Vader concluded that the ship was lost, and ordered the captain to evacuate. Vader contacted Sidious, who instructed his apprentice to meet him aboard the shuttle. Before departing, however, Vader made one last attempt to kill the saboteurs, but they narrowly evaded him and escaped in an Imperial escort boat. Subsequently, Vader reunited with the Emperor and left on the shuttle, mere minutes before the Star Destroyer exploded. Shortly thereafter, the Imperial traitor Belcor Dre provided Cham with the transponder identity of the Emperor's shuttle, and he directed Isval and her group aboard the escort boat to attack it. Vader's exceptional piloting skills allowed him to evade the boat and then fly upside down over its cockpit within direct 
visual range of its pilots. From there, he managed to use the force to choke both Isval and her co-pilot, but before losing consciousness, Isval rammed the shuttle with her escort boat. The crash disabled the shuttle's main power, and Vader had to use a nearly depleted backup battery to attempt a crash landing on Ryloth. As he guided the ship through the atmosphere, he had flashbacks of events and people from his past. Though distracted, Vader managed to get the ship in Ryloth's equatorial forest region, but his distraction did not go unnoticed by the Emperor, who noticed that the landing had been poor compared to what he knew Vader to be capable of. Not long afterward, the Twi'lek insurgents continued their assault on the freighters, prompting Vader and the Emperor to take action and destroy them before moving away from their fallen shuttle. At night, they stopped to rest, when the Emperor questioned his regret and loyalty, but Vader showed himself devoted still. They were soon attacked by a lilac horde, forcing them to retreat into a tunnel, unaware that they had entered the nest. They stood their ground against hundreds of lilacs and their significantly threatening queen, and killed them all before exiting the tunnel and finding a young Twi'lek, Drua. When the Emperor tried to kill her, Vader stopped him, intending to have the girl guide them to her village, where they obtained a communicator to speak with Moff Morse. After giving them their coordinates, they were finally surrounded by Sindulla's forces, but so did Moors, aiding them in quelling the rebellion. As the stormtroopers killed the Twi'leks, Vader noticed a trio of Twi'leks, Sindulla, Isval, and Gaul, watching from afar and went on to kill them. But Gaul and Sindulla escaped, leaving Vader to capture Isval and bring her before the Emperor. He mocked her, telling her that her people had accomplished nothing, and Vader subsequently executed her. On the Emperor's orders, Vader then killed the villagers to leave no witnesses, concluding their mission. Teller's Campaign when Moff Tarkin's sentinel base was attacked, Vader was stationed in the Imperial Palace on Coruscant, where he held court with Deputy Director of the ISB, Haris Isan, berating Coruscanti criminals as well as Prefect Foka Suit of Level 1331 for ignoring the Emperor's decrees. Telling them to move their operations out of Coruscant, Vader then made an example of Soot for his disrespect and crushed his heart with the Force, and adjourned the court to meet with Tarkin and Grant Vizier Mazamida. The latter politely asked Vader to refrain from killing all those who displeased him, to which the Sith replied that he would give thought to the matter before greeting Tarkin and sharing the latest developments of the Death Star's construction. The pair separated when Vader left Tarkin, who met with the Emperor alone. Afterward, Vader, like Tarkin and Amida, partook in a meeting between the Imperial Ruling Council and the leaders of the Imperial Security Bureau and Naval Intelligence Agency in the palace's audience chamber, overseen by the Emperor. He then assigned Tarkin and Vader to a mission on Mercana to investigate recently discovered Shadow Feed technology and its relationship to the attack on Sentinel Base. The pair then traveled to the planet on the Carrion Spike, which Vader made to carry his meditation chamber. On Mercana, however, the spike was stolen by unknown dissidents, prompting Vader and Tarkin to kill the Sugi crime lord Faza and take his Parsec Predator to pursue the stolen ship, hidden by its cloaking systems. Making use of his connection to his meditation chamber, Vader pinpointed the Rebels' location to the Fial system and later the Galadron system, where they engaged the Spike before they jettisoned his meditation chamber and escaped to Lukazek. With the Predator disabled, Vader and Tarkin boarded the Liberator, from which Vader issued his Black Eta II interceptor to be transported on the Goliath from Coruscant. On the Goliath, Tarkin told Vader that the insurgency was surely being supported by someone high up in the Imperial military, and predicted that the insurgents would go to Findar to refuel the spike. Subsequently, Vader led a squadron to attack the stolen corvette in the Findar system. Though they greatly damaged the ship, it escaped, prompting Tarkin and Vader to calculate its trajectory to the Obroa Sky System. Teller transmitted false intelligence that the insurgents were heading to the Obroa Sky System. Hoping to capture the Carrion Spike, Tarkin and Vader deployed substantial Imperial resources, including three interdictor vessels. The prototype Immobilizer 418 cruiser malfunctioned, yanking several ships out of hyper space and causing a massive accident. Despite failing to catch the spike, the Imperials managed to capture the YT-1000 light freighter Reticent, which Teller had sent as a decoy to throw the Imperials off scent. While Vader interrogated its Kurivar captain on the Executrix, Tarkin accessed Imperial databases and discovered the identities of the insurgents, including its leader, Birch Teller. Vader also interrogated the Reticent Symithrian navigator, who suffered a heart attack. However, Vader learned from one of his contacts in the Crimora Syndicate that a lieutenant had negotiated a deal with the Sugi crime lord, Faza, for a supply of custom fuel cells. These fuel cells had reached Mercana shortly before Tarkin and Vader's arrival, thus confirming that Faza had been colluding with the insurgents. After a private hollow transmission with the Emperor, Vader told Tarkin that Vice Admiral Dodd Rancet was sure the insurgents would attack the Imperial Academy
Academy at Karita next. Then, Vader parted ways with Tarkin to meet with Rancid, but not before asking about the meaning behind the Carrion Spike's name. And Tarkin told him about his test in Ariadu's Carrion Plateau. On the Karita system, Vader boarded the Secular Class Star Destroyer Conquest and met Rancid just as the Spike reverted to real space, astrogating on autopilot. Aware of Rancid's treason as a co-conspirator of Teller, Vader had Lieutenant Crest place Rancid aboard an escape pod and had Rancid give himself the command to issue the fire order that destroyed it. Elsewhere, Tarkin dealt with the rebels, ending the insurgency. Following the defeat of Teller's insurgents, Vader spent the next three weeks helping Tarkin interrogate the captured insurgents, with the exception of Teller, who managed to escape. While none of the insurgents had died under questioning, the Emperor had the insurgents executed privately. Vader also led a crackdown on the warehouse workers and salvages who supplied Teller's dissidents along with several scientists at Desolation Station, who had provided Teller with information. Vader also took action against the Ten Lost Syndicate and lower level members of the Crimora Syndicate who had assembled Birch Teller's warship, a modified Providence class dreadnought. Submission to R. During the Empire's efforts to subdue anti-Imperial forces in a mid-rim sector under Imperial Governor R, Vader participated in an attack on the planet Namzor, where he eliminated a group of insurgents. In the process, he destroyed the rebels' stores of Coaxium, violating the command of R, who was charged with securing the hyperfuel. The Governor brought his frustrations to the Emperor. Sensing Vader's anger, the Emperor commanded his apprentice to follow any and all orders from the Governor until Vader had learned his lesson. R took great pleasure in his newfound power, sending Vader on increasingly dangerous missions throughout his sector. He sent Vader to fight alone against the renegade droids of On Crentarium, and later retracted his forces on Felzafam, leading Vader to battle the Moon's insurgents by himself. Though he wished to kill the Governor, Vader continued to obey R's commands. Governor R brought his ship to the Concalo Belt Containment Zone, an asteroid field in which a great creature resided. He commanded Vader to eliminate the greatest threat he could find. Seeing an opportunity, Vader confronted R, recognizing him as the true threat. Before before Vader could strike, R ordered the Dark Lord to kneel before him. Vader obeyed, but the creature attacked the vessel, pulling the governor out into the void of space and freeing Vader from his submission. Hunt on Chandar's Folly Tarkin still owed Vader a favor for capturing Leechar on Moncala. After some time, Vader came to Tarkin with his request, and as he learned of Tarkin's hunting, Vader asked Tarkin to hunt him down. Vader told him to keep him on his feet, killing him if he had to. Tarkin was shocked at this and began considering why Vader would ask him to hunt him. Tarkin looked through the reports from the Inquisitorius and saw that Vader's hunt for the Jedi had left him with little to no challenge. Tarkin deduced that Vader wanted to be challenged again and was flattered that he had chosen him. The hunt took place on the Outer Rim planet Chandar's Folly, and Tarkin immediately began trying to take on the Dark Lord of the Sith. Knowing of Vader's brutal abilities, Tarkin outfitted the hunters with slug throwers and flamethrowers to avoid the possibility of Vader deflecting their shots. On the second day, they cornered Vader and four hunters engulfed him with their flamethrowers. As Tarkin watched Vader get covered by the flames, he thought he saw fear in his body language. Vader's possible fear was brief, however, as he targeted the hunter's flamethrowers, incinerating the four hunters. Through the following days, Tarkin saw that Vader was not hard to track, leaving clear signs wherever he went. They learned why, as on multiple occasions, Vader ambushed them. On one occasion, Tarkin and his hunters were tracking Vader near a cliff, when he revealed himself and killed one of the hunters. Two others fired on him, but failed to kill him. Tarkin realized that as long as Vader had his lightsaber, he could not be beaten. So over the course of the next four days, he attempted to steal Vader's weapon. After six men perished, one of Tarkin's hunters managed to snatch it out of Vader's grip while he was fighting. After this, Tarkin saw that not only was Vader turning to new tactics, he was angrier. Tarkin knew that enraged prey was usually easier to take out, but he admitted that this rule did not apply to Vader. Soon after, Vader fought five of Tarkin's hunters as they fired on him, hitting him many times and scarring his armor. Tarkin watched from a hilltop as Vader came close to the hunters and used the force to snap one's neck. The other hunters retreated, and Vader force choked another to death. Once understanding how capable Vader was with the force, Tarkin assumed that the hunt would soon end. However, Tarkin soon realized that Vader was so keen on getting back his lightsaber, so that as long as Tarkin's team hunted him, he hunted them. On the ninth day of the hunt, Tarkin was down to his last seven hunters. Vader managed to kill a Valoth, the apex predator of the planet, and take its hide, which would help him camouflage better. One of Tarkin's Chadra fan hunters, Sissian, spotted Vader northwest of Tarkin's camp. The hunter 
Hunter Yerga notified Tarkin of this. Tarkin got his binoculars and saw Vader on top of a peak wearing the Voloth hide. Tarkin had his hunters form a group around him where they walked in Vader's direction. Vader lured them into the ravine of blue crystals where his breathing could echo and be untraceable by Sissian and his grandfather Hardhir. Hardhir heard Vader's breathing, but although he could say Vader was near, he could not say in which direction. Vader loomed over them at the top of the ravine and watched as Tarkin ordered his team to run. The group ran down the ravine and Vader made his move, force pushing one of the hunters into the ravine wall. Vader then force choked hard here before leaping down under cover of his Voloth hide and attacking the droid hunter. Tarkin had the rest of his team run into the Stormlands, where it was open ground. They set up camp and Sissian listened for Vader's breathing. However, Vader had deactivated his suit, which stopped his breathing apparatus from giving him away, and he slowly crept up to the camp before force choking Sissian. Yerga attempted to attack Vader, but he took her by the neck and killed her. The last two hunters open fired, and Vader used the force to retake his lightsaber. Tarkin then jumped at the two hunters and slaughtered them. Tarkin ran away from Vader, but after realizing he would catch up with him eventually, he stopped and fell to his knees. Vader loomed over him, not realizing that as he was standing higher than Tarkin, he was more susceptible to the lightning in the Stormlands. Without warning, Vader was struck by lightning and he fell to the ground. Tarkin got up and contacted his flagship, the Carrion Spike, to pick them up. Tarkin sat by Vader and waited for the Carrion Spike to arrive. The Corvette soon approached them, being frequently struck by lightning due to its height in the Stormlands. Vader remained immobile and Tarkin told him that whatever he had hoped to learn from this madness, he hoped he had learned it. Tarkin then told Vader that he would get him to a repair bay soon enough. However, Vader was not finished yet, and he force choked Tarkin, showing him that he had not lost just yet. Tarkin soon crawled from the range of Vader's force abilities, and Vader continued lying there. Hunt for Eeth Koth and Rogue Inquisitors Vader, along with the fifth brother and two other Inquisitors, was able to track down former Jedi Master and Council member Eeth Koth to a planet where he was a priest of the Church of the Ganthic Enlightenment. Vader approached Koth after the birth of his daughter. Koth offered Vader codes, secret contact frequencies, and a way to find other Purge survivors, knowing that he was not a threat to anyone. As Koth's wife and child made their escape, Vader fought Koth. Vader then sent the fifth brother and the other Inquisitors after Mira and Koth's daughter, and he continued to fight Koth. After the Inquisitors captured Koth's daughter, Vader killed Koth. He then held Koth's child. Vader and the Inquisitors took the child to Coruscant, where Vader met with the Grand Inquisitor and gave the child two nursemaids that belonged to Project Harvester. Vader then spoke with the Grand Inquisitor about his next target. The Grand Inquisitor told him that there were still a few Jedi left, but they had vanished with no way to find them. He told Vader that they'd have to wait. Vader confronted the Twi'lek and Izcot at the Inquisitorious Headquarters. Vader sensed a connection between the two Inquisitors due to their pre previous mission with Vader. Without the assistance of the other Inquisitors, Vader hunted them down. Vader and two Coruscant guards searched for the two Inquisitors. After Vader's speeder was destroyed, he continued to pursue them through the sky lanes until they all landed on a platform. When the Inquisitors refused to kill him, Vader used the Force to activate their lightsabers and kill them. Building Fortress Vader Vader then informed the Emperor of the two Inquisitors' treachery. Vader told the Emperor that the female Inquisitor allowed Mira and Koth's daughter to briefly escape and only captured the child because she was seen. He also believed they were building a coalition against himself and the Emperor. Despite this, the Emperor was displeased with Vader's pursuit across Coruscant that cost the life of a senator. The Emperor decided to move the Inquisitors to another world. The Emperor asked Vader how Koth tried to hide. Vader said he was posing as a priest, which was the closest thing to a Jedi. Vader was given a reward. Padme Amidala's Royal Naboo Starship, which a P-100 pickup droid reported was in working order inside and only needed around two more days for repairs for the hull to be finished up. Wanting the exterior of the craft to retain a damaged appearance, Vader was content with the current progress and quickly destroyed that droid. Vader was then ordered by the Emperor to go to Alderaan to deal with Senator Bail Organa. However, to the surprise of his master, Vader refused. Having carried out Palpatine's will for so long, Vader was content to continue to do so, but first he demanded a world of his own, rejecting Sidious' offer to give him Tatooine or Naboo, Vader asked to be given Mustafar, the world where he had been defeated by Kenobi. The Emperor agreed to his request and would send Colonel Alva Bren to build a facility for him. Before leaving for Mustafar, Vader was then shown the Mask of Darth Momin, which Sidious gave him to help with construction. When Vader questioned how his master had learned of a Sith Lord not mentioned in any Sith or Jedi holocron he had studied, Sidious vaguely answered that the mask itself had told him about Momin. Return to Mustafar 
Vader, along with Colonel Bren and her aide, Lieutenant Rongo, took Vader's Naboo starship to Mustafar. During the fight, Vader saw a vision of his younger self with a face that matched his mask. Upon entering the planet's atmosphere, Vader deactivated the starship shields and allowed it to burn as they landed. Once on the planet's surface, Vader commented that the ship looked better burnt. He then told Bren that he was there to understand a great mystery. While Bren and Rago got to work designing Vader's castle, Vader returned to the cave where he bled his kyber crystal. As he reached out to the power within the cave's locus, he was presented with a design for the castle from Bren, which Vader rejected. However, shortly after leaving, Vader heard Bren scream and returned to the starship to find her dead. He also discovered that Rago had donned Momin's mask. Vader attacked Rago, but stopped upon seeing that he had created a new design for the castle. Removing the mask from Rago's corpse, Vader took the mask into the cave and placed it upon the locus. He then asked the mask who he was, to which he replied, I am Momin. Momin proceeded to show Vader his entire life, from creating morbid works of art from the deceased to being trained in the way of the Sith by Darth Shaw. After killing his master and studying the lore of the dark side, Momin constructed a weapon which, along with the use of the Force, would freeze a city's population forever at the moment of their deaths. However, an attack by the Jedi caused him to lose control, destroying both the city and himself in the process. As a result, Momin's essence became trapped within this mask, forcing him to take on host after host in order to create his art. Vader placed the mask upon his head but quickly cast it aside and then departed with it from the cave. Once outside, he engaged in a fight with two Mustafarians, one of which he killed and the other he placed the mask upon. With his new body, Momin explained that his design for the castle was actually a key to open a door to the dark side, which Vader could use to reunite with Padme Amidala. Vader threatened Momin not to offer him things he could not provide, and Momin responded that he only wanted another chance to create. Vader accepted Momin's offer, but warned the ancient Sith not to betray him. Under Momin's guidance, Vader used his imperial resources to begin construction of his castle. With each new design, Momin insisted that this would be the one to open the door, though each attempt to do so would subsequently end in failure. And with each new failure, Vader would cut down Momin's current body in frustration and place his mask upon a new host. Each new attempt to open the door would also bring ruin to Mustafar itself, prompting the Mustafarians to attack in retaliation. The cycle of creation and destruction carried on for two years. Vader did not remain on Mustafar for that entire time, but always returned to test Momin's latest design. Mission to Nur Concurrent to the construction of Fortress Vader, the Inquisitors, due to Vader's destruction caused when he chased the rogue Inquisitors on Coruscant, moved to a similarly designed fortress on the ocean moon of Nur in the Mustafar system. In 14 BBY, Vader journeyed to the Fortress Inquisitorius to receive a holocron, containing a list of all Force-sensitive children, which the second sister had been hunting for. Instead, he found that the second sister had failed to stop surviving Jedi Cal Kestis and Sir Junda, who was pleading for the Inquisitor to return to the light and apologizing for failing her. During the early Jedi Purge, Junda, while being under torture by Vader, had revealed the hiding location of Trilla, who became the second sister and a number of younglings under her protection. As Junda and Trilla talked, Vader approached, his breathing alone scaring the second sister. Junda also recognized Vader on sight, telling the worried Kestis that he was right to be scared. Executing the second sister for her failure and before she could return to the Jedi, Vader used the force to throw Junda into a pit with little effort, then suggesting to Kestis that he surrender. Regardless, Kestis launched multiple futile lightsaber attacks against Vader, only for Vader to effortlessly neutralize all of his assaults and telekinetically choke him. Quickly realizing his disadvantage, Cal fled the encounter after barely surviving by pulling a piece of machinery at his and Vader's direction, forcing Vader to defend himself and toss Cal aside, with Vader in hot pursuit. Despite Cal managing to escape from Vader moments before he could enter the elevator, Vader soon managed to catch up to him, just as he was about to escape the fortress. As he quickly gained the upper hand on Kestis and began to overpower him in a blade lock, Cal's droid BD-1 attempted to short-circuit Vader's life support suit, forcing Vader to disengage and stop the droid. Before he could crush BD-1, Cal made use of the distraction to impale Vader in the midsection, only for Vader to retaliate by tossing Cal aside once again with the Force. And as Cal desperately attempted to fight back and summon his lightsaber, Vader stopped Cal's lightsaber before it could return to his hand, and once again offered a chance for Cal to surrender the holocron. And when Cal refused, Vader simply activated the lightsaber and forced it into Cal's midsection, the same way that Cal attempted to defeat him. Moments later, Junda reappeared to aid Kestis, only to be easily defeated after a short clash of blades, being flung aside. Commenting on the strength of Junda's hatred, Vader was impressed when she was able to temporarily bring him to his knees with the dark side of the force, and commented how he could feel it inside of her. Once Junda resisted his efforts to goad her into the darkness, Vader attempted to kill both her and Kestis, but Junda was able to hold it at bay with a force barrier long enough for Kestis to use the force to shatter a number of windows surrounding them, causing water to pour into the complex.
complex and forcing Vader to use the Force to hold back the Flood, as Kestis grabbed Junda and escaped through the opening. Final Castle in 12 BBY, Momin's ninth design for Fortress Vader was constructed, which Vader stated would be his final chance. Upon activating this castle, Vader found that he was finally able to open the door. However, before he could enter, he was informed of another attack by the Mustafarians. While Vader dealt with the attackers, Momin took the opportunity to open the door himself. He then summoned his younger self from the past and placed his mask upon him, thus finally creating his masterpiece, himself. Leaving the battle, Vader re-entered the castle while the Mustafarians continued their attack. Upon returning to the Locust, he used the force to unleash a devastating attack, wiping out the rest of the Mustafarians. Vader was then met in combat by Momin, who mocked Vader for thinking he could control the dark side. As he chastised the Dark Lord for his ignorance about the force, Vader used the force to ram Momin with a rock, crushing his new body and killing him. With Momin dead, Vader finally opened the door and stepped inside. Abandoning his physical body, Vader entered a realm in which he experienced visions of his past, present, and future. He saw himself as a child, haunted by the very form of what he would become, becoming a child once again, he gradually grew up along with the memories of his upbringing. After experiencing a vision of him dueling his former apprentice, Ahsoka Tano, Vader then entered another vision of the Jedi Temple and fought against the specters of various Jedi. After disposing of them, Vader journeyed further into the temple until coming upon the forms of Sheev Palpatine and Obi-Wan Kenobi, who both claimed to be his father. After killing Kenobi, the vision of Palpatine motioned at Vader to stand down, to which Vader responded with a barrage of force lightning that destroyed the specter. Finally, Vader found himself on a battlefield balcony with a vision of Amidala standing before him. Vader, now in the form of Anakin Skywalker, told Amidala to come with him. However, Amidala simply told him that Anakin Skywalker was dead before leaping from the balcony. Vader screamed in agony as the specter of Amidala was destroyed by a bolt of lightning. He then saw a beacon of blue light in the distance. Within the beacon was a figure who activated a blue lightsaber, pushing Vader back and returning him to his body. After awakening in the castle and retrieving his lightsaber, Vader destroyed the dark side locust, sealing off the door, because he was unable to restore his wife. Sometime later, Vader contacted his master and informed him that he was still alive. The Emperor asked Vader if he would return to Coruscant, which Vader said he soon would. The Emperor then asked Vader if the truth he learned of on Mustafar was what he needed. Vader then hung up while standing in front of the finally completed Fortress Vader and answered yes. Vader went on to return Momin's mask to Sidious, who placed it in his personal yacht, the Imperialis, under the watch of two royal guards, hunting Kenobi. In 9 BBY, Vader had at last had a chance for his long-awaited rematch with Kenobi, after an Inquisitor known as the Third Sister, who was obsessed with finding Kenobi because she was in fact the youngling Reva, wanted to use Kenobi as bait to get close to Vader and enact revenge for his slaughter at the Jedi Temple years before. She had arranged for the kidnapping of Leia Organa to draw Kenobi to the planet Dayu. Although he escaped with Organa, the Third Sister told Kenobi that Skywalker had survived his injuries. As Kenobi grappled with the information, Vader awoke on his back to tank. In Fortress Vader on Mustafar. Assembling his suit, Vader moved to his throne room and spoke to the third sister via hologram, demanding to know where Kenobi was. Dismissing the apparent death of the Grand Inquisitor whom Reva had stabbed in her desire to claim credit for Kenobi's capture herself, Vader ordered her to prove herself capable, with the position of Grand Inquisitor as her reward should she succeed. In truth, he knew the third sister was the youngling and that she intended to betray him, but Vader kept her alive so long as she was useful. Vader also warned the third sister that if she failed, she would not live to regret it. Later, Vader was informed that Obi-Wan was on Mapazo. Vader arrived with his three Inquisitors and a squad of stormtroopers, and walked through the streets of the settlement, terrorizing and killing random civilians in order to draw Obi-Wan out. Vader pursued the Jedi Master into the quarry. Horrified at what had become of his former apprentice, Obi-Wan tried to flee, but Vader ambushed him. Vader taunted Obi-Wan with regards to his lost strength, and Obi-Wan attempted to flee again. Once again, Vader caught up to Obi-Wan, this time lifting him with the Force as he ignited flammable rocks with his lightsaber. Promising to make Obi-Wan suffer, Vader lowered Obi-Wan to the ground and dragged him through the flames, scorching him. Vader extinguished the flames as a squad of stormtroopers arrived. Vader ordered Obi-Wan brought to him, but before the stormtroopers could comply, a hidden Tala Durith opened fire, killing several stormtroopers and reigniting the flammable rocks. This gave Ned B the opportunity to retrieve Obi-Wan and for Tala to escape with the injured Jedi. Following the successful rescue of Leia from Fortress Inquisitorius, Vader angrily made to kill the third sister, lifting her into the air with the force and choking her 
her while reminding her that she was warned what would happen if she failed. Vader allowed her to speak, which enabled her to reveal that she planted a tracker on Leia's droid, Lola, which would reveal the location of the Hidden Path Network. Vader acknowledged that he had underestimated the third sister and spared her, although he warned her that he would not tolerate any further mistakes. Attacking Jabim Aboard the Devastator, Vader reflected on a long-ago training duel against Kenobi in the Jedi Temple as the Jedi's Padawan, before his captain alerted him to the third sister's arrival. Ordering the pleasantries dispensed with, Vader demanded to know Obi-Wan's location. The third sister reported that he had been tracked to Jabim. Satisfied, Vader demanded that the third sister kneel before him, and he promoted her to the rank of Grand Inquisitor. He then ordered the bridge captain to set a course for Jabim. En route to Jabim, Vader ordered the path's base locked down. The third sister warned Vader that if they trapped them, their opponents could hold out for several days. Vader responded that he did not intend to break their enemies. After the third sister and her forces secured the path's hangar, Vader arrived on the surface. The third sister told him that Kenobi was inside, but Vader stated that he wished to bring him in himself. Vader forced his way into the hangar and found a transport attempting to leave. He used the force to ground it and rip it apart, only to find that it was a decoy, and that the real transport, with the path and Kenobi aboard, took off successfully. The Jedi Master had remembered the old training duel where his Padawan had shown short-sightedness because of his anger, which inspired him to exploit Vader's ruthlessness and single-minded focus. The third sister attempted to use that moment as a distraction to stab Vader, but Vader used the force to stop her blade, stating that Kenobi was wise to use her against him. Vader hurled her aside, but she charged at him again, and he used the force to deflect her blade and throw her. The third sister activated her lightsaber's twin blade spinning mode, but Vader used the force to stall the blade's rotation, and then ripped her saber from her grip. Vader detached her lightsaber into two singular hilts, and tossed one on the ground at the third sister's feet, taunting her. She retrieved the weapon and continued to attack Vader, but the Sith Lord quickly disarmed her again before stabbing her in the abdomen. As she collapsed, the Grand Inquisitor arrived, revealing that he had survived, and Vader stated that he had known her intent for some time, but had decided to allow it because it was useful in the hunt for Kenobi. Vader declared that the third sister was no longer useful, and he and the Grand Inquisitor left her to die. The Second Rematch Vader returned to the Devastator as it pursued the Path's freighter. Kenobi left the Path's freighter on a dropship with Lola. Against the advice of the Grand Inquisitor, who stated that he should continue the pursuit of the Path's ship, Vader ordered the Devastator after Kenobi to a rocky moon. Vader departed the Devastator alone aboard a shuttle and confronted Kenobi. Vader found Kenobi nearby and asked if he had come to destroy him. Kenobi replied that he will do as he must before igniting his lightsaber. Vader vowed that Kenobi would die and the two engaged in a lightsaber duel, with Vader utilizing a combination of one-handed and two-handed combat. During the duel, Kenobi attempted to collapse a pinnacle on Vader, who stopped it with the Force. Remarking that Kenobi's strength had returned since their last duel, but that his weakness remained, Vader hurled the pinnacle at Kenobi before resuming their fight. Vader collapsed the ground beneath Kenobi and hurled rocks to keep him down there. Before leaving, Vader taunted Kenobi for thinking he'd win against his former apprentice. However, Kenobi, drawing on his desire to protect Anakin's children, managed to break free and charged at Vader again. On the offensive, Kenobi used his superior use of Sarisu and the more aggressive Ataru utilized by his late master Kaigon Jin to overwhelm the Sith Lord before using the force to hurl Vader against a rock. With Vader stunned, Kenobi then pummeled him with a maelstrom of rocks. Kenobi then resumed his lightsaber duel with Vader, critically damaging Vader's chest plate with multiple strikes from his lightsaber's pommel and slashing him across the back before pushing him back with the force again, then leaping at him, striking the left side of Vader's helmet with his lightsaber and revealing the scarred face of Anakin beneath. Kenobi addressed him as Anakin Skywalker, prompting Vader to respond that Anakin was gone and that he was what remained. Kenobi was visibly distraught and apologized to Anakin. Vader replied that he was not Kenobi's failure and that Kenobi did not kill Anakin. Instead, Vader replied that he killed Anakin and vowed to destroy Kenobi as well. With that, Kenobi was left to believe his friend was truly dead before bidding Vader, whom he simply called Darth, farewell. As Kenobi left, Vader called out to him while trying to rise to his feet, unable to catch Kenobi before he slipped through his grasp once more. Vader was left with the belief that he had been but a learner in their latest duel, convincing him to increase his strength to cement his power over Kenobi for whenever their next encounter came. Vader's suit was repaired, and he returned to Fortress Vader, where he conferred with the Emperor via hologram, stating that he had dispatched probes along all possible routes, and that Kenobi would not escape him again. The Emperor noticed Vader's aggression and suggested that Vader could not move beyond his past. Vader affirmed that Kenobi meant nothing to him and that he only served the Emperor. War with the Rebellion 
Vader continued to look for leads on Kenobi's location, albeit in a more patient manner that did not jeopardize his service to the Empire, as per Sidious's order. In 5 BBY, the Sith Lord was approached by Sidious, who informed Vader that he had seen a new threat, the Children of the Force, arising against them. Vader then contacted the Grand Inquisitor via hologram to inform him of the Emperor's vision, ordering the Grand Inquisitor to hunt down these children to either press them into Imperial service or be eliminated. The Grand Inquisitor promised Vader that the mission would be done. In time, the Grand Inquisitor's focus would be centered on the Spectre's rebel cell that mainly operated around the world of Lothal, as two Jedi worked as part of the cell. Order 66 survivor Kanan Jarrus, who had gone by the name Caleb Dune during the Clone Wars, and his Padawa Ezra Bridger. The failure of the Grand Inquisitor and the other Imperial leaders to defeat the Spectres led to Tarkin being deployed to resolve the issue. After Imperial forces under Tarkin captured Jarrus during the Spectre's raid against the Lothal Communications Center, he was scheduled to be taken aboard Tarkin's Star Destroyer Sovereign to Mustafar, where he'd be taken to Fortress Vader. By that point, Jarrus had indeed heard rumors that Mustafar was where a Jedi went to die, which he told to his fellow rebel Hera Syndulla. However, over Mustafar, the union of multiple rebel cells into a growing rebel alliance was revealed when the Spectres were rescued by Phoenix Squadron, with the Grand Inquisitor also being killed aboard Tarkin's crippled Star Destroyer. As rumors of what had happened over Mustafar became known, riots and uprising began to occur on several worlds, including Lothal. The Emperor, concerned at the rise in rebel activity, sent Vader to Lothal with Tarkin to end the growing rebellion. Arriving on Lothal, Vader stepped off a Sentinel-class landing craft with Tarkin and passed high-ranking ISB agent Alexander Callus. Shortly after, Callus was assigned to report directly to the Sith Lord. In an effort to track down the root of the rebel problem, Vader concocted an elaborate trap, in which he intended to track the Spectres back to their primary base of operations. Following his arrival on Lothal, Vader met with Callus and Minister Maketh Tua to discuss his plans with dealing with the Spectres. During his meeting, he informed Tua that Tarkin intended to hold her accountable for her failure to stop the rebels. Fearing for her life, Tua contacted the Spectres, promising them information in exchange for smuggling her off Lothal before meeting with Tarkin. The rebels agreed and returned to Lothal. However, Vader had intended for Tua to contact the rebels in order to lure them back to Lothal and saw to it that a bomb was placed on Tua's shuttle. Once the rebels arrived, they attempted to escape the planet with Tua in her shuttle, only for the bomb to go off as she boarded the ship, killing the minister. Immediately after the incident, Vader had it broadcast all over the planet that the rebels had assassinated Tua in order to discredit them. Vader then ordered Callus to lock down the planet's spaceport and publicly announced that any ship attempting to reach orbit would be destroyed. Vader knew that the lockdown, combined with the populace's mistrust of the rebels, would essentially guarantee that they would need to steal a ship in order to escape. As such, he provided a tempting target at the local Imperial Garrison, a shuttle capable of hyperspace travel. When the rebels attempted to steal it, Vader confronted them with a small group of stormtroopers. Vader engaged the rebels' Jedi members, Jarrus and Bridger, while his troops engaged in a small-scale firefight with the other rebels. As his intent was for the rebels to escape, Vader lazily toyed with the two Jedi while their cohorts attempted to launch the shuttle. The confrontation came to an end when two of the rebels threw thermal detonators at a number of walkers on the landing pad, damaging their legs and scattering the stormtroopers underneath them. When Vader glanced up at the collapsing walkers, Ezra and Kanan combined their power to telekinetically push him into the path of the falling war machines. Believing him to be dead, the two rebels were instead astounded to see Vader, completely unharmed, use the force to lift both of the walkers off himself and drop them behind him. Recognizing that they were hopelessly outmatched, Kanan ordered Ezra to run with him to the commandeered shuttle. Hoping to prevent Vader from pursuing them, Sabine Wren fired a number of blaster bolts at Vader. He reflected two of them back into her chest and helmet, but made no attempt to board the shuttle or otherwise stop it. After the shuttle successfully launched, one of the stormtroopers who had been present for the confrontation assured Vader that he would scramble fighters immediately to intercept it. However, Vader informed him that doing so would not be necessary, as he believed that the rebels would not attempt to leave the planet for some time. Vader later ordered Callus to destroy Tarkin Town in order to draw out the rebels, or failing that, demoralize them. Shortly thereafter, the rebels had used the stolen shuttle to escape the planet and rendezvous with the rebel fleet. However, Vader had placed a tracking device on board the shuttle, and mere minutes after the rebels had reached the fleet, Vader's TIE Advanced X-1 fighter dropped out of hyperspace and attacked Phoenix Squadron. The rebel CO deployed the A-Wing interceptors of Phoenix Squadron, but they were unexpectedly decimated by Vader's lone assault. Weaving through the defensive screen of fighters, Vader attacked the rebel command ship, Phoenix Home, disabling it in short order. The Spectres quickly boarded their ship, the Ghost, and fought back against the Dark Lord. However, neither the Ghost nor the remainder of Phoenix Squadron could land so much as a hit on Vader's craft, as he continued to bombard the now crippled Phoenix Home, while picking off interfering fighters at his leisure. With its fighter escort all but destroyed, and its weapons, shields, and engines disabled, the rebel command ship appeared to be doomed as Vader prepared for a final assault. However, on board the Ghost, Ahsoka Tano 
decided to combine her powers with Kanan's in order to probe Vader's mind with the Force. The probe enabled Ahsoka to see deeply enough into Vader's mind for her to recognize him as her former master, and for Vader to recognize the one probing him as his former apprentice. Ahsoka promptly lost consciousness as a result of the psychic backlash of the probe, but Vader was unaffected. Upon discovering Ahsoka's presence aboard the Rebel craft, Vader's priorities immediately changed. In an unexpected turn of good fortune for the Rebels, Vader broke off what would have been a killing run at Phoenix home in favor of engaging the VCX-100 light freighter. As Vader peppered the ghost with blaster fire, Kanan and Hera Syndulla managed to convince John Sato to evacuate Phoenix home as Admiral Cassius Constantine entered the system with three Star Destroyers. The Admiral contacted Vader in order to receive instructions, and Vader ordered Constantine to block the ghost's escape, but not fire at it, as he wanted the Rebels aboard it alive. Meanwhile, the crew of Phoenix home abandoned the crippled command ship and fled the system with the tattered remains of the Rebel fleet. As Vader closed in on the ghost, it jumped to hyperspace just as the destroyers activated their tractor beams, catching Vader instead of the ghost. Following his victory, Vader boarded Constantine's destroyer and contacted the Emperor. He informed his master that he had broken the rebels, but the Elder Sith Lord sensed disquiet in his apprentice's emotions. Vader then revealed to the Emperor that he had discovered that Tano was alive, and he told his master that he believed that she was in league with the rebels. The Emperor declared that she could lead the two Sith Lords to other Jedi who survived Order 66. Vader immediately postulated that Kenobi might be among them, to which the Emperor concurred, if Kenobi was still alive. The Emperor urged Vader to be patient and instructed him to send another Inquisitor to hunt the rebels down. As per his master's orders, Vader assigned the fifth brother the task, with the seventh sister also joining the hunt on Vader's order. He made it clear to both of them that they were not to fail. After several unsuccessful attempts to capture the rebel Jedi, the fifth brother and seventh sister pursued Jairus, Bridger, and Tano to a still-standing Jedi temple on Lothal. Though the rebels managed to flee, the Inquisitors informed Vader of their discovery. Vader came to inspect the site, informing them that the Emperor would be most pleased with their discovery. The Inquisitors warned Vader that the Jedi were becoming more powerful powerful, but he retorted that it would be their undoing. Duel on Malachor Afterwards, Vader dispatched the fifth brother, the seventh sister, and the eighth brother to hunt down Maul, who had been stranded on Malachor and had been studying its Sith temple for years. He himself arrived after Bridger had activated the super weapon within the Sith holocron. With his Inquisitors having all been killed by Maul, Vader chose to personally retrieve the holocron and take possession of the super weapon. Perched on the roof of his TIE Advanced X-1, he leapt from the fighter and landed in front of Bridger. After a brief verbal exchange, Vader quickly disarmed the young Jedi by destroying his lightsaber and prepared to execute him but before he could do so, he was interrupted by Ahsoka Tano. Vader offered his former apprentice clemency in exchange for the location of any surviving Jedi, but Tano claimed that there were no more Jedi, that Vader and his Inquisitors had killed them all. Skeptical of her claim, Vader obliquely threatened to torture the information out of Bridger instead. This prompted Tano to proclaim in disgust that while she had begun to suspect that Vader and her former master were one and the same, she could no longer believe that due to Vader's cruelty. Vader replied that Skywalker had been weak and that he himself had destroyed her former master. Tano then swore to a Revenge Skywalker, but Vader reminded her that revenge was not the Jedi way. But Tano no longer considered herself to be a Jedi, and after informing Vader of this, she attacked him. However, she proved ultimately to be no match for her former master, who, after several minutes of intense swordplay, used the Force to blast Tano off a ledge. Believing her to have been neutralized, Vader went to retrieve the holocron. Vader managed to catch up to Jairus and Bridger before they could board their ship, and used the Force to begin pulling both the holocron and the two Jedi towards him. But before he could seize it, Tano ambushed Vader and managed to slice off the upper right portion of his mask with her lightsabers. With his mask damaged, Vader's voice filter began to malfunction, and when he next spoke, calling out his former apprentice, it was in a distorted mixture of his real voice and the mechanical baritone imposed by the filter. This and his partially exposed face confirmed to Tano that Vader was indeed her former master. As the temple locked down, Tano proclaimed that she would not abandon him as she had done before. Vader paused at this and stared wordlessly at Tano for a few moments. However, he quickly regained his composure and snarled that she would die for her choice. The two engaged in combat once more, while Jairus and Bridger escaped from the chamber, enclosing Vader and Tano. After a few moments of battle, he locked his blade with Tano's and began to push through her guard. As he prepared to kill her, the energy discharges from the overloading holocron stand suddenly intensified, and Vader glanced up. As he did so, a massive blast of power struck the ceiling of the chamber, and Tano used the distraction to push Vader back a step with the Force. She then drove both of her lightsabers into the ground at her feet, causing the floor of the chamber to begin crumbling. Vader quickly recovered from his distraction and aimed a killing stroke at Tano. Unbeknownst to the two combatants, however, two years later, Ezra Bridger had entered an ancient temple which allowed for force-based time travel. Having been guided to a portal which exited at the Sith Temple, he witnessed the conclusion of Vader's battle with Tano even as his younger self was locked out of the holocron chamber. As Vader swung his lightsaber at Tano, Bridger reached through the portal and yanked her backward into the temple. 
As a result, Vader's strike missed and the temple floor crumbled, sending Vader plummeting into a pool of light. Vader survived the fall. Believing that Tano had perished in the explosion, he managed to make his way back to the surface and departed, returning to his duties in the Empire. However, Tano's supposed demise marked the end of the Great Jedi Purge. Investigating a Disturbance in the Force Around 2 BBY, and shortly after the Empire's victory over the Bataan Sector insurgency, Vader arrived at the Imperial Palace on Coruscant and was introduced to the newly promoted Grand Admiral Thrawn the very same Chiss officer he had met during the Clone Wars by the Emperor. When Thrawn stated he was pleased to finally meet the Dark Lord, Vader claimed to feel the same. Vader and Thrawn crossed paths on Coruscant once more after Thrawn suffered a strategic defeat on Atalon. Although the battle had been a tactical victory, a number of rebels had escaped the Grand Admiral after the Bendu appeared. As a result of allowing the rebels to slip through his grip, Vader now held a disdain for the Grand Admiral. Though during his meeting, the two were ordered by the Emperor to the planet Batu to locate a disturbance the force that the Emperor had sensed. While Thrawn had brought his own forces on board his Star Destroyer, the Chimera, Vader had brought a contingent of his own personal stormtroopers from the 501st Legion, the first Legion with him to assist in tracking down this disturbance at the edge of known space. During their mission, they combated the Grisk species and learned the disturbance was caused by a group of young Chiss Force sensitives known as, to the surprise of Vader, the Skywalkers. Afterward, Vader came to doubt Thrawn's loyalty to the Empire because of the threats growing against the Chiss in the unknown region. While Thrawn managed to deduce that Skywalker and Vader were one and the same, the Admiral came to think of Vader as being a separate person mentally, and that his old ally Skywalker was dead. After telling Thrawn to ensure that he kept his promise to the Emperor by ordering him to stay in Imperial space instead of leaving to save his people, Vader came to respect Thrawn's TIE Defender multi-role starfighter project, stating that he would speak on its behalf to Palpatine and suggesting upgrades for the craft. On Batuu, Vader's presence near Black Spire was spoken of by locals, with rumors of the legendary Imperial Enforcer's visit to Batu being spoken of for years to come. Sometime later, Bridger managed to enter the world between worlds. There, he heard Anakin Skywalker's voice while he was on Christophsis. Vader's voice was then heard telling an individual not to underestimate the power of the dark side. See you now. Vader led Imperial forces at Sienop in a battle against the Rebels. During the battle, Vader was targeted by several X-Wings, but was able to take them out. However, his tie was damaged when one purportedly crashed into him and was forced to crash land on Sienop. Vader then exited his tie and awoke an Ender from its slumber. The Ender then tried to kill Vader, however, he stabbed one of the Ender's eyes out and tried to cut its back open, only for the Ender to grab him. Vader started to slice the Ender's fingers, but the Ender pushed him into a building and dropped him. The Ender then started to go after a native, but Vader rode the creature and saved the native from the Ender. Vader then decapitated the Ender, finally killing it. The native thanked Vader, who then returned to his tie and was taken aboard a Star Destroyer via tractor beam. An unwelcome romance. At some point, Vader had arrived on the Death Star and made his way to his personal medical bay. As he made way, he barged through a medical cart being tended to by a nurse, who was flustered due to her infatuation with Vader. Vader underwent treatment from a doctor while in the medical bay, but became angered when the nurse from the prior encounter entered the medical bay as Vader was putting his helmet back on. In his anger, Vader force-pushed the doctor into the wall, demanding that he control the medical bay or be replaced. The nurse, however, saw Vader's anger as reciprocation of her feelings for him, misconstruing his actions as protection of her. After his bout of rage, Vader exited the medical bay, admonishing the doctor as he attempted to excuse why the appointment had taken so long. The nurse, upon being told to clean up the medical bay, instead stole pieces of Vader's armor as a keepsake, storing it among other discarded pieces of Vader's armor, as well as a vial of his blood. A proceeding incident resulted in Vader crash landing on the Death Star in his TIE Advanced X-1. Vader made his way to the medical bay once more, demanding the nurse call in the doctor. The nurse briefly aided Vader, perceiving the moment as intimate before the doctor himself returned, offering the nurse to leave as he tended to Vader instead. Vader, impatient, cut his appointment short, leaving to rejoin his prior battle. However, Vader had left his cape behind, which the nurse proceeded to steal and take to her quarters. After the doctor discovered her, he dumped the bits of Vader's armor into the trash compactor. Driven mad, the nurse walked into Vader's quarters, which he had left unlocked out of a belief that no one would enter. Upon seeing the nurse enter his chambers, a helmetless Vader simply stared at her as she confessed her infatuation with him. Moments later, Vader stabbed the nurse with his lightsaber, killing her. Vader then put his helmet back on and exited his quarters, contacting the bridge and ordering them to remove her corpse. Battle against the Banathi 
At some point, Vader and his men fought against the Banathi in wild space. The Imperial Army consisted of at least several thousand stormtroopers, AT-AT walkers, ATSTs, TIE fighters, and TIE bombers. While thousands died on both sides, Vader managed to kill the King of the Banathi. Vader ordered his troops to attack, and despite the high amount of casualties, he did not retreat. The attacking force was stopped by a Zillow beast the Banathi saw as their god. However, Vader managed to subdue them anyways. Visit on Mustafar As had been suggested by Grand Admiral Thrawn, shortly before his, the Chimeras, and Ezra Bridger's disappearance in the liberation of Lothal, Vader had served as part of the Death Star project, despite his dislike of the battle station. As Thrawn had noticed that he was one individual in the Empire who could recognize and deal with all threats to the station. Thrawn had also used this appointment to force Assistant Director Briarly Ronan to join the Chiss Ascendancy, as this Imperial officer would not have been able to hide his contempt for the Emperor from the Sith Lord. Shortly after the destruction of Jedha City, while floating in the tank, Vader was approached by his servant Vani. He informed Vader that Director Krennic, the Imperial in charge of the construction of the Death Star, had arrived as summoned to explain a number of recent problems involving the battle station. The most pressing of these problems was the discovery that Galen Erso, an engineer who had played a pivotal role in the creation of the Death Star's super laser, had been a traitor and there was a distinct possibility that he had leaked information about the weapon to the Rebellion. Krennic had been recently informed by Governor Tarkin that he was no longer in command of the Death Star project, and was keen to impress upon Vader his need for an audience with the Emperor, ostensibly to discuss the weapon's destructive capabilities. Vader instead chastised Krennic for the destruction of Jedha City, the city where the Empire had been mining the kyber crystals needed for the Death Star's primary weapon systems to function. Krennic attempted to shift the blame for the city's destruction to Tarkin, but Vader was unmoved. He informed Krennic that the Imperial Senate had been told that Jedha had been destroyed in a mining disaster and that the Death Star did not exist. He impressed upon the Director in no uncertain terms that he was to make certain that Galen Erso had not compromised the Death Star in any way. Taking this as confirmation from Vader that he was still in command of the project, Krennic began to ask Vader if he would speak to the Emperor on his behalf. But before he could finish his questions, Vader cut him off by telekinetically closing his throat, with a sardonic warning not to choke on his aspirations. Stolen Plans Shortly afterwards, rebel spies attacked the Imperial security complex on the planet Scarif, stole the technical readouts of the Death Star, and transmitted a copy to the rebel flagship Profundity. As the rebels began to flee to hyperspace, Vader arrived at the scene of the battle in the Star Destroyer Devastator, and quickly crippled the already damaged rebel flagship. He and a small group of stormtroopers then boarded the vessel and began searching for the plans. As the rebel crew began to evacuate the Profundity, a small group of rebel troopers copied the Death Star schematics onto a data disk, and attempted to board the Corellian Corvette Tantive IV and escape. Mere meters away from one of the Corvette's airlocks, the Provuntity experienced a power loss, jamming an automatic door in the path of the Rebel soldiers. Unable to get the door open more than a few centimeters, the Rebels were intercepted by Vader, who used the enclosed space of the airlock and his force powers to slaughter the comparatively helpless Rebels. As Vader reached the trooper with the plans, the Rebel managed to pass the data disk to a compatriot of his behind the door before Vader impaled him and telekinetically wrenched the door open. While Vader finished eliminating the remaining soldiers, the trooper to whom the plans had been passed along dove through the open airlock to the tent of four, and the Rebels managed to launch the ship mere moments before Vader was able to board it. Once the ship was away, the plans were given to Vader's estranged daughter, Princess Leia Organa, who had been tasked by her adoptive father to find Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine. Despite their daring escape, the Rebels aboard the Tent of Four did not get far. After failing to capture the plans aboard the Profundity, Vader had immediately reboarded the Devastator and pursued the Rebel Corvette. The Devastator intercepted the Tent of Four in orbit above Tatooine and quickly disabled and captured it. Vader and his troops boarded the ship, killing many Rebel troopers and gaining complete control of the blockade runner. Vader interrogated his captain, Ramus Antilles, before killing him for not revealing the location of the plans. Vader's troops captured the princess, but not before she placed the plans inside R2-D2 and sent him in an escape pod to the planet's surface. Although the princess tried to use her diplomatic immunity as a member of the Imperial Senate, Vader had her arrested as a rebel and a traitor. As she was escorted to the Devastator, Vader was informed that an escape pod had been jettisoned during the fighting, but that no life forms were aboard. Believing that the princess had hidden the plans there, Vader sent a battalion to Tatooine to recover the plans, while he took the princess to the Death Star for interrogation. In hyperspace, Vader would catch Organa when she had escaped her guards and made her way to one of the Devastator's shuttles, and a announced that the Emperor was disbanding the Senate as they spoke, leaving her defenseless. Vader then had her follow him to the ship's bridge shortly after before arriving at the Death Star, where he had her sent to her cell in Detention Block AA-23. Meanwhile, Vader accompanied Tarkin to attend a meal with the Joint Chiefs, including General Cassio Tage and Admiral Conan Antonio Motti. 
who mocked Vader's reliance on an ancient religion, only to have Vader force choke him. Before he could kill him, Tarkin intervened and instructed Vader to find the location of the rebel base from Organa. Subsequently, Vader went to torture her with a mind probe equipped interrogator droid, but as she resisted, he and Tarkin turned to coercion. By bringing the Death Star to the Alderaan system, they threatened to destroy her homeworld if she refused to disclose the location of the rebel base. Eventually, she told them that the rebels were on Dantooine, yet Tarkin ordered Alderaan to be destroyed anyway, to make an effective demonstration of the Death Star's power. Vader restrained the princess as the Death Star's super laser destroyed her planet. Vader then took Organa back to her cell to await her execution. Enter Luke Skywalker. After the scout ship sent to Dantooine found the base abandoned, Tarkin ordered Vader to kill her immediately, but the Millennium Falcon was captured in the ruins of Alderaan by the Death Star's tractor beam. Identified as a suspicious ship from Mos Eisley, Vader concluded that they were trying to return the stolen plans to the princess, and went to inspect the freighter himself. Told that the crew had apparently abandoned the ship after takeoff, Vader gave orders for the ship to be scanned to be sure. At the same time, Vader sensed the presence of his old master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. When news reached him that the princess had been released from her cell, Vader decided to confront Kenobi alone. Vader found Kenobi after he deactivated a tractor beam terminal to allow the Falcon to escape the battle station, and the two engaged in one final duel. During the fight, Vader noted that Kenobi's age had made him weak. However, Kenobi told his former apprentice that he would not win, because he would become more powerful than Vader could ever imagine, even if he managed to kill him. As they fought, the two reached Bay 327 just as Kenobi's companions and the princess reunited to board the Falcon, only for Kenobi to see his latest apprentice, Luke Skywalker. Vader's son. As his former master gave him a mysteriously knowing smile, Vader struck him down when Kenobi raised his blade in surrender. Much to Vader's surprise, Kenobi's body disappeared, for his spirit had become one with the Force, and Vader tried to find remains in his robes but found none. As he did so, General Maradman Bast asked who he was, and Vader answered an old man who thought he could help gifted children. He was mistaken. Vader then tried to stop the rebels from escaping, but was prevented from doing so by the closing of the hangar doors by Luke's shot. After the Falcon's escape, Vader met with Tarkin and and confirmed that a homing beacon had been placed upon the ship and that they would follow the ship to the rebel base. Kenobi's warning to Vader came true. His consciousness survived his death and he became a force spirit. Meanwhile, still remaining hidden on Dagobah, Yoda felt Kenobi and Vader's duel through the force, especially noticing, for the first time, the loneliness in the man who had once been Anakin Skywalker. Yoda noticed that Vader's loneliness only grew after he struck down his former mentor, which nearly made Yoda pity the former Jedi and wish he could counsel him. As he continued his journey, Yoda reflected on his past, blaming himself for not noticing Skywalker's path to the dark side. Yavin 4 Vader's plan worked, and the Death Star followed the Falcon to the hidden Rebel base on Yavin 4. As the Death Star prepared to destroy the moon, Rebel X-Wings and Y-Wing starfighters attacked the Death Star, having identified a weakness, a thermal exhaust port which led to the reactor systems. A direct hit on the port would cause a chain reaction and the destruction of the station. Although Tarkin remained convinced in the station's invulnerability, Vader was informed by Lieutenant Tanbury that the 30 attacking Rebel starfighters were small enough to avoid the turbo laser defenses. As such, such, Vader ordered fighters to launch. When Gold Squadron broke off from the main group and began a trench run towards the exhaust port, Vader boarded his TIE Advanced and flanked by two TIE fighters managed to terminate three of the last four Gold Squadron pilots. He continued to destroy most ships of Red Squadron, killing Red Leader Garvin Drace. As the last members of Red Squadron engaged in a trench run while the Death Star was preparing to destroy the moon, Vader damaged Wedge Antilles' X-Wing, forcing him to break off formation and killed Big's Darklighter, leaving only the leader of the group. Luke. Vader quickly realized that the Force was powerful in the young pilot, but nevertheless proceeded to get him into range. When he finally succeeded, he was just about to destroy the young pilot when the newly arrived Millennium Falcon intervened and destroyed one of Vader's escorts. Before the Falcon could destroy Vader, his other escort accidentally bumped into Vader's craft, destroying the escort and causing Vader's craft to veer off course and sent him plunging into space. This prevented him from stopping the Death Star's destruction, which killed Tarkin and was a major defeat to the Empire. Shortly after the battle, Vader sent a distress signal to the Devastator to send a ship to pick him up and bring him back from the Yavin system to the Star Destroyer. Sometime later, he would fly just beyond the ever-expanding debris field that was once the Death Star, when Imperial pilots Sienna Ri and Baris Sai arrived in a Gazanti-class cruiser. Docking his TIE Advanced X-1 with the freighter, Vader passed through the airlock door and met Ri. He then ordered Ri and Sai to remain in the hold for the remainder of the voyage while he took command of the freighter, until they returned to the Devastator. While the rebels quickly abandoned their base in the wake of the battle, Vader nevertheless ordered a blockade of the Yavin system to begin. Post-Yavin Ventures Sometime later, 
Here, an Imperial officer managed to obtain one of two lightsabers formerly owned by the Sith Dark Atreus. Vader arrived on Hradrik, where the officer welcomed him, supported by a contingent of stormtroopers. Vader told a stormtrooper to divert all divisions to finding the smuggler and the other lightsaber. Vader then killed the officer as the stormtroopers scattered to begin the search. A squad of stormtroopers found the smuggler, Sana Staros, and they chased her down the streets. Staros paid a gang of Aqualish to stall them, and they got in the way of the stormtroopers. However, Vader appeared and cut them down, using his lightsaber and Darth Atreus's. Vader then followed Staros's path to a cargo bay, and he used the force to move the crates and block her from a clear exit. Staros then shot at Vader, and he used the force to disperse the plasma bolts. Staros rigged one of the crates and then waited for Vader to follow before detonating it, throwing Vader to the side and burying him. Vader soon freed himself and made his way to the nearby pod racing track. Vader entered the seating area, and the audience scattered at his presence. Vader noticed one of the pod racers who was grabbing the attention of the commentary. The human despite being biologically unequipped for a race like this, was winning the race. And Vader used the force to cause one of the engines to malfunction, crashing the pod racer. The pilot of the racer was none other than Luke Skywalker, who had obtained the other of Atreus' lightsabers. Luke decided to destroy the lightsaber as it overwhelmed him with anger whenever he needed it. Vader watched him escape in his X-Wing and decided to crush Atreus' other lightsaber. According to a tale later told by Vani, at another point after the Battle of Yavin, Vader's Star Destroyer was contacted by Cranwell, the assistant to Tarkin initiative scientist Restin to warn them that Dr. Restin had betrayed the Empire. Restin, who wanted a weapon to use against Vader as revenge for the destruction of Alderaan, had created a genetic serum that would turn those injected into rampaging Gamorreans, who could spread the infection by touch. Vader decided to deal with Restin himself, so he arrived at Restin's base of operations with two stormtroopers and pretended not to know he was a traitor. After witnessing the Doctor turn Cranwell into a Gamorrean with the serum, Vader suggested the serum could be used against the Rebellion. When Restin turned the infected Gamorrean against the Sith Lord, he effortlessly lifted it and his infected stormtroopers into the air with the Force. He did the same with Restin, forcing the scientist to confess his treachery before revealing he had already known he was a traitor. Intending to be a first-hand witness to the destruction, Vader forced the three Gamorreans and Restin to touch, transforming the Doctor into one of his creations. Leaving the infected scientist to the mercy of the Gamorreans, Vader left aboard his Lambda-class shuttle. He'd never feared Restin's experiments, as Vader already viewed himself as a different kind of monster. Simon One. Several weeks after the Battle of Yavin, Darth Vader was called to Weapons Factory Alpha on Simon 1. He was to negotiate, or rather force an arrangement, with an envoy of Jabba the Hutt about supplying raw materials through Hutt-controlled space to the factory. Vader arrived shortly after the envoy, secretly the Millennium Falcon's Captain Han Solo, and landed on a platform. As he was about to enter the facility, Vader was shot by a sniper, Chewbacca, but he deflected the blaster bolt and used two stormtroopers as human shields as the Wookiee rained down dozens of shots. Unscathed, Vader located Chewbacca's position and used the force to collapse his vantage point, but the Wookiee survived. Vader then ordered the arriving Stormtrooper reinforcements to hunt him down. One of them informed the Dark Lord that Overseer Agadine was out of contact and the factory's main reactor was on meltdown. As he surmised these occurrences were the work of rebels, Vader put the entire moon on alert, but also felt the presence of the pilot who had destroyed the Death Star, Luke Skywalker. Although unaware of the boy's identity, Vader made his way into the factory at once and came face to face with the Jedi Apprentice. Vader soon realized that the boy had been cursorily trained by Kenobi, and after the briefest of duels, snatched Luke's lightsaber. As he prepared to execute Luke for his refusal to disclose information about the Rebellion, he realized that the boy's lightsaber had once been his own. Before he could question Luke further, the foot of a rebel hijacked AT-AT walker came hurtling down into the middle of their standoff, knocking the two apart. In the ensuing chaos, Vader sought to prevent the rebels' escape, and mowed down the factory's runaway slaves, commanding his stormtroopers to execute all the escapees. Once Luke got away on a stolen 74Z speeder bike and attacked Vader's troops, leading the Dark Lord to reconsider his initial dismissal of the boy and wonder exactly what Kenobi had been up to before his death, Vader personally saw to the walker's defeat. Solo and Organa, commanding the AT-AT, tried to step on him, but Vader used the force to hold the walker's descending foot several meters above his head and almost tore it apart. He was foiled, however, when Solo and Organa unleashed a barrage of the AT-AT's laser fire upon him, causing him to lose his old lightsaber, which the current owner retrieved, and his mask and helmet. As he emerged from under a pile of rubble, a stormtrooper approached. Upon seeing Vader's scarred face, he tried to apologize. However, Vader killed him by twisting his head around using the Force, right before Agadine reached him via comlink and asked for the facility's evacuation. Vader vetoed his request, had him repair the core, and ordered to kill all the rebel invaders, except for the boy, whom Vader would deal with personally. As Agadine informed him that they successfully defused the reactor, Vader personally felled the rebel walker by slashing its legs with his lightsaber. As reinforcements arrived, Vader sent them after the rebels on 
on the trash fields. While he pursued the lone rebel who was returning to the factory, Luke. Aboard a combat speeder, Vader chased Luke into the facility, but the rebel managed to destroy the power core with the speeder bike, leaving Vader as the only survivor among the factory's rubble following its explosion. The Sith Lord then saw Luke's abandoned speeder and the fleeing Millennium Falcon, as the Adjudicator's captain, Kron, informed him that they had been unable to catch the freighter. Vader force choked the captain to death. Then, as if he were talking to Kenobi, Vader vowed to find the boy's identity and to turn him to the dark side, so that the boy became his weapon and not Kenobi's. Yavin's Aftermath Thereupon, Vader returned to the Imperial Palace on Coruscant to report to the Emperor, bringing Agadine with him. The Emperor bid Vader to explain the events of Weapons Factory Alpha, which along with the Death Star's destruction had put the Empire very near disaster. Although Vader considered Agadine to be responsible for the failure on Psy Moon 1, and the Overseer was tortured accordingly, the Emperor claimed much of the responsibility lay in Vader's head, as he reminded him that he was the sole survivor of the greatest disaster in the Empire's history, one partially caused by his idea to tag the Falcon with a homing beacon and let it escape with the Death Star plans. He then informed Vader that Cassio Tage, now Grand General of the Imperial Army, would be his commanding officer for some time. The Emperor then ordered Vader to continue the unfinished Psy Moon 1 negotiations with Jabba the Hutt on Tatooine, right before going to Tage. As they returned to his office, Sidious greeted one of his agents, Silo, and Vader asked for his identity, but the Emperor denied him the knowledge. Instead, he asked Vader if he had anything else to report, but Vader chose not to tell him about Kenobi's mysterious disappearance, nor the Force-sensitive rebel pilot who had destroyed destroyed the Death Star and left the office and palace altogether. He boarded an Imperial Star Destroyer and immediately left for Tatooine, sending the Imperial vessel back to collect the trade goods for the meeting. Tatooine Negotiations Vader soon arrived at Jabba's palace, where during the meeting, he had the Hutt dismiss his court. However, Jabba would rather claim the bounty on Vader's head and had his people shoot at him, but Vader killed them and forced Jabba to reconsider his position. After being force choked, the Hutt admitted that he found it hard not to respect him. The two then came to an agreement. Jabba would provide Vader with two of his best bounty hunters. Vader left the Hutt's palace and sought out a Tusken Raider camp, where he mercilessly slaughtered its inhabitants. He was then approached by Jabba's envoys, Boba Fett and Kersantan. While he sent Fett to find and capture the rebel pilot from Yavin alive, Vader assigned the Wookiee to bring Palpatine's agent to him. Both mercenaries agreed, and Vader departed Tatooine for his Star Destroyer. The following day, Vader returned in his official capacity as the Emperor's envoy to negotiate as if nothing had happened the day before. Jabba welcomed Vader and claimed that his resources belonged to the Empire as long as he was paid. Vader then turned to leave, leaving his stormtroopers to tell Jabba what was required, but the Hutt invited them to a feast and entertainment in his honor, for he liked to seal his business ventures by watching someone die. Aboard the sail barge Katana, Vader and Jabba watched as the latter's guards killed wild banthas for sport until Jabba's court jester Salacious B. Crumb let out a loud cackle. Vader warned the Hutt not to let the Kowakian monkey lizard do that again in his presence if he valued Crumb's life. Jabba merely laughed and told Vader that he now regarded him as a good friend. The Hutt then inquired whether his bounty hunters were adequately serving his needs, though Vader berated him for bringing up the private matter. He also told the Hutt that their missions were simple enough, to capture an Imperial agent and a boy. Jabba argued that the boy had destroyed the Death Star and had possibly been trained by Kenobi. The name prompted Vader to request Jabba tell him what he knew of Kenobi's exile on Tatooine. Jabba first required someone screaming, though, so he ordered the guards to pilot the katana to the Great Pit of Karkoon. He expected Vader to be impressed by the Sarlacc, which he believed was one of the few treasures that Tatooine had to offer, and said that he found it hard to believe that anyone of note, like the Yavin pilot, could have ever been born on Tatooine. In silence, Vader watched his homeworld sunset. Servitude unto Tage After leaving Tatooine, Vader met with Tage aboard his Executor class Star Dreadnought, Annihilator. During a time of many raids against ships carrying Jabba's weapons and equipment supplies, Vader was sent to protect an Imperial shuttle, CZ-246, from pirate attack. With his TIE advanced, Vader went to their aid, alongside Black 2 and Black 3, and successfully disabled the automated CR-90 Corvette attacking the shuttle. Upon returning to the Annihilator, Vader reported to Tage that the pirate vessel had been captured and that he suspected a security breach. As he said so, Tage disagreed, believing the raids to be predictable pirates and admitted to seeing the Death Star as Tarkin's folly. Vader noted that Tarkin at least had a vision, prompting Tage to admit that his plans were not as grand as Tarkin's or Vader's, but they were still effective. He believed that the Empire could not be based around a single asset, like the Death Star or Vader himself. Tage then informed Vader that he intended to repair the Corvette and use it to attack its base of origin, sending Vader to head the attack, although with an adjutant, Lieutenant Unai. Vader left to prepare for the mission and oversee the repairs in the Corvette. Unai followed, asking for mission to 
look into Vader's personal communications to provide information to Tage. It was the Emperor's command that he serve under Tage, and he allowed it and left. He then planted treasonable evidence into a black astromech so as to incriminate Un Ai during the mission. Soon thereafter, Vader, Un Ai, and six stormtroopers boarded the corvette and found the pirate base, docking with the station. Greeted by a Twi'lek pirate, whom he killed, Vader ordered the troopers to secure the core, while his astromech made its way to the command center to plant the false evidence. They found themselves under the attack of two customized droidicas who brandished missile launchers, prompting Vader to use the force to throw the incoming missiles back at the attackers, destroying the droids and fatally injuring the pirates. A Mon Calamari pirate survived long enough to activate the self-destruct, and Vader ordered the surviving troopers to return to the corvette and prepare to launch as soon as he returned. Followed by Un Ai, Vader went deeper into the station to retrieve the false evidence. They returned to the corvette just before the station exploded. Back on the Annihilator, Vader reported to Tage, telling him that he was impressed with the results of his plans. The intelligence he had gathered confirmed the raiders were being backed by the Crimora Syndicate, but also claimed Un Ai was the leak, noting that Tage should be more careful of those who were close to him. Shortly after, Vader isolated the Black Astromech under the pretenses of a private conversation. The Dark Lord ensured the droid had deleted all records of its data uploads on the station before venting the droid through an airlock and into space, where it exploded. Following an Imperial Rebel confrontation, Vader went to the palace of Gracchus the Hutt to meet with Sergeant Creel. A covert operation of his battalion, Vader's Fist, Creel informed him that his mission to end Gracchus's operations was a success, but that the Yavin Rebel pilot had escaped them yet again. Vader inquired if he had mentioned his name, which he did not, and asked him to tell him everything he had learned of the boy. A Droid Army from the information he gathered from the pirate base, Vader learned that a Dr. Afra had supplied the pirates with the customized droidicas. As he wanted similarly effective units in the personal army he sought to build, Vader set out to find Afra, conducting a manhunt for her in many locations, gathering information and killing the witnesses, until he finally learned of her presence on Quarantine World 3 in Kalidahan space. He landed there just as Afra was arrested by Utani Zane and a squad of B2 super battle droids. Although Zane warned him that he was violating treaties, Vader began destroying her droids and saved Afra as she tumbled over a ledge. Vader stabbed Zane through the back with his saber before telling the doctor he needed her services. He helped her up, and she agreed. Together, they boarded Afra's ship, the Archangel II, where she admitted to being a fan of his. The rogue archaeologist also introduced Vader to the Triple Zero Protocol Personality Matrix, and estimated it would take hours to unlock the Matrix's codes that were restricting it. It took Vader a few seconds to unlock it, which let Afra install the Personality Matrix into a Protocol droid's body right away. As the droid introduced himself as 000, she imprinted herself and Vader as his masters, and used him to wake up BT-1, a blastomech prototype. But as it was hostile towards his new masters, 000 shut it down before he could do any harm. Vader then let her know that the reason he sought her out was to secure his own private resources, ones only she could help him procure. Afra, who had originally acquired the two droids from the Gotra, instead gave them to Vader after realizing that Vader was probably going to be her employer for the foreseeable future. She asked what else he needed, and he answered that he wanted troops of unquestionable loyalty, battle droids. Afra then suggested that they acquire an unusual droid foundry on Geonosis, one in possession of Queen Karina, who had survived the Clone Wars and the planet sterilization. As they landed the Archangel, she sent 000 and BT-1 to map the cave route to the Queen, so that she and Vader could follow. Afra asked Vader if he'd ever been to Geonosis before. Her questioning brought up the memory of his first kiss with Amidala, shortly before the first battle of Geonosis. Vader ordered Afra to cease her probing and entered the catacombs. She followed him. They reunited with BT-1 and 00 and encountered the Queen. Vader immediately amputated her from the womb droid factory. The Queen, injured but alive, ordered her children to stop the intruders. At Vader's command, BT-1 opened fire on the droids, and he and Vader began to overwhelm her forces. Meanwhile, Aphra set a beacon on the ceiling with Vader's help and ordered her Archangel to barrage the locator to make a hole in the roof. Vader protected himself and Aphra by creating a force barrier. His J-Type 327 Nubian then lowered a crane platform, which Aphra attached to the factory, while Vader Vader fought off the advancing droids, and the ship carried them and the factory to the skies. They would later board the Archangel, where Aphra successfully activated the factory and told him that he would have his private drone army. She then asked Vader if he would kill her then or later, and said that if he did, she wanted a lightsaber through the neck with no warning. Vader finally told her that she proved resourceful and would be safe as long as he had use for her, unless she tried to blackmail him. It was then that 000 interrupted them to inform Vader that he had a signal from Black Chrysanthemum. He was bringing the Emperor's agent to him. 
Silo's enforcers. As Chrysanthemum arrived, Vader confronted the Emperor's agent, Silo 4. Vader demanded that he tell him his name, his commission from the Emperor, and the location of his headquarters. As he refused, Vader assigned 000 to retrieve all relevant information from him. After an interrogation that resulted in the agent's death, 000 reported to Vader that he was Dr. Silo 4, and that his research base was located in an outer rim nebula, and that his commission was to create replacements for Vader. After learning this, they immediately departed for the base, aboard his J-Type 327 Nubian. While Afro remained on the ship, Vader and the two platoons of droid commandos infiltrated it. Vader sent a platoon to the dojo and had the other one follow him to the barracks. As they killed the soldiers in there, Afro reported that they had lost the other platoon, prompting Vader to go to the dojo, where he met the twins Mora and Aeolian Astart. They soon engaged in combat, but before any of the parties could harm each other, Silo 5 appeared and told the twins to stand down. He explained to Vader why he was still alive after his last body was killed, and that he was not making apprentices for the Emperor, but enforcers, as he believed the Force to be obsolete. Believing him to be blasphemous, Vader attempted to strike Silo down when the scientists claimed they were, in many ways, Vader's children and successors. The Emperor then revealed his presence to Vader and stopped him, claiming he wanted to see Silo's demonstration without delay. Vader was immediately made to fight the Astart twins, Tulan Voysgator, the Mon Calamari Carbin, and a Trandoshan. As neither party was injured, the Emperor ordered the fight to be won to the death. As such, Vader fought the Trandoshan, but its ferocity threw him off balance, prompting Morit to intervene and kill his fellow enforcer. The Emperor then ordered the fighting to cease. Vader warned Morit that his trespass would not be forgiven as the Trandoshan's life was his to take. The Emperor then told the Enforcers and Vader that their mission was to strike down all who opposed the Empire and that they were not to slay each other. As per his master's orders, Vader followed him. In private, the Emperor, discovering some remains of Vader's commando droids, admitted to being impressed that he had some independence left him after so long, and that perhaps he could triumph against the Enforcers. Vader criticized his dealings with Silo, as he saw his Enforcers as a heresy to the Force, but the Emperor berated him for his lack of respect, for it was Vader who disappointed him on Mustafar and had forced him to contact Silo. As he left, he observed that perhaps Vader would prove himself worthy of the name he had given him back then, Parenthood. Troubled, Vader returned to his ship. Aboard the Nubian, Afra told him that Fett wanted to report in during Vader's absence. Subsequently, Vader traveled to a Star Destroyer to meet with the Bounty Hunter and hear his story. The Dark Lord was disappointed to hear that Fett had lost the boy, but before leaving, Fett told him his name, Luke Skywalker. In his solitude, Vader remembered Amidala telling him about her pregnancy and Palpatine's half-truth, and cracked the viewport in his anger. Thereupon, he used his meditation chamber's hollow projector to contact his master, but chose to say nothing about his son. Rather, Vader assured him that he would not fail and ended the transmission. Nevertheless, he accepted Luke as his son and vowed that the boy would be his. Determined to find more about Luke, Vader returned to Tatooine on the Archangel with Afra 000 and BT-1 in his company. They landed at the Lars homestead, which they discovered to be deserted after an attack by Imperial troops, and Vader tried to find traces of Luke's presence. Unable to find anything of importance, Vader left the moisture farm and went to Kenobi's home, where he indeed felt the remnants of Luke's usage of the Force during his duel against Fett, but not Nothing else. As they left, Afra activated a molecular purge bomb to remove all remnants of their presence, and Vader dismissed Afra, for he was to return to his duties for the time being. Anthon Prime. As part of Tage's crackdown on Outer Rim criminal interests who had gone unchecked in the past, Vader took part in a mission to terminate a criminal organization known as the Suntool Pride. He and his troops destroyed the Pride's base and seized its stockpile of credits to be transported on an Imperial light cruiser, but he also secretly sent Afra all the information needed to steal the credits cargo. Following the theft, Vader reunited with her on Anthem 13, where he sent her to confirm some information about Commodex Tan. Vader then attended a meeting between Tage and Silo's enforcers, wherein the Astart twins were assigned to deal with the Plasma Devils, and wherein Vader let Tage know that he wanted the mission of finding the Yavin Rebel pilot, which was Carbon's mission. Tage felt he was too personally invested and sent Vader to punish whomever was responsible for the theft of Santul Pride's fortune in the Anthem system. He also informed Vader that Inspector Thanoth was his replacement adjutant. While Thanoth went to the Anthon Prime Orbital Dockyard to investigate the theft circumstances, Vader returned to Anthon 13 and killed the entirety of a small rebel cell to cover his tracks. He later reunited with Thanoth on Anthon Prime, where they sought Duan, an employee of the Dragon, an arms dealer who was likely to have sold the explosives needed for the theft, and interrogated him. The Nautilin promptly revealed the location of the Dragon in his mansion, before the twins killed him in a show of force. Thanoth then noticed Vader's passivity, but Vader dismissed it, saying he was merely trying to ascertain if Thanoth was dangerous or a traitor. 
Vader. The two then went to the dragon's mansion, which Vader entered on his own, killing the people inside until he reached the dragon himself. Although he tried to tell Vader everything save himself, Vader killed the Ortolan and claimed that he would have detonated the building once Thanoth reached the office. The inspector then opened the dragon's vault to access his records and asked Vader to ready a strike force for when he located the subjects. Vader then used the opportunity to meet with Afra, who had just come back from a raid on Combat Xton's villa on Naboo. She confirmed his sources. Amidala had indeed died, but had given birth to a healthy boy, who was taken away by the Jedi. Vader then tasked Afra with finding Luke before Carbon could. Subsequently, she reported to the Ante. Vader then returned to the Star Destroyer, where with Thanoth, they would travel to the Spire to find the Ante. When they found him, he told them of the location of the Plasma Devils to show cooperation and pointed one at the responsible for the theft, Afra. Before the Given could identify her by name, Vader telekinetically forced an unlucky stray shot and killed him. Vader then went to find Afra before anyone else. As they encountered each other, Vader ordered her not to struggle and force choked her, but Afra claimed that she knew of Luke's location. Vader released her and ordered Afra to tell him, but she refused, claiming she would tell him later. He then let her go, using the force to drop debris above him as she escaped on the Archangel. He got out of the rubble as Thanoth and the stormtroopers arrived and claimed he had fallen into a trap. To follow her, Vader and Thanoth boarded their Arquitans class light cruiser. As they waited for their Thai bombers to catch Afra, Vader and Thanoth agreed to use their ready strike force to kill the plasma devils before they could escape. The two had their light cruiser go to the Thantine substrata on Anthan 1, where the rebel cell was located. As per their plan, their light cruiser bombarded the westernmost tunnels and sealed them, whereas Vader went to the east route and felled the incoming rebel ships by throwing his lightsaber until the cell was annihilated. He then took three of the plasma devils' flight helmets and alongside Thanoth presented them to Tage, who agreed with their course of action given the tight situation. As Carbon reported that the Yarvin pilot was free, Victor and Thanoth laughed, and the inspector let him know that it had been an honor to serve alongside him. Shu Toran Vader traveled to Shutoran with a message to reinforce their cooperation and force its government to fulfill the quotas, while 000 and BT-1 killed the king and his closest servants. Expecting to meet the king of Shutoran, he instead met Princess Trios upon landing, who was to show him to the ball, a little celebration to showcase their culture. Soon after their arrival, however, Shutoran assassins showed up that wished death to the Empire and the king, but Vader successfully fended them off and demanded to see the king immediately. Trios complied and guided him through the tunnels as the main elevators were being watched by the traitorous dukes, according to her. Vader recognized Trios as admirable for her willingness to sacrifice herself for the greater good as lava poured into the tunnels. However, he used his lightsaber to make a round platform to float above the lava and reach one of the exits above. Taking an unconscious Trios with him, Vader made it to one of the corridors where he killed the guards. Trios awoke only to point a blaster at Vader. He, however, cut her hand off and entered the king's chamber to find the monarch, his other children, and her guards killed by Vader's assassin droids. With Trios as the new queen of Shu Toran, he delivered the emperor's message a piece of Alderaan as a reminder of what happened to worlds that resisted his rule. Vader then told her that he would pacify the planet, but that she was not to forget whom she served. Vrogas Vos Vader met with Afra and the droids and demanded that he tell her Luke's location, Vrogas Voss. She continued by saying she did want to work for him and show that she was trustworthy. After a moment, he conceded that his work alongside Thanoth had given him appreciation of talent and told her not to make him regret his decision. He then left, saying it was a task for him alone. Unbeknownst to him, a probe droid from Carbon followed. In his TIE advanced, he went to the planet system where, upon coming out of hyperspace, he found three Alliance Starfighter squadrons orbiting the planet. As he sensed Luke's presence, he remained and charged against the Starfighters, who dismissed his tie as a mere Imperial Scout. During the battle, Vader engaged with the X-Wing Starfighters and managed to take out both Blue Squadron and Yellow Squadron, as he lost contract with Afra. Vader was then confronted by a Luke, who was flying as Red 5, and flew his X-Wing into Vader's Starcraft, hoping to kill him. During their collision, their stabilizers were damaged, prompting their craft to crash on the planet's surface. There, Vader was hunted down by the Alliance forces, starting with Grey Squadron, but he promptly destroyed them by use of the Force. Afterward, a company of Rebel Commandos moved in to attack him, but he activated some of their thermal detonators before they could throw them, taking out a tank by deflecting its shot against it and continued to reduce the rebel forces. Vader also took the blaster array of his fallen TIE Advanced X-1 and used it to take down further ships, this time from Cyan Squadron. Not long after, another platoon was deployed to attack him, although this time Organa was leading them herself. Vader, choking her two companions, confronted her but felt an incoming ambush. When he let her go so that she contacted Luke, Organa used the opportunity to arrange an airstrike on her in Vader's location. Instead, Instead, Commander Carbon arrived with a task force and tried to take his victory, both his son and the princess's execution from Vader. Subsequently, Vader engaged the Enforcer in a duel, and during which they entered the Jedi Temple in ruins. Inside the temple, he was momentarily distracted by ghosts of his past, Jin's, Kenobi's, and Yoda's voices, but continued the duel. Aphra then contacted him from aboard the Archangel,
Angel and informed him that Luke had been captured by Carbon's guards. So Vader had her crash her ship against Carbon and confronted the mortally wounded Carbon, who realized that there was more to the Yavin pilot and Vader's relationship than met the eye. Vader also finished him and contacted Aphra to tell him that her pardon depended on Luke's capture. With the Force, he brought down the shuttle transporting Luke, and Aphra tried to capture Luke only to be captured herself by the Rebels, leaving Vader to watch his son, on the Millennium Falcon, flee from Vrogus Vos the Shu Toran War. Vader then returned to the Imperial Palace and brought Carbon's body to the Emperor, demanding that his master give him a fight worthy of his time. The Emperor then told Vader to return to Shu Toran as the Ore Barons were rebelling, and he required full military intervention, and that Silo, per Tej's request, was to join him in the task. As a result, Vader returned to Shu Toran alongside Silo, the Astarte Twins, and Void Gazer. Accompanied by Queen Trios, Vader led an attack against a rebellious delving citadel and destroyed it as a demonstration of the Force. He also accorded to treat Trios with the illusion of respect and tasked in secret a group of bounty hunters to find Aphra and return her to him either dead or alive. After sending a broadcast to the barons, Vader, Trios, and Silo and his enforcers went, per the queen's suggestion, to the ancestral retreat of the Shutoran royalty. There they were soon attacked by Baron Rubix's lava leviathan and Vader used Trios' escape vessel to reach the leviathan and dared the twins to follow him. With their lightsabers they boarded it and from the inside the three cut large holes that allowed the ship to flood with magma and be destroyed. Upon returning, Trios suggested that they attack Rubix next, as she had identified the ship's owner, and so Vader told Silo to prepare his enforcers. In the meantime, he killed Bebox for trying to deceive him with a strangler's disintegrated body, and refused Aileen's request to train her. Soon enough, they carried out the siege to Rubix's delving citadel, using Shutoran loyalist Imperial Delving Fleet's combat drills, with Vader heading the first wave alongside the Astarte. However, he was betrayed by Silo, and his drill was redirected to a lithoporite seam, where they were surrounded by Rubix's elite forces. With their outbound communications jammed, Vader left his troops as well as droid platoons to protect the drill, and had the Astarte twins follow him as to use the enemy's lines to tell the rest of the assault fleet to resume the attack. On the way there, the twins attacked him, but Aeolian saw that they could not win against Vader and destroyed the pathway between them. She was then betrayed by her brother who pushed her into the lava and fled back to Silo. Vader then took the dying Aeolian out of the lava and had to reveal Silo's deceit before finishing her off. Vader then returned to his forces who had secured the enemy lines thanks to 000's stratagem, and was surprised to find that Trios' assault to the Delving Citadel was already underway. With no opposition, Vader's combat drill resumed his way to Citadel, and Vader himself cut off Rubix's escape. Trio soon went to their encounter, and Rubix formally surrendered. She then had the Baron executed and appointed his daughter as his successor, thus ending the rebellion. Vader then left the planet and informed the Emperor of Silo's treachery, and the Emperor simply summoned him. He also received a message from Inspector Thanoth, saying that he had located Aphra and that they needed to talk. Hunt for Silo. At the shipyards of Kuat, Vader met with Sidious aboard the unfinished Executor class. Star Dreadnought, the Executor. The Emperor explained that in order to save Vader from Mustafar, he had to resort to scientists who were similar in philosophy to the Sith, among them Silo. Silo eventually grew too powerful within the Tarkin Initiative, and so Sidious was forced to make him overplay his hand. With the man a mere traitor, he could be purged. After the meeting, Vader met with Thanoff on Anthem 13. The Inspector, aware of Vader's real identity, revealed that he would support Vader's treason against the Emperor, and that he would reveal Aphra's location on the Cosmotanic Steps. However, Thanoff understood that Vader would not rest until he silenced a possible loose end, so he had elected to tell the Sith Lord in person so Vader would not waste time looking for him. When Thanoth revealed Aphra's location and thanked Anakin for their work together, Vader killed him with his lightsaber. Outside, and ignoring the droid's request to dispose of Thanoth's corpse, Vader ordered 000 and BT-1, who were joined by Chrysanthemum and his commando droids, to return Aphra to the Executor or kill her as their priority orders. Vader also made it clear to wipe out anyone else they found at the Cosmotanic Steps to eliminate all witnesses present, ensuring that if Aphra had told anyone about her work with Vader, they were silenced. Vader then departed aboard his TIE Advanced X-1 with 000 realizing he would not be taking Silo back alive, and returned to the Executor. Aboard, he confronted Professor Thlurai, a colleague of Silo's, whom he threatened to learn the traitor's location in the Krushank Nebula. Vader took the Devastator to the Nebula, where his crew confirmed Silo's whale fleet was present. After ordering that Thlurai be thanked, and then, for fraternizing with the traitor, executed, Vader led the assault on Silo's fleet from his TIE advance. After Silo's flagship fired an ion pulse to disable the Devastator and move to escape, Vader fired into the whale ship and crashed into an opening he'd made, boarding the enemy ship just before it jumped into hyperspace. Moving past the personnel he'd left to be sucked into hyperspace and entering the labs, Vader was confronted by Voidgazer, who pitted him against a cyberanimate Rancor as a test of her technology, just as Silo's fleet arrived at Kuat. Although the creature gave him some difficulty, Vader killed it by throwing his lightsaber through its skull, severing the 
Neural Link and turned one of Voidgazer's defense droids against her, fatally wounding her. As she lay dying, Voidgazer revealed that she had tampered with the Executor's systems to incapacitate the crew. Vader finished her off and went to the empty bridge, which had been abandoned by Silo and Morit as they had fled in the escape pods, to find that Silo's flagship was to collide with the Executor. Before it did, he ejected and landed on the Executor's outer hull where he encountered Morit. He easily killed him and then made his way to the Executor's bridge where he confronted Silo. The scientists simply disabled Vader's cybernetics with a device that he had kept for 20 years, forcing Vader to kneel and drop his lightsaber. While Vader was incapacitated, he received visions of his duel with his former master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. This time, however, Kenobi threw him into the lava. Vader then rose out of the river in his life suit and struck down his old master. However, like their duel on the Death Star, Kenobi's body disappeared. Vader then encountered a vision of his younger self. The two versions of Skywalker fought until Vader came out victorious, throwing his counterpart in the lava. After his counterpart yelled that he hated himself, the Dark Lord met a vision of his deceased wife, Padme Amidala. Vader then found himself chained to the same table where he first received his suit. The vision of Padme pleaded with him, asking him to stay with her. Vader, however, choked the illusion while at the same time regained control of his body. After he told the vision that her husband was dead, Vader used his lightsaber to impale Silo, who was astounded that Vader was moving while his suit was deactivated. Thus, Vader had regained the ship from his control. The Dark Lord then informed his master of his success. The Emperor ordered Vader to finish his mission, then returned to him, stating that there was much to discuss. Vader took control of his TIE advanced, flying into Silo's command ship. After cutting his way through Silo's forces, the Dark Lord found his way to the Doctor's cloning room. After destroying Silo's spare bodies, Vader made it to the command bridge. Vader then confronted the Doctor one last time. He mind-tricked the whale ship into flying into a nearby star, destroying Silo once and for all. After returning to the Executor, Vader met with his master, who had been waiting for a full report, only to reveal it was no longer needed because Aphra was present. While 000 and BT-1 had successfully brought Aphra to the Executor and were planning on giving Vader suggestions on how to kill the Doctor, should they have found his planned execution too boring for their tastes, Aphra realized Vader's priority only mandated the droids bring her to the Executor. As she realized as such and was dragged away by two stormtroopers to await Vader's wrath, she gave a new priority order, help her escape. Reaching Palpatine's chamber, Aphra told Palpatine of all Vader's secret missions and plans, although she did choose to leave out the details surrounding Luke Skywalker. Instead of being angry with Vader, however, the Emperor was pleased with his apprentice's ability to operate in the shadows, stating he was everything he could have hoped for. The Emperor then left his apprentice to deal with Aphra as he pleased. Vader then ordered Aphra to follow him. Despite her pleas for a quick death, he forced her out of the airlock. Although she secretly survived, having deduced Vader would never honor her wish to avoid execution via airlock, she was rescued in time by Kersantan, 000, and BT-1. Making his way to the bridge, the Emperor informed him that Grand General Tage was to be demoted, and that command of the Executor and its fleet would be transferred to the Dark Lord. The Emperor then left his apprentice to educate his subordinates of his new era. Vader then executed Tage and ordered Admiral Kendall Ozzel to have the ship ready in two weeks. Vader then thought of his son, content that he would soon have him, slaying the unworthy. After the rebellion began encroaching in the mid-rim, the Emperor let Vader loose, deciding that incompetence at the highest level was to blame for the Death Star's destruction, allowing him to kill Imperial officials, including Moff Kuvern and Minister Kempt. Skirmish on the Skorka Retreat some time later, Aphra had begun an auction of a large kyber crystal with the conscience of an ancient Jedi named Rur on the Sorka retreat. However, Vader was contacted by 000 about the auction. The Sith Lord went there with haste, but found the auction had turned into a massacre orchestrated by 000. He had allowed a droid from the Cybin front to be taken over by the conscious kyber crystal, making it hunt down the factions on the space station. As Vader roamed the hallways, he found another Cybin front droid, who had noticed him and his stormtroopers moving about. The droid attempted to run, but Vader used the force to smash it to pieces. Vader ordered his troops to kill all of the individuals they found in the space station. As some of the stormtroopers crossed paths with the droid being controlled by Rur, Vader cut down a member of the Dominion of Azara. Some of his stormtroopers approached him, reporting resistance in the top dome and the droid. Vader walked down the halls and found a droid standing over a pile of dead stormtroopers. The droid had two blue lightsabers, generated from the kyber crystal inside of it, erected from its arms. The two declared themselves to each other and clashed. As they fought, Vader deduced that Rur was not a Sith. Rur claimed to be the last of the Ordu Aspectu and a Jedi. As they deduced more about each other, Vader force pushed Rur into a stone slab. Rur got up again, but Vader charged at him, and as they clashed, he cut the droid's right hand off. Vader force pushed him again into a wall, and he began laughing. He said that while his former organic body had limited him, he was now boundless, a god of machines. Rur therefore took control of the defensive guns in the ceiling and used them on Vader. Rur then tried to take control of Vader's suit and stalled his defensive moves. Vader told him that he was not the first to attempt 
that and used the force to repeatedly smash Rur against the walls. The collisions with the walls demolished the droid and Vader took the crystal. After the duel, a stormtrooper reported to Vader that some small ships had slipped his blockade. Vader told the trooper that the blockade was to remain. Vader took the crystal back to Sidious on Coruscant and then archived it with the rest of his master's collection. Tereen 7 after the death of Silo, Vader ordered Sergeant Creel and his Scar Squadron to hunt down Luke Skywalker. They eventually found him and his allies hijacking the Imperial-class Star Destroyer Harbinger. The vessel made its way to the blockaded planet Tereen 7 in an attempt to aid the people there. Vader and his TIE forces engaged the attacking Rebel X-Wings. While fighting the Rebel fighters, Vader questioned Creel if he had located Luke. At that moment, Creel was engaging the Rebel in a lightsaber duel. The Dark Lord then warned the Stormtrooper not to injure his prize. However, Luke used used the force to incapacitate Creel, much to Vader's anger. The rebels eventually were able to break the siege and give relief to the people of Tarine 7. Scar Squadron, however, was not left empty-handed, capturing the protocol droid C-3PO. Soon after, Vader was contacted by Creel and informed that C-3PO had told them everything they needed to know, and that they could not get him to stop talking. Vader then told him that the droid was a piece of worthless junk and to dispose of him. Shortly after, R2-D2 managed to infiltrate the Star Destroyer where C-3PO was held and broke the droid out. Vader was notified of this and intercepted their X-Wing in his TIE advanced. R2-D2 knew that they could not escape alone and set out a distress call for their friends. To Vader's frustration, R2-D2 gained the support of Luke, the Millennium Falcon, and the Volt Cobra, who gave enough covering fire to help them all escape, confronting Creel. Some time later, Vader approached Creel, who was training with half a dozen training droids. Vader told him that he could try all he wanted, but he would never become a Sith. Creel said that he was not asking to be, saying that it was not a Sith who saved him from the pits of Chagar 9, but the 501st Legion. He claimed to be a stormtrooper to the core and that he was just appreciating the value of a lightsaber. Vader then took his lightsaber and threatened to get rid of him and his squad for failing him aboard the Harbinger. Creel told Vader that if he failed him again, he would kneel down to Vader and bury that lightsaber in his chest himself after killing his men with it. Vader gave Creel a mission to destroy a possible rebel outpost on Horrocks 3, bringing back Luke if he was present. Vader then handed back Creel's lightsaber and told him to be worthy of it. Sidious then entered the room and summoned Vader. Creel knelt down in honor of Sidious' presence and he thanked him. Sidious then brought Vader out of the room. Creel then traveled to the Horrock system and destroyed the rebel outpost there, killing all rebels present, sculpting a trap. Some time later, Vader was at his castle with Admiral Kendall Ozzel and General Maximilian Beers. There he asked Ozzel of the excuses he had for the slowing progress of Imperial Project. Ozzel blamed the growing resistance, which although he could strike back, they were too spread out. Ozzel suggested that scrounging more worlds with constant bombardments of planets from Vader's new Death Squadron. Veers intervened at that point and came up with a theory. Veers claimed that the rebellion was like weeds and that the Empire was like a storm. Veers further pointed out that when a storm passes, weeds will bend and come out unharmed. He he said that it would be different if the rebellion was a tree, but Veers stated that until then the rebellion would slip through their fingers. This triggered a memory in Vader of when Leo Organa told Tarkin, the more you tighten your grip, the more star systems will slip through your fingers. Vader told his subordinates that Veers made an interesting point and concluded that it was what they should do. Vader traveled to Shutoran and approached Queen Trios in her meeting room. She was surprised at his arrival and assumed it was not on good terms. She pleaded that she had done nothing against him and that she had been a loyal servant. She told her guards to lower their weapons. Trios asked Vader how she could help him. Vader revealed his plans for her specialist to mine the ruins of Jedha. After she was to supply information to the rebels that would be sufficient to entirely sabotage the mining efforts. Finally, she had to infiltrate the rebellion which was trying to build a fleet and do everything she could to help them. Vader said to her that when they built their armada and before they hit it, he would show them how weak they truly were. Vader then threatened that he'd make Alderaan look like a dream to Shutoran if she tried anything. A Shutoran guard stepped forward and told Vader that he could not threaten Trios like that. That. Trios shot him as Vader was their honored guest. She then allowed Vader to kill the rest of the people in the room. Vader's Ambush to Vader's pleasure, Trios was successful in her mission, being able to earn Leia Organa's trust at Jedha and helping them prompt a mass mutiny of Bon Calamari merchant ships. As the rebels armed their new cruisers at the Makota space docks, she gave Vader the go-ahead to attack, telling him that they expected nothing. As the rebels prepared to scatter their new fleet, their hyperdrives failed to work, rendering the cruisers immobile from the system. Vader arrived soon after with the Death Squadron and Ozzel asked Vader if they should begin a bombardment. Vader told him to wait, saying he sensed their fear and that it was 
insufficient. He told Ozil to give them time to understand. As the rebel fighters prepared to deploy, they realized that not only were the hangar doors not opening, but neither were the defense turrets able to fire, or were their engines able to activate. This is because Organa had ensured that the cruisers were outfitted with Shu Toran technology, meaning Trios could sabotage them. The cruisers were useless against Vader's fleet, and Vader ordered the nearest cruiser be destroyed. The fleet subsequently fired on General Vanden Willard's flagship, Yavin's Hope, and destroyed it with ease, killing Willard. Ozil then asked Vader for the next target, and Vader said Hope. The Star Destroyers began engaging other Mon Calamari cruisers, and Trios attempted to get off the space docks on her ship. However, the rebel forces boarded the vessel, and she was forced to escape in an escape pod. The rebels discovered that they could get the cruiser's hangar doors to open by flying a ship towards it. Banduin Corps volunteered to do so and flew a shuttle towards the cruisers. The shuttle was reported to Vader, but the TIE fighters dealt with it before Vader could make any decisions. Vader's fleet soon destroyed another cruiser, sending it into a fireball. The Millennium Falcon soon arrived at the system, and Han Solo was told to attempt the same thing by Organa. Vader was notified of the Falcon's arrival and quickly went to his TIE advanced. Solo flew the Falcon through the fleet and took on TIEs before flying towards General Jen Dodonna's Republic. Vader then engaged the Falcon and hit the ship's stabilizer, sending it spiraling. Solo set it to manual, and Vader prepared to fire on the Falcon when it got back on course. Vader fired missiles at the Falcon as Solo attempted to land on Commander Lejai's cruiser. Vader forced Lejai's crew to abandon ship and ordered the Executor to destroy the escape pods. He continued to pursue the Falcon until his tie was disabled temporarily in a nearby asteroid field. Vader then ordered the Imperial fleet to close in on the Rebel fleet. After being informed that Trios was returned to the Executor, Vader returned to the ship where he intended to meet her. However, he learned that the Rebels had boarded by using Trios's shuttle. He pursued the Rebels until he found several led by General Davids Draven and killed them all. However, their mission was just to slow Vader down, and Vader force choked Draven. Vader caught up with Organa, but was unable to stop her from escaping the Executor via a TIE fighter. As one Rebel cruiser left, Vader ordered the Imperial fleet to destroy the remaining Rebel vessels. Vader continued to oversee the destruction of the remaining Rebel ships. Despite the return of a Rebel cruiser, Vader pushed the attack. The Rebel's capital ships were eventually able to retreat and disperse in order to reorganize. Vader informed the Emperor of the Rebels' defeat and assured him that the Rebels could never win, revealing the truth. By the time three years had passed after the Battle of Yavin, Vader was still in command of the Executor, under the Admiralty of Ozil, as well as its accompanying fleet Death Squadron. At Vader's request, Lieutenant Commander Sienna Ree was transferred from the Devastator to the Executor. Ree believed, however, that Vader's request had been more threat than reward, as she remained forever vulnerable to him for seeing him during Yavin's immediate aftermath. Obsessed with finding Luke, Vader dispatched thousands of Viper probe droids as Project Swarm, with the droids being sent into the far reaches of space in order to find his son. Among the archaeological consultants of the project was Dr. Afra, whom Vader had brought back into service after propaganda minister Patina Marmas Vur's failed plot to assassinate Emperor Palpatine. Afra's actions and subsequent escape from Vader on the planet Tython set back his attempts to find his son. Later, while the Executor and the rest of the Death Squadron were stationed in the Juris section, the flagship received a fragmented report from probe droid XJ9CS14, which had been sent to the Hoth system. Them. Although Admiral Ozil dismissed the news as a false lead, both Vader and Captain Firmus Piet agreed that they had found the rebel base. Vader then gave orders for the fleet to depart for the system. As the fleet came out of hyperspace near Hoth, Vader was informed by General Veers that orbital bombardment was impossible as an energy shield defended Echo Base. Vader guessed from this information that the Alliance knew of their presence because Ozil had made the fleet exit hyperspace too close to the system. After ordering Veers to prepare his troops for a ground assault, Vader executed Ozil for his incompetence and promoted Captain Piet to replace him as an admiral and had him deploy the fleet so that no rebel ship escaped the system. As the Imperial ground forces led by Veers engaged the Alliance, Vader led an assault troop into the rebel base and broke their lines, but they found it mostly deserted, for General Carlos Raikin had ordered its evacuation preemptively. Vader entered the base and soon ran into a group of rebels carrying their unconscious captain towards a hangar. They opened fire and Vader deflected their shots before leaping and cutting down a rebel trooper named Beak. Another trooper named Roha threw a grenade at Vader who used the force to deflect it. It knocked out their sergeant Hazram Namir and Roha was killed soon after. The last rebel was the former Imperial Governor of Hydoral Prime, a very chalice. She had been pursued by Imperial forces in the weeks following her defection and assumed Vader was there for her. Vader only asked her where Luke was and when a trooper told him that they had located the Millennium Falcon, he pushed her aside and marched in the direction of his target. Only the Millennium Falcon remained at the base's hangar, but the light freighter was able to escape before Vader could capture it. With the Alliance's 
forces on Hoth in complete retreat and the various transports scattered throughout the galaxy, Vader and his troops had secured a great victory for the Empire. Rather than pursuing the rebel transports which had gotten away, Vader redirected his Death Squadron's efforts to capturing the Millennium Falcon, which had evaded Imperial forces in the Hoth asteroid belt due to its faulty hyperdrive. Despite Piet's reservations, Vader ordered the fleet to pursue the ship into the asteroid field, and told the Executor's crew that he wanted the freighter towed aboard and its passengers taken alive. Even though the asteroids heavily damaged the Star Destroyers, Vader instructed every ship to sweep the field until the Falcon was found. Piet then informed him that the Emperor commanded him to make contact, and Vader had the Executor move out of the field to have clear transmission. Vader contacted his master. The Emperor told him that he sensed a new threat in the Force, Luke Skywalker, who he feared could destroy them if he ever became a Jedi, and that he was Anakin's son. Feigning shock at the Emperor's revelation, Vader believed Luke could be turned to the dark side and prove a powerful ally. Although the Emperor was doubtful, Vader assured him that Luke would join them or die. Determined to find his son before the Emperor, Vader summoned several bounty hunters, Four Lom, Bosk, Zuckus, Dengar, IG-88, and Boba Fett, to the Executor, and promised a substantial reward for the one who found the Falcon's crew alive. As he was briefing the hunters, Piet informed Vader that the Avenger was tracking the Falcon. Vader requested an update from the ship's commander, Captain Lorth Nida, who reported that he had lost the Falcon and assumed full responsibility for this. Vader accepted his apology with a fatal force choke and then ordered Piet to alert all commands of the Falcon's disappearance. Cloud City as the Falcon traveled through real space to try and repair its hyperdrive on Bespin, Fett tracked and predicted Solo's movements, but also contacted Vader, whose executor reached Bespin before the freighter. Along with a strike team comprising of only a few individuals, Vader left the executor for Cloud City, leaving its crew to do nothing but wait hidden. At the city, Vader contacted its Baron administrator Lando Calrissian, who happened to be Solo's friend, to make a deal. Calrissian, whose Tabana mining operation was keen to evade Imperial attention, agreed to help him capture the ship in exchange for them leaving his people and interests alone. When the Falcon arrived, Luke was not among them, but Vader knew he could use his friends to lure his son to Bespin. Escorted by Fett, Vader waited for Solo, Organa, Chewbacca, and Calrissian. Whilst waiting in the Renetta dining room, he was barged in upon by the Lepi smuggler Jackson T. Tumperaki, who quickly left after the Dark Lord and the Smuggler stared at each other. A team of stormtroopers were then dispatched to arrest Tumperaki. When the rebels arrived, Vader had them surrounded by stormtroopers, imprisoned, and in the case of Captain Solo, tortured. Much to Calrissian's displeasure, Vader altered their deal, agreeing to let Fett take Solo and collect Jabba's bounty on him. Afterward, he inspected one of the city's carbon-freezing chambers and deemed it adequate, if crude, to freeze Luke for his journey to the Emperor. But at the danger of it being fatal, he had the facility tested on Captain Solo. On his orders, Solo was frozen in Carbonite. As he survived, Vader handed Solo over to Fett and ordered Organa, Chewbacca, and C-3PO taken to his ship, while he awaited Luke at the facility. Once his son was separated from R2-D2 and made his way to the carbon freezing chamber, Vader appeared before him and the two dueled. Luke held his own for much of the duel, but he was ultimately no match for Vader. As they moved to a reactor shaft and a catwalk, Luke managed to cut Vader's shoulder, only for Vader to slice off his right hand, which, along with his old lightsaber, fell through the shaft. Vader beckoned Luke to join him in the dark side, but Luke vehemently refused. Used. Vader then told Luke that Kenobi had hidden from him the truth about his father, Anakin Skywalker, before revealing that he was, in fact, his father. Luke refused to believe the truth, but Vader continued to tempt his weakened son, offering Luke a chance to destroy the Emperor and bring order to the galaxy, just as he had tried to do with Padme on Mustafar. He even pleaded with his son to come with him, but Luke chose likely death by plunging into the shaft. While Luke was rescued by his friends on the Millennium Falcon, Vader returned to the Executor. As the freighter was unable to escape due to its activated hyperdrive, Vader and Piet waited for the Falcon to enter tractor beam range. During the pursuit, Vader reached out to Luke through the forest, telling him that it was his destiny to come with him, calling him son. Yet, the Falcon made the jump into hyperspace thanks to R2-D2 reactivating the hyperdrive. Although Piet feared Vader would kill him for his failure, Vader merely turned away from the viewport, not in anger, but in sadness. Upon learning that Vader had allowed Fett to take the carbon-frozen Solo back to Jabba, ISB agent Andressa Diva was frustrated that the smuggler would not be brought to Imperial Imperial imprisonment, although she also decided she had no position to question Vader's orders. Search for answers. Following the Falcon's escape, Vader took a shuttle and several death troopers and a forensics droid named Z-67 with him on a mission to learn who had hidden his son from him. After modifying Zed's motivator, he took the shuttle to Tatooine. There he met with Lieutenant Ardo Banch and his stormtroopers. Vader went onto the Lars Moisture Farm to search for clues about Skywalker's early life. Vader also reminisced about the attempted rescue of his mother and her funeral. Vader was informed by Lieutenant Banch of several transmissions, but came under attack by gangsters who wanted his shuttle. Vader and his 
his death troopers killed the gangsters before he took a shuttle to Coruscant and returned to Amidala's apartment. There, Z67 discovered that someone had planted a scout transmitter, which led to Vendaxa. At some point, Vader also returned to the Imperial Palace and met with Palpatine, who ordered him to hunt down the remnants of the rebel fleet while it was scattered, believing he may be the only officer in the Empire who could lead such a hunt despite it interrupting his quest to find his son. Unwilling to abandon that search, Vader instead proposed that they give the mission to Tarkin's protege, Elian Zara. Contacting her via hologram, Vader granted her permission to return to active duty to try and redeem herself for a past failure under Tarkin, making it clear she had no room to fail him and the Emperor. Shortly after the Falcon's escape and its vital role at the battle at Rendezvous Point Delta III, Vader chastised Zara for attempting to destroy the vessel during the engagement, stating that while Leia Organa would be an acceptable casualty, another passenger was of value to him. Vader further threatened consequence to Zara should she report further of partial success before dismissing her. Before journeying to Vendaxa, the Sith Lord traveled to a cantina and confronted a man who claimed to be his son, Luke Skywalker. Vader quickly found out that the man was a liar, telling him it did not matter who the man was, because by tomorrow, no one would remember that he ever lived. Vader then killed the imposter and told the people who were about to hire him that he would let them live. That way, they could be witnesses for what the man had done. The Sith then stated that whoever claimed the name of Luke Skywalker would also claim the crimes that he had committed against the Empire. After leaving the cantina, Vader admonished the Imperial officer who had given him the information on the alleged Luke Skywalker, telling him his information was worthless and that he simply wasted his time. When Luke Skywalker met Verla on Sorelia, she told him about Order 66 and the Imperial Inquisitors, describing Vader as pure, true evil. Shortly thereafter, she discovered through the Force that Vader was Luke's father, but Skywalker proved to her that he was not like his forebearer. Before Vader continued his personal mission, he felt through the Force during a conversation with Zara that a trap he had placed within a Jedi outpost on Tempest had been activated. He ordered his pilot to set course for Tempest, but when he arrived there, he found nothing but the spirit of the Grand Inquisitor, who had been recently defeated by Luke Skywalker. When asked by the Grand Inquisitor if he would ever be freed from Vader's service, the Sith Lord refused to do so, saying that the Inquisitor was merely a tool for him. Vader then abandoned his cursed servant, who was slowly engulfed by the ghostly flames around his body. Upon arriving on Vendaxa, Vader was confronted by Padme Amidala. Amidala, revealed to be former Naboo royal handmaiden Sabe, was briefly choked by Vader before they came under attack by several Vendaxan land squids. Together, they eliminated the squids, allowing Sabe to give her slain soldiers a proper burial. Sabe also revealed her true motives, to investigate the death of her former queen. Vader agreed to assist her in the mission so long as she obeyed him. Following Sabe's guidance, Vader returned to the planet Naboo to retrieve security recordings stolen from Amidala's quarters on Coruscant. Upon entering the Naberi Lake retreat, they were met by Gregar Typho and Tonra, who agreed to help them retrieve these stolen recordings. Taking a submarine, the four of them left for the recording's location, while Sabe expressed regret at her inability to save either her queen or Anakin Skywalker's mother. After surviving an attack by a Coloclaw fish, they reached their destination and found the recordings, which showed Sabe forming the Amidalans and swearing to find and destroy their queen's murderers. She then accused Vader of murdering Amidala himself, to which Vader said he did before attacking the Amidalans. However, the fight was quickly interrupted by a Sando Aqua monster, which attacked Vader and allowed the Amidalans to escape. After slaying the monster along with his death troopers, Vader found the rest of the Amidalans in the jungles of Naboo, where they were led into battle by Rick Oli. In the battle at Padme's tomb, Vader and his death troopers then exterminated most of the Amidalans and incapacitated Oli before moving on to their next location, the tomb of Padme Amidala. Before they could enter the tomb, they were surrounded by Sabe and the rest of the Amidala's surviving handmaidens. The handmaidens fought bravely but were easily defeated by Vader, who then opened the door to Amidala's tomb. Despite Sabe's protests, Vader proceeded into the tomb and allowed Z67 to scan Amidala's sarcophagus. The droid then discovered a med implant, which he traced back to the asteroid field Polis Massa. Upon reaching the asteroid field, they entered the Polis Massa base and uncovered data that Amidala had been flown to the base by Obi-Wan Kenobi in an effort to save her life. However, Vader and his forces were then attacked once more by the Amidalans, whom he managed to defeat once and for all. Along with Z-67, Vader entered the base's maternity ward and allowed the droid to access the memory bank of a damaged Kroon Tan B machine. He then watched a recording of Amidala speaking with Kenobi in the final moments of life. When Z-67 commented that Kenobi must have been important to her, Vader promptly destroyed the droid in 1 30th of a second. The recording then ended with Amidala stating that she knew there was still good in Vader, leaving the Sith to mull over his wife's last words. Test on Mustafar 
After learning of Vader's personal mission, the Emperor summoned his apprentice to the Imperial Palace, where he sensed his apprentice was filled with mourning instead of hate. Intending to reteach him the dark side, Sidious began to torture him with Force Lightning. Vader fought back against his master, but was overwhelmed again by two royal guards led by Masa Meta. While Vader did manage to choke the three of them with the Force, he in turn was then choked by the Emperor, who mocked the Jedi title of Chosen One before telling Vader to forget everything from his past and ravaging his body, leaving him with only one of his hands intact. The Emperor Emperor then brought his apprentice to Mustafar and left him on the very shore where Kenobi left him at the end of their duel. The Emperor instructed Vader to rebuild himself without using the Force before leaving with Masameta. Remembering how Kenobi had left him on the same shore and how he later cut the Jedi Master down on the Death Star, then picturing Sidious in Kenobi's place in the latter's memory, Vader resolved to crawl from the shore towards the facility where he murdered the Separatist leaders years before, remembering the time his Master had sent him to the base to wipe out the Separatist leadership, promising himself that he would bring suffering to the Emperor when he recovered and spotting a figure laughing at him in the distance, he entered the base, and after spotting the corpse of Newt Gunray and remembering his actions against the Separatists and Jedi younglings alike, found a few mouse droids, which he had rewired to weld old battle droid limbs to his body. However, he was then confronted by the figure he had seen, Ochi of Bastoon, a Sith assassin sent by the Emperor to test his apprentice. With his new limbs, Vader fought the assassin and bested him. He then demanded to know what his master's greater plan was before being interrupted by a distant voice. Vader followed the voice into a cave, which Ochi trapped him inside of after stealing his lightsaber. As Vader fought his way through the cave, the voice taunted him with riddles about what he wanted and who he truly was. Eventually, Vader reached the source of the voice, an ancient being known as the Eye of Webbish Bog. Vader demanded the answers to his questions about his master, to which the Eye granted him a Sith Wayfinder. After leaving the cave, Vader came upon an old Jedi Interceptor, where he was then met by Ochi and his droid crush pirates. While fighting off the pirates, Vader cornered Ochi and knocked him out before reclaiming his lightsaber. He then finished off the pirates and used their parts to repair the damaged interceptor. Once the ship was repaired, Vader used the now captured Ochi to access the Wayfinder, which showed the way to the planet called Exegol. With Ochi trapped in a capsule beneath the ship, Vader flew the interceptor away from Mustafar and used a hyperspace transport ring to journey towards his next location. Finding Exegol after exiting hyperspace, Vader and Ochi found themselves in the Red Honeycomb Zone as the Sith attempted to locate Exegol. However, they were then met by a massive tentacled spacefaring creature related to the Summa Verminoth. Before Vader could react, he was attacked by a fleet of Star Destroyers, led by Sly Moore and Admiral Korlak. Vader fought against the fleet's TIE Fighters until he had an idea. Changing his course, he flew towards the massive creature and allowed the TIE Fighters to follow until they were crushed by the creature's tentacles. As Vader flew past the creature, Moore warned him that it would break his mind. Ignoring the Umbaran's warning, he continued on until he and Ochi were both hit by mental attacks. Vader experienced several traumatic visions from his past, which concluded with a vision of his son killing him in battle and taking his place by the Emperor's side. Upon escaping the Red Nebula, Vader finally reached the planet Exegol, where he and Ochi promptly crashed. Breaking free from the wrecked Interceptor, they were both met once again by the creature. But this time, however, Vader did not run away. Disobeying his master's command, he reached out with the dark side and used it to bring the creature down, thus allowing him and Ochi to continue on towards the Emperor's Sith Citadel. Standing atop the creature, Vader commanded his master to show himself. Once he did, Vader rode the creature into battle. In turn, the Emperor summoned two crustaceous monsters to attack the creature, though they were both quickly crushed. When Vader told his master that he was no longer his apprentice, the Emperor merely scoffed and reached out with the Force himself, twisting and contorting the creature until it broke apart. Forced to return to ground level, Vader followed the Emperor into the Citadel, where his greatest secrets lie in wait. Once inside, Vader was greeted by a menagerie of horrors for forged by his master. All around him were large vats containing bioengineered organisms strong in the dark side of the Force. Along with these organisms were large Sith statues, dozens of Sith guards, Sith cultists, and a jar containing the severed hand of Vader's son. Vader was quickly attacked by the guards and cultists, but he managed to defeat them all before venturing further into the Citadel. Ochi caught up with Vader and attempted to dissuade him, but the Sith carried on until he reached a level beneath the Citadel. This level was lined with hundreds of Star Destroyers, each armed with a planet-destroying cannon. Showing no fear, Vader continued on into a massive chamber, which held a dome filled with red light and piercing screams. As Ochi tried to dissuade him once more, the Sith entered the dome and stepped into the burning light. Within the dome was a subterranean mountain of kyber crystal, bled red by the Sith cultists who kept it in constant pain. The Emperor explained that he did this in order to power the cannons of his fleet. When the crystal was cut, it screamed in pain again and sent out a wave of power, knocking off Ochi's helmet and burning his unprotected eyes. Vader suffered as well while his master 
mocked him for attempting to claim his power. The emperor told his apprentice that if he chose to walk with him, he would never escape his pain, but only by walking with him would he be able to share his power. The emperor then asked his apprentice if he had chosen, to which Darth Vader replied that Sidious was his master. Even though he experienced a vision in which Luke Skywalker told him that he would one day kill the emperor, Vader had seen the power Sidious commanded on Exegol, so he fully decided to return to his master's service, departing Exegol with Sidious, Ochi, Masa Meta, and Sly Moore, hunting Luke Skywalker. Upon returning to Coruscant, Vader was brought into the very building where he had been transformed to undergo repairs. A medical droid told him to prepare for shutdown, but Vader refused, choosing instead to remain conscious throughout the procedure. Once he was fully repaired, Vader asked the Emperor his will, to which his master told him to decide that for himself. Vader then called over Ochi, who had been given a cybernetic visor so he could continue to see. With Ochi at his side, Vader left Coruscant in a Lambda-class shuttle and decided that he would hunt down and kill his own son, believing that there was no place for him as an apprentice after the power he had seen in Exegol. Traveling to a remote outpost somewhere in the Outer Rim, Vader and Ochi met with a hut named Baku. When Ochi asked for the whereabouts of Han Solo, Baku reported that he'd been stolen and assured the assassin that Jabba would recover him. However, Ochi then told Baku that he would recover Solo himself in exchange for power. Baku then asked Ochi if he served the Emperor, to which Ochi replied that they both served Vader now. Vader was then attacked by a group of Gamorrean guards, which the Sith Lord slew with ease. Baku quickly apologized for not recognizing Vader and reiterated that he did not know where Solo was. From this, Oji determined that Jabba had likely hired someone to find Solo and asked Baku for their identity. Baku expressed fear at the idea of betraying Jabba until Ochi pried into Baku's willingness to take over the Grand Hut Council. Baku then revealed that he had been tracking the hunters who'd taken Jabba's bounty, and that one of the droids had gone in a different direction from the others. Baku told Vader that the droids were deep in the heart of Hut space, and that it would be better to go in Baku's barge as to not scare them away. On their way to the droid's location, Baku inquired as to his compensation for his assistance, to which Vader assured him that he would be rewarded. Under the piloting of Baku's nav droid, Gak-62, they arrived at Z-97, while Vader and Achi boarded their Lambda shuttle, but as they approached the city, their ship's engines were shut down, causing them to crash. After escaping the wreckage, Vader and Achi were confronted by the droid crush pirate, who expressed shock at Ochi's service to Vader. When Ochi claimed he had picked the winning side, the droid captain told him he had picked wrong as IG-88 revealed himself and fired upon both Ochi and Vader. As Vader deflected IG-88, its attacks, the droid reminded his target that he had sustained damage while IG-88 himself had not. Vader informed the droid that he had information he required and commanded him to lay down his weapons, to which IG-88 replied that Vader would only access his information by downloading it from his severed head. Vader went to attack IG-88, but then the droid took out a remote and used it to slice into Vader's armor, taking control of the Sith Lord. As IG-88 forced Vader to hold his own saber to his head, Vader demanded to know who had given the droid the code to breach his armor. IG-88 responded that the terms of his employment prevented him from sharing that information. While the droid was distracted, Vader used the force to take the device from him, allowing him to use it against his attacker. Vader then forced IG-88 to hold his own blaster to his head and pull the trigger, incapacitating him. Vader then continued his fight against the pirates until Baku's barge fired upon him. Vader blocked the blasts with his lightsaber and redirected the energy at the pirates, knocking them back along with Ochi. As the pirates retreated, Vader took IG-88's hand and used it to access a terminal he'd been using earlier. Upon activating the terminal, Vader and Ochi discovered various dead ends that the droid had been chasing as well as the symbol of Crime Syndicate Crimson Dawn. After acquiring IG-88's information, Vader returned to Baku's barge and confronted him over his betrayal. When Vader asked the hut what he had learned, Baku conceded that the Sith Lord could not be defeated. Pursuing Crimson Dawn Investigating Crimson Dawn's involvement, Vader sent Ochi to Arcanus to gather more information on the Syndicate. As Ochi prepared to sneak into a bar, Vader then told him to walk in the front door instead. After a brief scuffle, Ochi retrieved an invitation sent out by the Syndicate and showed it to Vader. He and Vader then returned to Baku's lair to interrogate him over the invitation. The hut revealed that Crimson Dawn was holding an auction for Solo and that Jabba would repurchase him. However, Vader told Baku that he would bid against Jabba and lose. This would humiliate him and make Jabba lose all fear of him, allowing Baku to betray him. Once Baku agreed, Vader and Ochi returned to the Lambda-class shuttle and began to take off. But before they could leave, Vader grabbed Ochi and dropped him from the ship. Once Ochi hit the ground, Vader ordered him to find out who else Baku was working for. Later that night, Vader observed as Ochi was offered a place in Crimson Dawn by a group of assassins. However, Ochi rejected their offer and managed to eliminate them. Vader then approached Ochi, who quickly realized that Vader already knew that Baku was working with Crimson Dawn. He had only wished to test Ochi's loyalty. As more assassins surrounded them, Ochi reaffirmed that he would always obey Vader as long as he remained the most powerful. 
powerful. Vader assured him that he always would be, as the two of them set about eliminating the assassins. After discovering that Sly Moore had hired IG-88, Vader and Ochi returned to Coruscant to find her, her court, and the rebuilt droid bounty hunter in Administrative Temple Garden 313A. As Vader struck down IG-88 once more, Moore and her court fled to a nearby temple. As they attempted to escape into the streets, Vader used the Force to close the door in front of them. However, Moore then took out another remote and used it to freeze Vader in his own armor, allowing her and her court to open fire on the Sith Lord. But this did not last, as Vader overcame the Umbaran's control and struck down her entire court. Moore tried once more to take control of Vader, but Ochi revealed that Vader had fixed the vulnerability in his armor. Vader then knocked the remote out of Moore's hand and told her that she could not bend his will. Moore responded that she only wanted to see if Vader was still plagued by fear, to which Vader said the only fear in that place was hers. Moore conceded that he could kill her effortlessly, but also pointed out that doing so would do nothing to save him from Luke Skywalker. When Vader asked the Umbaran what she knew of Skywalker, she stated that the key to finding him, his friend Han Solo, was currently being held by Crimson Dawn. She also pointed out that if she secured Solo for Vader, then the Emperor would not learn of his plans. When Ochi asked Moore why Vader should trust her, the Umbaran answered that she would be delighted to reunite Vader with the only person who could kill him, to which Vader agreed. Auction for Han Solo Shortly after, Ochi and Sly Moore left with a few Imperial officers to attend the auction for Han Solo. However, this was merely a ruse to humiliate the Umbaran in the Emperor's eyes. Amidst the bidding, Vader himself arrived at the auction on Jakara along with a pair of Death Troopers. After cutting down a few Crimson Dawn guards, Vader infiltrated the Vermilion just as Crimson Dawn's leader, Lady Kira, sold Solo to Jabba the Hutt. Vader then declared that Solo belonged to him. Vader's presence sent Dr. Afra, who had infiltrated the auction on behalf of the Tage Corporation, with the smuggler Sana. Staros falling to the ground in a brief panic attack, but she managed to escape the room with Staros before the preoccupied Sith Lord could spot her. After his attention was briefly diverted to the sounds of Aphra's panicked fall, he turned his attention back to his mission at hand. As Vader ordered the Death Troopers to transport Solo to his flagship, Jabba pointed out that he had already laid claim to the smuggler. Moore attempted to explain the situation, but Vader chastised her for her failure and warned her that the Emperor would hear of it. The Sith Lord then told Jabba that he and everyone else within the Empire belonged to the Emperor, to which Jabba feigned amusement. Vader went on to point out that the Empire could easily replace the huts, while also pointing out the fear he could sense in Jabba and the rest of the attending huts. When Baku angrily interrupted, Vader asked Jabba who he was, to which Jabba said he was no one. Jabba then finally conceded and allowed Solo to be taken with his compliments and regards to the Emperor. As Vader approached Solo, Lady Kira informed him that she would not get in his way, but also still required the 1 million credits she was promised. When Vader told her she was owned nothing, Kira inquired if the Empire was too poor or cheap to pay its debts. Out of impatience, Vader drew his lightsaber, to which Kira bared her own pair of blades. As they dueled, Vader recognized that she was no threat to him, yet nonetheless found her level of skill, which included knowledge of the Tarascasi fighting form, noted and recognized Kira's fighting style as that of his masters. When Vader asked her who had trained her, Kira only replied that she'd been trained by someone who knew quite a bit about both Vader and his master. In truth, she'd been trained by Maul as part of his revenge plot against the Sith. Vader then pointed out that she did not have the Force and warned her that skill would not save her. After a brief struggle, Vader pushed Kira back with the Force, knocking her into Solo. Stating she would pay the price for her foolishness, he raised his lightsaber and prepared to strike her down. But he was suddenly distracted by the arrival of Luke Skywalker, whose presence he sensed through the Force. While Kira retreated, Vader was informed by General Ramadi that Piet had established a secure channel to Skywalker's Starfighter. Accessing the channel, Vader told Skywalker he had Solo in his possession. He then warned his son that if he did not come to him, then he would cut his friend in half. Skywalker refused, however, telling Vader to come to him. Vader conceded to this, ordering Ramadi to bring Solo aboard his Star Destroyer and to prepare his fighter. Chase above Jakara after boarding his TIE advanced, Vader took off in pursuit of his son. During the chase, Skywalker used his X-Wing to kick up a wave of water, which instantly froze and collided with Vader's fighter. Though Vader crashed, he was able to lift his ship out of the water with the Force and resume his pursuit. After freeing his X-Wing from a group of pirates, Vader fired at Skywalker, damaging one of his ship's stabilizers and causing him to crash back down into the planet below. As Vader closed in on Skywalker, he was contacted by Sly Moore. When Vader stated that he did not require her assistance, Moore informed him that she was not helping him. Vader was then attacked by the droid crush pirates who landed on his ship and began to tear it apart. After causing some damage to the Sith's fighter, the pirates fell onto Skywalker's X-Wing and quickly repaired it for him, allowing him to take off from the planet. As Vader continued his chase while fending off the pirate, he was informed by Ochi that the Huts were going after the Imperial shuttle, transporting Solo. Vader was then contacted by Admiral Piet, who informed him of the Huts' attack on the Executor. However, Vader chastised Piet for disturbing him, claiming that the activities of the Huts were irrelevant to him. He then warned Piet that if Solo was not aboard his flagship by the time he returned, 
confirmed he would require an explanation in person. Later in the fight, Piet contacted Vader again and told him he had appraised the Emperor of the situation. Since the Emperor considered the Empire's arrangement with the Huts to be valuable, he wished for it to be preserved by having Vader eliminate the Grand Hut Council. Vader conceded to the Emperor's wishes and abandoned his pursuit of Skywalker, reminding his son that he was no Jedi, though the boy then claimed that the next time that they met, he would be. Vader then boarded the Hut Council's ship and summarily slaughtered them all, including Baku. Before his death, Baku revealed his allegiance to Crimson Dawn and had Gak-6-2 blow up their own ship in an attempt to kill Vader, which the Sith survive. With the Hut Council eliminated, the Huts ceased their attack on the Executor while Fett reclaimed Solo from the Empire and delivered him to Jabba on Tatooine. Shortly after, Vader was informed by Lieutenant Jyla Hayden that Baylert Valence had infiltrated the Executor. He then found Valence trying to escape on a ship and used the Force to pull him from space, rendering him unconscious and taking him prisoner. Killing the Dawn with the huts dealt with, Vader returned to the Executor to confront Sly Moor, who had been captured by Ochi during the battle. When Moor claimed that the Emperor had wanted Skywalker alive, Vader revealed that the boy had fled from him, showing that he was not who the Emperor believed he could be. When Moor pointed out that Skywalker was still free and still could fight, the Sith Lord choked her and stated that his hope would not be enough. Vader was then contacted by Darth Sidious, prompting him to release the Umbaran and kneel before him. After restating his loyalty to his master, Vader was instructed by Sidious to hunt down and eliminate Crimson Dawn's agents within the Empire. Shortly after, Vader was met on the Executor by Ramadi, who presented him with all the troops he would need to destroy Crimson Dawn. Vader then instructed Ochi to meet with the League and informed them that they would be serving him now. Following Ochi's departure, Vader had Valence repaired and waited for him to awaken. Once he did, he was shocked to find him restored to his former appearance. When Valence asked Vader what he had done to him, Vader explained that he had Valence fixed since he would now be serving him. Valence then realized that his heart was gone, to which the Sith informed him that it had been removed and replaced with cybernetics, along with further upgrades to his body. Valence attacked Vader, but Vader cut him in half before leaving him and telling a medical droid to put him back together. Once Valence was repaired, Vader, alongside Hayden, informed him that he would be assassinating Crimson Dawn's agents within the Empire, for if he did not, the Empire would kill those he cared about. Afterwards, Vader left with Ochi to assist the Empire in hunting down Crimson Dawn agents on various planets, including Vincorba and Kalior. While on Vincorba, they fought alongside a group of mercenaries known as the Revengers. With Vader's crew established, Ochi commented that they would serve well as expendable assets, to which Vader reminded him that he was expendable as well. While he meditated aboard the Executor, Vader was informed by Hayden that Valence had completed his first assignment in killing the alleged Crimson Dawn Mole, Tarl Sokoli. Vader then revealed that there was no connection between Sokoli and Crimson Dawn. Sokoli had been publicly dissatisfied with the Empire, and Vader had decided that killing someone from Valence's childhood would be a good test for the bounty hunter. The Sith then told Hayden to alert Ochi that Valence was ready to join them. After finishing on Kalior, Vader, Ochi, and the Revengers rendezvoused with Valence and a few other assassins on Lakor to continue their hunt. When Valence asked Vader why he was there instead of leading Dark Squadron, the Sith Lord simply told him to do what he was told. As a squad of stormtroopers attempted to move a group of civilians, the civilians refused to comply, prompting the stormtroopers to fire on them. However, Vader then jumped in to deflect their blaster bolts and slaughtered them. When Ochi showed confusion over his master's actions, Vader revealed the stormtroopers served Crimson Dawn. As the group carried on, Vader came upon a statue, which the locals said was their village guardian who was killed fighting Crimson Dawn. Upon locating more of the Dawn's agents, Ochi opted to use the Revengers as bait to lure them out of their stronghold. Vader then used the Force to grab Ochi and throw him towards the Revenger, using him as bait as well. As the agents surrounded them, Ochi requested that Vader bomb the stronghold, but Vader refused and instead mounted G90, balancing himself atop the droid as they rolled themselves to the stronghold's front entrance. Vader then stormed the stronghold along with Ochi, who the Sith stopped from killing all the agents inside. When Ochi expressed more confusion, Vader explained that Crimson Dawn was just a symptom and that he would destroy the disease. He then discovered a layout of every Dawn agent agent within the Empire, which Ochi and Valence noted went all the way to the top. Following this, Vader and his followers returned to Coruscant. Valence, the Assassins, and the Revengers left for the Zanchal Estate, while Vader and Ochi left for the Imperial Palace. Upon entering the palace, they struck down all of the royal guards and aides in the Emperor's throne room except for Sly Moor. Unfazed by this, Sidious pointed out Vader should have kept one of them alive for questioning. When Vader asked him if they were loyal, Sidious said they were loyal to strength, which Vader showed them. However, only one of them was Crimson Dawn, meaning that Vader's list was flawed. When Sidious questioned if his apprentice already knew that, Vader hesitated before assuring his master that he would bring him order. Vader and Ochi then left for the Zanchal estate to confront Baron Espis Zanchal for his loyalty to the Dawn. Upon arriving, Vader was thanked by a pair of hostages who the Revengers had rescued from the Baron. As he returned to his shuttle, Vader informed Ochi that the list was a plant, which Vader himself had deduced when Ochi could only confirm that half of the names on it were Crimson Dawn. Vader told Ochi to find out what connected every other person on the list. That way, they could find out who planted it and why. Hidden Enemy 
Later on the Executor, Vader was informed by Ochi that Ramadi and his soldiers were not Crimson Dawn after all. However, Ochi warned him that Ramadi did not understand the Sith and would come for Vader anyway. Stepping out of his chamber, Vader asked Ochi what connected the false names on the list. Ochi revealed that they had all undertaken a mission for Ramadi to assassinate the Amidalans on Naboo. Following this development, Vader and his team of assassins traveled to Tranchar to capture and interrogate Lieutenant Grappa about the mission. After fighting their way through stormtroopers and sentry droids, the assassins discovered civilians being tortured by the Imperials. G90 broke from the mission to free civilians, prompting Vader to destroy the droid as punishment. Vader went on to interrogate Grappa about her mission to kill the Amidalans. As she claimed to Vader that they were all dead, Tanka blasted her in the head for revenge. Vader then realized that the Imperials had known they were coming. When Vader asked Valence who sent the droids, Valence responded that they were from Ramadi's command. Vader then remembered that Ochi had spoken with Ramadi prior to their departure. When he confronted Ochi with this fact, Ochi tried to stammer out an explanation before giving up and running away while Valence fired at him. After landing in front of Ochi and meeting him on the ground, Vader commended him for leading him to Sabe, which Ochi went along with and claimed it to have been his plan all along. As Vader confronted Sabe, he took her Crimson Dawn badge from her and claimed that he was the Dawn. Recruiting Sabe Following this, Vader took Ochi, Sabe, and Z67 to the carcass of the Sando Aqua monster he had slain. He then threw Ochi and Sabe out of the shuttle and watched as they were attacked by a pack of ravenous creatures. Ochi attempted to assure Vader of his loyalty, but Vader silenced him and asked Sabe if she believed in Crimson Dawn. As she defended herself, she said that she merely infiltrated the Syndicate. Ochi fought alongside her and claimed that he had done the same for the Empire. When Vader asked Sabe if she also intended to serve the Empire, Sabe said that she did not as long as the Empire served chaos. Sabe went on to claim that she and Vader wanted the same thing, order. To this, Vader levitated the creatures with the force and told Sabe that if she killed one monster, a thousand more would replace it. He then explained that one would either have to make the monsters agree or deal with them all. With that, Vader threw the creatures at a group of long-necked beasts as they sprouted from the ground. Understanding Vader's plan, Sabe brought him to a Crimson Dawn outpost while Ochi returned to the Executor to speak with Ramadi. Upon arriving at the outpost, Sabe informed the Donners that they served Vader now. To this, the Donners attacked Vader and were easily cut down by the Sith Lord. Vader then had Ochi use Valence and the Assassins as bait to draw the remaining Donners and Ramadi's forces to Oro Sankaria. As the Donners and Imperials fought one another, they were suddenly wiped out by a pulse bomb, thus eliminating many of Vader's enemies. Vader informed Sabe that Crimson Dawn and Ramadi feared him now. When he asked Sabe if she was scared, Sabe asked him why she'd be scared of his true self, Anakin Skywalker. Vader responded that Anakin Skywalker was dead, but Sabe revealed that she had deduced Vader's identity from his obsession with Order, his investigation into Padme's death, and Padme's final words at Polis Massa. When Vader drew his lightsaber and asked Sabe what she wanted, she claimed she wanted to help him achieve order. She went on to explain that when Skywalker never returned to Tatooine to free his mother, she and Tanra secretly worked in her honor to free enslaved people and smuggle them from Tatooine to a colony on Gabrador 3. Now the colony was being exploited and neglected by the corrupt governor Tantaza, who was in league with the Crimson Dawn. Sabe told Vader that if he helped her save the refugees, he would get the chance to destroy another Crimson Dawn cell and prove that Padme was right about this. To this, Vader withdrew his lightsaber and accepted Sabe's proposal. He then warned her that she alone was responsible for where her path took her before they silently boarded the shuttle and left for Gabrador 3. Fam familiar Faces as they approached the planet, they were met by Tantaza's flagship. When Vader asked Z67 if the ship's crew had detected them, the droid said they had not yet. Vader then told him to take him to the planet's surface. Sabe suggested summoning the Executor, but Vader said they would first visit the colony and see if she was telling the truth. Once they landed at the colony, they stepped out of the ship as Z67 introduced Vader to the refugees and asked to see their protocol droid. Since their protocol droid had long since broken down, Z67 instead spoke with their astromech droid M7B. The droid and two of the refugees then confirmed Sabe's story. The pair of refugees then showed off a terrestrial vehicle they had built, inspired by their earlier lives on Tatooine. When Vader asked the refugees for their names, they introduced themselves as Kitster and Wald, Skywalker's childhood friends. When Kitster asked Vader if they could do anything for him, Vader told them they could do nothing. He then sensed that the surrounding land was disturbed, to which Z67 explained that it was currently suffering from drought. When another refugee claimed things would get better once the clouds came back, Vader said they would only get worse, as they were attacked by a pack of clawed beasts. While Vader and Sabe fought off the creatures, a few of them surrounded Kitster and Wald. Vader then leapt in and cut them down, saving the refugees. Kitster thanked Vader as the Sith Lord silently walked away. Sabe then asked Vader if he had seen enough and told him it was time to take out Tantaza. However, Vader told Sabe she was not ready, since the refugees had ignored her order to stay back and put themselves in danger. He then told her if she wanted them to live, they would have to obey her. Afterwards, Vader had Sabe don a set of Imperial equipment and recruited her into the Imperial military under the rank of Lieutenant Commander, granting her authority over all the forces he 
gathered. He then ordered an Imperial officer to open a channel to the Executor. When the officer reported that Tontaza's ship was blocking their communications, Vader ordered for his shuttle to be prepared. He and his team then traveled to the Governor's facility and proceeded to fight their way towards the Governor. After cutting down a few repurposed battle droids, Vader was confronted by Tontaza, who briefly subdued the Sith Lord with a life-draining weapon. Vader's team was then attacked by more battle droids and a few Crimson Dawn assassins. Once Vader recovered, he force-choked Ochi for allowing the Governor to escape. Ochi explained that he was assisting Vader, to which Vader asked Ochi if he thought that Tontaza's weapon could destroy him. Sabe then told Vader that it might have, prompting Vader to release Ochi and meet with one of the weapon's designers, Dr. Ira. Ira explained that the technology had been used to raise the planet Carolina, and expressed remorse over not having known what the technology would be used for. As Sabe reassured the rest of the regretful designers, Vader seized Ochi's speeder and left to find the governor. Catching up to Tontaza and her escorts, Vader blocked a blast from one of her battle droids before reaching her at her escape ship. As the ship took off, Vader used the force to hold it and destroy its interior controls. However, the ship's powerful engines ultimately allowed the governor to make her escape. Using a pair of Imperials as a diversion, Vader boarded Tontaza's flagship and fought off more battle droids and Imperials before confronting the one in charge. When Vader asked where Tontaza was, the Imperial claimed that there had been a misunderstanding and recommended that the Sith reconsider his hostile stance. Vader then had the ship's crew open a channel to his own ship and ordered Piet to lock onto the governor's flagship. After giving Piet the order to destroy the ship unless countermanded, Vader asked the Imperial again for the governor's location. Upon learning the location, Vader returned to his shuttle and flew toward the facility where she was hiding, only to be met by a sandstorm generated by the facility. Despite the pilot's warnings, Vader told them to continue approaching the facility while he held the ship together with the force. A lightning bolt then struck the ship, causing it to crash into the forest. Once Vader stepped out of the wreckage, he was met by Ochi, who he asked for Sabe's location. Ochi reported that the storm had taken her, and a colonist claimed that the storm would kill them all. When Vader asked the colonist if they had any ship, he said that the only ship that had not been confiscated or destroyed was Kitster's racer. When the colonist said that only Kitster could drive it, Vader said that they would see as he approached the racer. Z67 told Vader that he could not trace Sabe or the other colonists, to which Vader told the droid that he would command his assistance if he required it. Faced with numerous flashbacks to his past, Vader then boarded the racer and sped off into the storm. While deflecting debris with his lightsaber, Vader located Kitster on the ground alongside a large tank. Landing next to him, Vader asked Kitster where Sabe was. Kitster explained that she was trapped beneath the tank and that he had been trying to move it. Once Vader lifted the tank off Sabe, the three of them were overwhelmed by the surrounding storm. Vader then contacted Piet and ordered him to have the Executor fire on his location. When Piet warned him that he would incinerate everyone and everything within range, Vader choked him with the Force, prompting him to open fire. The resulting bombardment destroyed the tank and dissipated the storm. After cutting himself out from the remains of the tank, Vader took Sabe from Kitster and carried her into the distance. Eventually, the three of them returned to the colonists, and Vader ordered Piet to open fire on Tantaza's facility. However, the blasts were deflected by a shield, which Z67 explained was drawing energy from the planet. Despite Ochi's doubts, Vader remained certain the fortress possessed a weakness, and when Z67 revealed that the facility's underside was unshielded, took M7B with him to the facility. While he defeated more monsters on his way there, Vader placed his lightsaber within the Astromex dome. Once they arrived at the facility, he had the droid fire the lightsaber upwards into the unshielded underbelly. Vader then used the force to guide the lightsaber through the facility, disabling the weapon and carving an entrance for himself. With the shield down, Vader entered the facility and struck down Tantaza's soldiers. However, he was then met by Tantaza herself, wearing a suit of powerful armor. Tantaza used the suit's arm cannon to fire at Vader. As he blocked the beam with his lightsaber, Vader told the government she could not contain the power she was wielding. To this, Tantaza accused Vader of having no control over his own power before he destroyed her arm cannon. Tantaza then flew away as the facility exploded, leaving Vader severely injured without any power left in his suit. Sabe soon found Vader and begrudgingly restored his suit's power, allowing them to walk back to the colony. Once they returned, they learned from Z67 that Tantaza had been receiving her orders from the Emperor himself. When Vader asked Sabe why she was smiling, she said she now knew why she had saved him. Returning to his fortress, Vader healed in his back to tank, but broke it in anger upon remembering Sabe's words about the good still in him. Later, Vader boarded the Executor and was met by Valence, Hayden, and the Revengers. Vader chastised them for being early, to which Valence demanded to know why they were there. Vader then used the Force to fix Valence's collar, saying that he expected those who served him to be held to a certain standard. Hayden claimed that Valence had the team operating at peak efficiency. To this, Vader said they would get a chance to prove their loyalty and advise Valence to channel his energies into a less self-destructive manner. When Valence asked what their mission was, Piet explained that they had been selected to protect a medicine shipment to Bestine 4 from Crimson Dawn. Vader warned the mercenaries not to disappoint him as he would be watching before they left for their mission. Vader then met with Sabe and asked her about Tantaza's location. When she said Ochi was searching for the governor, Vader asked her what she advised they do. To this, Sabe told Vader he should do what he always did, 
directly confront the problem. Return to Skako Minor. Following Sabe's counsel, Vader and Sabe arrived at the Imperial Palace on Coruscant aboard a Lambda-class shuttle to confront Sidious. As the two were unexpected, one of Palpatine's advisors tried to stop the Dark Lord, but Vader only reacted by throwing the advisor against a wall before making his way to the Emperor's throne room. Although his two present royal guards pointed their force pikes at Vader, Sidious reacted by calmly asking Vader what his heart told him. Vader proceeded to hold Sabe in the air with the force as Sidious laughed and claimed to her that she had only reminded Vader, who was remembered moments of his past at the same time of his weakness. Dropping her, Vader refused to assist Sabe as the Emperor had his royal guards attempt to destroy her. Once she outwitted them in combat, Sidious killed the guards in anger and seeing her worth as an agent allowed Sabe to continue working with Vader. As they returned to their shuttle, Vader and Sabe were informed by Z67 of the next mission. Jewel Tambor, the grandson of Wat Tambor, was working to overthrow the pro-imperial regime on Skako Minor through a nationalist uprising. According to Imperial Intelligence, Tambor had also in listed pirates to blockade the planet and stockpile technology to be used against the Empire. As such, their mission was to end the Skakoans uprising and restore Imperial control over Skako Minor. In truth, Tambor had known that he would have to face Vader as part of his crusade. Over the course of the last six years, the Skakoan had worked to collect and reassemble droids who had been killed by Vader, thereby allowing him to analyze their databanks to study Vader's moves. Amongst the droids he reassembled were B1 battle droids, B2 super battle droids, and G90. Tambor was very confident that he would be able to kill Vader. Upon reaching the planet, Vader and Sabe discovered a crashed commercial transport from Corellia. Z-67 explained that the ship had been boarded and that those inside were killed off by the planet's poisonous atmosphere. As they traversed the terrain, Vader killed a pack of cliff worms, saving the group of pirates. He then noticed a pile of corpses on the ground. He struck down the pirates while Sabe hesitated and allowed one of them to escape. When Vader asked her if the pirates deserved mercy, Sabe admitted she didn't know who did anymore. Vader reminded her that she was now now his shadow, and she said they would need one of the pirates alive in order to locate Tambor. To this, Vader instructed Sabe to follow the surviving pirate and find Tambor while he took control of the rest. Vader then returned to the Executor and meditated, reflecting on Kenobi's words that only a Sith dealt in absolutes, and declaring that no one in the galaxy should forget his allegiance. Afterward, Vader had Piet summon Sabe, who had returned to the ship, and a pair of stormtroopers who had been openly speaking about their assignment. In truth, he had deduced that the woman was not Sabe, but another of Amidala's surviving handmaidens. When they arrived, Vader told her that the stormtroopers had failed her and asked her what she would do about it. The troopers ran for a blaster, but Sabe grabbed it and fired at them, gravely injuring them but leaving them alive. This confirmed Vader's suspicion that this was not Sabe and was instead another of Amidala's surviving handmaidens, Dorme. When Dorme claimed that Sabe wouldn't have killed them, Vader told Dorme she did not know Sabe at all. Upon realizing that Ochi had helped her get inside to get rid of Sabe, Vader threw Ochi into a wall and told Dorme that Sabe served him willingly. Dorme denied Vader's claim, saying that Sabe was the best of them. To this, Vader brought her to a hangar and told her that she would follow Sabe's lead by claiming the same power. When Ochi advised against this, Vader tossed him aside, saying he simply needed her to serve his purpose. Dorme stated once again that neither she nor Sabe would serve Vader. Vader then said they would see before he took her aboard a shuttle and brought her to Fidale. Shortly after, Dorme's fellow handmaidens, Erte, Sache, and Rabe Tonsort arrived on the planet. When Dorme insisted that they go after Sabe instead, the handmaidens told her they wouldn't leave her as they engaged Vader in combat. Despite their coordination, the handmaidens were subdued by Vader, who gave them one final chance to join him. However, Sache revealed that Erte had seized codes from Vader's suit during the fight, allowing the handmaidens to complete Dorme's sabotage of the Executor. Before they could destroy Vader's flagship, which would kill thousands in the name of rescuing Sabe and defeating Vader, Vader declared they were just as bloodthirsty as he needed them to be to join him. However, he was contacted by Piet, who showed him a transmission from Tambor. After arriving on the planet Brental 4, Sabe had confronted Tambor while he was out helping a village of exiled Skakoans, urging him not to go up against Vader and declaring that the Sith Lord had grown even more dangerous since her own failed efforts on Paulus Massa. She was certain that Tambor's efforts against Vader would fail and that the Sith Lord would slaughter the hundreds of Skakoans on Brentall 4 in retaliation. Unable to convince Tambor to call off his coming attack on the Skako Minor garrison, Sabe shot him above his heart, keeping him alive but allowing her to take him away to a ship controlled by her and Z-67. Aboard, Tambor listened to her reasoning about the danger Vader posed and declared that it was time to kill the Sith Lord, capturing Sabe after his rebuilt droids reached the starship. After showing Sabe video footage of Vader, Tambor sent his hologram to Vader, in which he revealed her capture and baited him to come after him. The Skakoan had come to believe that she was Vader's weakness, which would finally give him an advantage over the Dark Lord. On Fadale, realizing that they would need Vader and his forces to rescue her, the handmaidens reluctantly joined Vader to go after Tambor, much to Oji's annoyance. Corrupting Sabe 
Upon reaching Brentall 4, Vader reflected on his last meeting with Amidala on Mustafar and reflected on how he wished it had gone, declaring to himself that he would finally have his idealized outcome. On World, Vader and the Handmaidens were met by Moore, who explained to each of the Handmaidens how each could benefit from serving the Empire. Vader then told them submitting to Imperial service was the only way they would have order. As they said that they would only be loyal to each other, they were attacked by Tambor's battle drones, to which Vader picked them up with the Force and threw them into battle. While fighting their way to Tambor's hideout, the Handmaidens noticed that the droids were targeting the locals. While the Handmaidens demanded that Vader assist them in aiding the populace, Vader said that he would give the commands, but that he would lead them to victory. As the Handmaidens fought the droids, Vader used them as a distraction so he could move past their lines and confront Tambor. Once he found Tambor, he was met by a rebuilt G90, who released magnetic spheres that immobilized him. The Handmaidens then arrived and used their own magnetic devices to deactivate the spheres. While Tambor fled, the Handmaidens released Sabe from her cage and begged her to leave Vader's service. To this, Vader choked them with the Force and asked Sabe if she wanted to allow Tambor to escape and continue killing locals. Confronting Valence Upon learning that Valence had betrayed the Empire, Vader boarded the Righteous Fist and had Hayden accompany him as he approached the surface of Bestine 4 in his shuttle. Once they landed, Vader and Hayden confronted Valence and the rest of the Edgehawk's crew. Drawing his lightsaber, Vader told him that his desertion would not be tolerated. Charging into battle, Valence told Vader that he regretted ever serving the Empire. As they fought, Vader took note of Valence's power and told them that he had been a waste of potential. Once he was beaten into submission, Valence said that the planet's people would be free of the Empire. But Vader retorted that Valence had doomed them as his forces bombed the locals, as well as his troops. Valence chastised Vader's lack of care for even his own people, which Vader ignored. As Vader prepared to strike him down, Hayden insisted on finishing the job herself to make up for her previous failures, which Vader allowed. Valence tried to convince Hayden to leave the Empire with him, but Hayden blasted him in the face and sent him falling over the edge of the cliff. Before leaving the planet, Vader contacted Hayden and ordered her to send a group of Imperials to hunt the corpse down in case he survived. To accomplish this task, Vader personally selected Inferno Squad, confronting the Knights of Ren. Vader eventually learned that Zara's campaign against the Rebellion ended in failure during the Battle of Panesia. Sometime after that engagement, Vader investigated the assassination of the Emperor's Royal Guard on Coruscant, which was secretly carried out in part by Ochi. During the investigation, however, he was informed by Vani that a band of thieves had infiltrated Fortress Vader. The Dark Lord quickly returned to Mustafar and confronted the intruders in his castle, a group of dark side marauders known as the Knights of Ren, who were secretly working with Crimson Dawn. After Vader killed one of them with a force choke, their leader fought him with a lightsaber while the rest of them retreated. The leader said he had taken the blade from his predecessor, from whom he also inherited his name, Ren. Vader expressed pity for how far the Knights of Ren had fallen before Ren leapt from a window with a device known as the Screaming Key. As Ren gloated below, Vader used the force to pull the key back up towards his hand, prompting the Knights to open fire on him. Ren then pulled the key back down into his own hand before escaping with the Knights on speeders. As the Knights sped away, Vader stepped outside to study the remains of his slaughtered troops. With the Screaming Key, the knights were ordered by Kira to travel to a location known as the Dark Side Hellscape, a location unknown to Vader and Sidious, alongside the Archivist on orders to retrieve an artifact that they would use in their campaign against the Sith, the Shadow of Maul. Following this, Vader was called to the Imperial Palace by Sidious. Upon meeting with his master, Vader was informed by Sidious that the Sith had an enemy, claiming that recent attacks were part of a coordinated campaign of diversion. Sidious then called in Director Barsha to report on his current investigation. Barsha reported that his division within the ISB had learned of a rumor that the major crime syndicates were vying to obtain the Hutt's long-standing arrangement with the Empire. However, the rumor was coming from a single source, Crimson Dawn. As they walked through the palace halls, Vader agreed that Crimson Dawn had orchestrated the Syndicate War, but pondered how deep its influence went. Sidious went on to state that they had orchestrated the other attacks as well, saying that Crimson Dawn had targeted the Sith. He then told Vader about the Syndicate's leader, Kira, who Vader fought and failed to acquire Solo from. Vader told Sidious that while Kira had not been a true threat to him, she was trained in Terrace Kasai and possessed a fighting style which reminded Vader of his masters. From this, Sidious and Vader deduced that since Kira wallowed in the criminal underworld, she must have been trained by Maul. Sidious then concluded that Maul must have trained Kira to use her as an instrument of revenge and went on to ponder what else he taught her. With the Sith aware of Crimson Dawn's role in recent events, an alert was sent out to the rest of the Imperial military to track down the Vermilion, which made Kira order her assets in the Empire and other major factions to sow chaos across the galaxy to further distract the Sith. Shortly after, Vader returned to Mustafar, where he was called by the Eye of Webish Bog. Upon entering the Eye's cave, the Eye showed Vader a moment from the Clone Wars, where he, 
Yoda, and their clones had fought B-1 battle droids, and glimpses of the future, including one of him being confronted by Amidala's surviving handmaidens. Vader then realized he had been lured there as a test before being attacked by Mustafarians. After killing them, Vader claimed that the Eye had wasted his time with puzzles. To this, the Eye explained that the visions were warnings for the end of everything. When Vader asked why he should care, the Eye reminded Vader that he was a part of everything, but if he refused to accept this, he could not be helped. Just as the Eye had shown him, Vader, with his helmet slightly damaged, returned to his fortress and was contacted by Sidious, who informed Vader that Kira claimed to possess the Fermata Cage. Sidious then tasked his apprentice with finding the cage and killing anyone who knew of its existence. Vader was therefore amongst Palpatine's tools in the crusade to root out Dawn agents across the Empire. During his effort to destroy the Dawn, Vader bisected a traitorous stormtrooper in an industrial environment. After visiting the site of the disturbance, Vader told his master he had only found the wreckage from whoever had been there. When Sidious asked if the Sith spirit had been freed, Vader said that there would have been bodies if that were the case. Vader then asked Sidious if there truly was an ancient Sith within the cage. Sidious explained that the cage was built by Darth Momin to imprison people and places out of time. Whoever the Sith was, their release would be a great threat to them all, due to all Sith seeking domination. When they sensed the cage being opened through the Force, Sidious used a star map to determine the cage's location. Once he found the planet, he sent Vader to retrieve the cage and destroy Crimson Dawn, the orphans. Once the Executor arrived at the planet, Vader ordered Piet to prepare his shuttle. Upon landing on the surface, Vader discovered the Archivist and Kofon Ferris trying to hide beneath the remains of their machine. In Vader's presence, the Archivist found that the Sith Lord radiated a dark energy. When she refused to surrender, Vader began to choke the Dawn agents with the Force. However, he was interrupted by the arrival of Chanath Cha and her orphans, consisting of Seer, Lady Bright, and Imara Vex. When Cha asked Vader if he remembered her, Vader simply stated that he would kill her as he bared his lightsaber. Cha went on to introduce herself, explaining that Vader had slaughtered her family and that she spent every day since plotting her revenge. When Vader said he had already forgotten her name, the orphans attacked. After being electrocuted by Lady Bright and burned by one of Cha's acid bombs, Vader pushed the orphans back and walked into the ocean to recover. Once he did, he returned to shore and saw Lady Bright, Vex, Faris, and the Archivist fleeing for the Sirodo. When Vader mentioned Kira's death to Cha and Seer, he sensed their confusion and lack of fear, indicating that Kira was still alive. As he fought Cha and Seer, he chastised them for their arrogance and prepared to strike Cha down, only for Vex to snipe off one of his hands, prompting him to tip over the Sirota with the Force and throw Vex into the forest. With Vex severely injured, Lady Bright, Ferris, and the Archivist fled in the Sirota before returning to assist Cha and Seer. However, the Sirota then turned back and left the planet, much to Cha's relief. With Seer and Vex defeated, Vader twisted Cha's introduction of herself by reintroducing himself and stabbing her through the chest. With Cha dead, Vader left the planet to find Kira. Around the same time, the Spark Eternal Artificial Intelligence, created thousands of years prior for use against the Sith by the Ascendant Cult, resolved to hunt down Vader. The AI had taken over Dr. Aphra's body to carry out its mission, further collecting 000 and BT-1 to help in its quest. When Aphra used a virus she had installed within the two droids to regain control of her body, the Spark introduced, much to Aphra's horror, their Sith hunting mission against Vader. Subsequently, Aphra joined up with Kira aboard an ancient Amaxian space station in the Outer Rim. Redemption Kira's operations against the Sith ultimately ended in tragedy. Per his master's plan to counter the Alliance operation that sought to destroy the DS-2 Death Star 2 mobile battle station, Vader was sent to the Endor system to notify Moff Tian Jared of the Emperor's arrival, and that he was to complete its construction on time, even if he needed more men. Indeed, the Emperor arrived weeks later and was greeted by Vader, Jared, hundreds of officers and stormtroopers lined up to honor him. Satisfied with the Death Star's state, the Emperor sends Vader's wish to continue his search for his son but told him to have patience, much to Vader's displeasure. Nevertheless, he complied and remained on the Executor despite intelligence reports of the Alliance fleet massing near Celeste. During his stay on the Super Star Destroyer, the Rebel Shuttle Teridium requested permission to land on the forest moon of Endor. Vader allowed it, sensing Luke's presence. Restless after sensing his son, Vader returned to his master's side and reported the shuttle's arrival and his son's presence within. The Emperor allowed him to land on Endor at the Shield Generator base, where he was to await Luke, who, according to the Empire, would come to him. He complied with these orders, and landed on Endor with the Lambda-class T-4A shuttle ST-321. As predicted by Sidious, during the night, Luke surrendered himself in an attempt to talk and bring him back to the light side. Although Vader complimented his son's skills with the Force and his skills in building a lightsaber, he refused his son's pleas. Rebuffed, Luke said that his father's identity as Anakin Skywalker was truly dead as Vader sent Luke to the Emperor. One last duel. 
Vader escorted his son to the Death Star and into the Emperor's throne room. Shortly afterward, the Alliance fleet arrived to find the SLD-26 planetary shield generator was still operational and protecting the Death Star. As the battle between the Imperial and Rebel fleets raged, and the Endor strike team sought to destroy the Endor base, the Emperor tempted Luke to give in to his anger. In a moment of weakness, Luke lashed out, but Vader stopped his strike and dueled him once again. Throughout the duel, the two seemed to be evenly matched, but Vader was not trying to kill Luke, only to lead him closer to the dark side. This succeeded when Luke used the dark side to overwhelm his father and kick him down several stairs. When the Emperor told him to use his anger again, Luke realized what he had done and took a more defensive position. Eventually, Vader telepathically sensed the existence of his daughter and Luke's twin sister, Leia, and threatened to corrupt her instead. Only then did his son lose control and viciously attack him, cutting Vader's right hand off and knocking him down. Vader was then betrayed by the Emperor, who demanded Luke to finish Vader and take Vader's place at his side. Vader waited for Luke to kill him as it it was the way of the Sith to destroy the weak, and believed that Luke would replace him, just like Vader had replaced Dooku decades earlier. Luke, realizing that he was becoming what he sought to destroy, threw his lightsaber aside and declared himself a Jedi, just as Anakin Skywalker had before him. Infuriated, the Emperor unleashed continuous streams of Force lightning against Luke, intending to torture him to death. Luke begged Vader to save him. Vader knew that his son would die, viewing it as the price Luke would pay for his weakness. However, he also began to question whether it was really weakness, since Luke had shown him mercy. He also saw how Luke still believed there was still good in him. Vader became conflicted over whether to save his son or continue to serve his master, similar to when he chose Sidious over Windu 23 years earlier. Hearing his son's plea for help again, Vader returned to the light and chose to save Luke. He grabbed the Emperor with what was left of his arms and lifted his master high into the air, lumbering towards the reactor shaft. Surprised but angered by his apprentice's betrayal, the Emperor turned a more powerful lightning attack on Vader, now Anakin once again. In his hatred, his only thought was to cause his now former apprentice more pain, even though he still could have used his powers to save himself. At the cost of the Emperor heavily damaging his life-supporting armor, Anakin hurled his former master down into the reactor to his death. The persona of Darth Vader was no more, and Anakin Skywalker, Jedi Knight, was reborn. By killing Darth Sidious and ending the Sith's reign, the redeemed Jedi brought balance to the Force, and thus fulfilled his destiny as the Chosen One, which Qui-Gon Jinn had projected 35 years earlier. Earlier. Death. Just before Calrissian on the Falcon and Wedge Antilles destroyed the Death Star's main reactor, Skywalker was carried by his son to the Imperial Shuttle ST321, where he asked Luke to remove his mask. For a moment, Anakin looked upon his son's face for the first and only time. He finally saw him not as a Jedi, or a threat, or a mistake, but as he and Amidala's son and he gave Luke a real smile, the smile that only his wife ever knew. As Kenobi and Yoda appeared to Anakin behind Luke, smiling down at the redeemed Skywalker, Luke insisted that he had to save him. But Skywalker told him he already had, and asked him to tell his sister he had been right about him. He smiled at his son. As he died, Skywalker tried to speak to Amidala, telling her of how their son had saved him before trying to apologize, but he passed on before he could finish the thought, dying in the arms of his son while Imperial forces panicked around them, unconcerned with the fate of their former lord. However, Anakin's soul would survive death. His heroic sacrifice allowed his spirit to be preserved in the forest by Kenobi and Yoda. With the death of Anakin Skywalker, Luke took his father's back aboard the shuttle and escaped just before the Death Star's destruction. Back on Endor, Skywalker built a funeral pyre for his redeemed father and cremated him in a matter of a Jedi's funeral in solitude, for the sight of Vader's helmet consumed by the fire would be the cause for rejoicing to everyone but him. Having fulfilled his destiny and saving his son, Anakin joined Yoda and Obi-Wan, once again a hero, though unsung to everyone except in the eyes of Luke, post-death. As his son set the pyre ablaze to burn his armor, he was found by C-3PO and R2-D2, who invited him back to an Ewok village to celebrate their victory. As Luke rejoined his friends and sister amid the celebrations, Skywalker returned from the netherworld of the Force in his pre-fall form alongside Yoda and Obi-Wan Kenobi. All three at peace for balance had returned to the Force, they smiled at Luke, pleased to know that despite the best efforts of the Emperor, the Jedi had returned. Each thought to warn Luke about the future, as each saw that there was yet much danger ahead and more dark to overcome, but instead they decided not to burden him with this then. Luke, in turn, saw them and felt their approval and their sense of peace. Skywalker then asked his two mentors whether Luke would end up alright. Kenobi responded, noting that it was possible given that he had been alright thus far. 
for the next years, Anakin's spirit, alongside Obi-Wan and Yoda, continued to guide Luke. Following the Battle of Endor, Vader's castle remained standing on Mustafar, and his former servant, Vani, was freed from the captivity the Sith Lord had placed him into when two young Mustafarians, Tuttle and Gigek, tried to destroy the fortress. Surviving the blast, but breathing in the unfiltered lava fumes of Mustafar, Vani began to hallucinate that which he feared the most his master. Vani thought he was hearing the voice of Vader and that he could help resurrect his master. After using nightmares to lure Lena Graf's crew to Fortress Vader, Vani began to process to restore Vader. Yet rebel officer Lena Graf, having realized that the servant was only hallucinating, pretended as if she was the reborn Vader to be freed, then turning on Vani and freeing her companions. Vani was then left imprisoned in Fortress Vader, forced to breathe in the lava fumes and hallucinate nightmarish visions of Vader. Meanwhile, Graf had tried to use the lightsaber given to her by Vani to lead her crew out of the castle, yet the blade failed to activate when she needed it. Instead, the true force spirit of Anakin Skywalker intervened, appearing in the fumes and making a lightsaber appear in his hands. Unable to see the face of their savior, the crew assumed it was Graf and followed the light of the blade outside to safety. As the crew left Mustafar aboard the rabbit's foot, they were left to speculate whose lightsaber they had seen in the fumes. Skywalker, standing on the surface of Mustafar with the lightsaber he had summoned still drawn, laughed to himself when Graf claimed she knew ghosts did not exist. In 21 ABY, Skywalker's son, Luke, began searching for Exegol, and came into contact with nine paranormal Sith wraiths. When Luke found himself against impossible odds, a ghostly blue figure appeared, whom the Jedi initially mistook for his master, Obi-Wan Kenobi. After fighting off the wraiths with his lightsaber, the figure turned, revealing himself as none other than Anakin Skywalker. Skywalker reached out his hand, and Luke took it, and then found himself back on Tython as if he had never left. At Tython, Skywalker's figure flashed in and out, and shifted between him as a young Jedi and him as the old man man Luke had seen behind the mask of Darth Vader. Luke noticed that he seemed to be in pain and afraid. Skywalker explained that there was a disturbance in the Force that was a shadow from an ancient time. He also claimed that the Seeing Stone had sent a part of Luke to Exegol and that it had taken everything in him to bring him back. Anakin reminded Luke that he could divert the path of the Force if he needed to and that no matter how dark things seemed, he was never alone as long as he allowed the Force to be his guide. Skywalker then disappeared. Legacy Following the events of the Battle of Endor, Luke Skywalker confirmed his father and the Emperor's death over Endor to the Alliance, which in turn sent word of the battle's outcome in mass communications claiming to be the new power in the galaxy. Furthermore, in the wake of the deaths of the Emperor, his top enforcer, and many high-ranking officers during the battle, as well as the resulting power vacuum, the Galactic Empire collapsed due to internal power struggles and its fragmentation into several factions. The Imperial Remnant implemented disinformation campaigns, leading to only rumors being spread that both Vader and the Emperor were dead in some parts of the galaxy. Among those who knew the truth were sympathizers who tagged graffiti stencils of Vader's helmet and the phrase Vader lives beneath it as Antares and Coronet City. The Acolytes of the Beyond was a group of Sith cultists and fanatics with an interest in Vader, whom they considered to be greater than the Empire. They purchased a lightsaber they believed to be Vader's from a Kubaz named Ublaman, intending to destroy it and to return it to him in death. Months after the Battle of Endor, the Acolytes organized a revolution on Coronet City, Corellia, during which they attacked a peace and security station in order to access a museum basement and steal a red-bladed lightsaber for unknown reasons. Another Sith cult, the Alazmek of Winsit, established a colony on the Korvax Fen amidst the ruins of Fortress Vader. There, they revered Vader as their dark lord and the galaxy's true father and ruler. While Vader had once been a secretive figure kept away from public knowledge, his reputation had grown over the course of the Galactic Civil War and after his death. By the time of his death, Vader had become, in the words of the later Jedi Padawan Rey, the most hated man in the galaxy. Like its stormtroopers and other military forces, Vader was left to become a symbol of the fallen empire that he helped enforce. Decades after his death, Darth Vader remained a despised and controversial figure in the New Republic. When it was publicly revealed that Organa was his biological daughter, her reputation was ruined, which eventually led to a resignation from the Galactic Senate. The message, which had been recorded by Bail Organa for Leia, and which explicitly revealed that Vader had once been the Jedi Knight Anakin Skywalker, was made public by centrist Senator Ransom Casterfo. Under the machinations of Kar Rhys Sindian, an agent of the First Order. The cruel actions of her father were also used against Leia by the Quarren General Nasor Ri during diplomatic negotiations between her and the King of Moncala, Echchar, about potential support for the resistance from Moncala. In 34 ABY, 
the former Imperial Stormtrooper Terex, having become an agent of the First Order Security Bureau, maintained, remained unintimidated by Captain Phasma, feeling she was not as threatening as Vader. Anakin's grandson, Ben Solo, born to his daughter Leia and her husband Han Solo, inherited his mother's connection to the Force, and was sent to study under his uncle Luke. Under the influence of the mysterious Snoke, Ben took on the name of Kylo Ren, after he became a master of the Knights of Ren and a warlord of the First Order, and vowed to finish the work that Vader had started a generation earlier, and to succeed where Vader and his sentimentality had failed. One of those times where Ren wanted to surpass Vader was when he fought the Benathi, just like Vader had done years before him, to prevent them from expanding their territory. He took Ruthverd, the last survivor from Vader's battle that was still alive with him, and had a short conversation with Kristoff, the successor of the king that Vader had killed many years ago, about how Vader was taller and seemed more impressive than Ren. Following that, Ren killed him with his lightsaber. He then went to fight the Benathi, and although Ruthverd suggested retreating, Ren kept on fighting, talking to Ruthverd about how Vader did not retreat. When the god of the Benathi, a Zillow beast, appeared, Ruthverd warned Ren extensively and stated that he could not prove anything to a dead man. Instead, ignoring that, Ren took a shuttle and let the beast swallow him, killing it to Ruthverd's surprise from the inside and succeeding where Vader had failed. With their king and their god dead, Ren had control over the Benathi, and even the rather skeptical Ruthverd admitted that Ren had won the competition against his grandfather. In his crusade, Ren decided to seek Snoke and betray the Jedi Order, and was the cause of Skywalker's subsequent exile in search for the first Jedi Temple on Octo. After losing his apprentices in the destruction of his Jedi Temple and Solo falling to the dark side in the same night, Skywalker came to believe that the Jedi Order should end with his death as the last Jedi. By then, he held the Jedi responsible for the training and creation of Darth Vader. As a consequence of shutting himself off from the Force, Luke lost the guidance of Anakin's spirit. Ren was also in possession of Vader's disfigured helmet, which had been scavenged from his funeral pyre on Endor. A silent symbol of both the dark side's power and its weakness, it remained within Ren's private quarters aboard the finalizer. Ren communed with it whenever he felt drawn to the light. Another object that once belonged to him, the lightsaber he built after the first battle of Geonosis, the one carried by his son until their duel on Bespin, resurfaced in Maz Kanata's possession and called to Rey, a young scavenger from Jakku, who ended up using it to duel Ren during the Battle of Starkiller Base and win. When Ren changed quarters from the finalizer to Snoke's flagship, the Supremacy, he left Vader's charred helmet behind him because he was not ready to face Vader's visage until he recovered from his failure on Starkiller Base. Ren's master, Snoke, owned a ring with obsidian taken from Vader's castle, balance preserved. After Skywalker's death, a group of Elasmic cultists established a settlement in the Korvax Fen region of Mustafar near Fortress Vader, and began to worship Vader alongside Lady Korvax. At some point, they acquired an ancient Sith Wayfinder that once belonged to Vader. In 35 ABY, Kylo Ren led a massacre of the Elasmic cultists and stole Vader's Wayfinder from the ruins of the battle. When Rey discovered Exegol using this Wayfinder, Emperor Palpatine, the public identity of Darth Sidious, who had been resurrected at some point after his death, used the voice of Darth Vader to speak to Ren in his head. As Leia Organa Skywalker Solo prepared to release the last of her strength to reach her son, Ben Solo, she allowed the voices and faces of her family to surround her. Among the voices she heard was that of Anakin Skywalker, whose apology she finally accepted, returning his love in a way she never had before. Skywalker's voice was later heard by Rey among the voices of many Jedi of the past who aided her with destroying Darth Sidious during the Battle of Exegol, telling Rey to restore the balance as he did. He and the many Jedi used their eternal power to help Rey bring Sidious down once and for all, and the balance Anakin had created was maintained. Ren, who had assumed the identity of Ben Solo once again, sacrificed himself to save Rey, following in his grandfather Anakin's path of redemption. While Solo was the last of the Skywalker bloodline, Rey took on the last name Skywalker, and Anakin was reunited with his family in the afterlife at long last. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi, and make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.